guys all set? Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those uh, that are, are starting day two with us, uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you. you know, our campaign began yesterday. We crossed the line of departure, line of contact yesterday morning. We made contact yesterday and fought through a series of objectives. Last night, we secured our initial objective, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ritchie and Dr. Overy last evening. It was... Uh, a, a huge success on the objective, and uh, there's a little chance to refit last night for some of you. Uh, and now, guess what? We're going to continue the mission today, uh, and we have an additional objectives to see. So the campaign continues. Uh, this morning, we're going to you know, kick off with what should be a, a fun and amazing panel with longtime friend of the museum, internationally acclaimed author and documentarian James Holland. James, welcome, and museum. And, and of course, uh, museum presidential counselor and award-winning military historian, Dr. Con Crane. Now, this session is uh, called Losing at War, Battlefield Blunders and the Men Who Made Them. And these two scholars will delve into a discussion of some of the military decisions during World War II that historians have typically referred to as blunders, or as Rob would do, blunders, <laughs> and the leaders who are responsible for them. So uh, our chair, though, has uh, introduced a, a, a newcomer to the Jenny Craig Institute, our own uh, military historian, Dr. John Cretola. He'll be chairing this session and providing some comments and commentary and questions for our panelists. Uh, John is a retired Marine Corps officer, 22 years. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Kansas and is a specialist, um, surprisingly for a Marine, on World War II air power history and the early Cold War. So a, a pretty eclectic group here. His most recent book, Autumn of Our Discontent, was published by the Naval Institute Press in 2022. So with that, uh, we've got battle hand over to John. Great. Continue mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, as Mike pointed out, yeah, I'm a Marine officer who used to work for the Army who studies the Air Force. So I got the joint thing all pretty much covered uh, in that regard. Uh, let me introduce our panel. I'm going to start uh, to my left, your right, with uh, James Holland. He's an internationally acclaimed and award-winning historian, writer, and broadcaster. The author of a number of best-selling his stories, including Fortress Malta, An Island Under Siege, Battle of Britain, Dam Busters, and his most recent work, Brothers in Arms, is an account of a British tank regiment from D-Day to V-E Day. He has also written nine works of historical fiction, including the Jack Tanner novels. He has presented and written a large number of television programs and series, including the BBC's The Battle of Malta, and is scripted uh, and is in producing a film of his novel, A Pair of Silver Wings, largely set in Malta during the war. <laughs> He is also chair of the Chalk Valley Historical Festival, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and a research fellow at Swansea University. He's also an avid cricket player uh, and plays for both the Chalk Valley and, author, and authors cricket clubs. So please welcome uh, Dr. Holland, or Mr. Holland with us. Uh, further to my left, uh, you're right, is Dr. Conrad Crane, a retired Army officer who is currently the senior research historian for Strategic Studies Institute of the Army War College. He is a 1974 graduate of West Point with a PhD from Stanford. He has written or edited on most of the American wars, including his 2016 American Air Power Strategy in World War II, Bomb Cities and Civilians in Oil. In the same year, he was awarded the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize by the Society of Military History for his lifetime contributions in the field. He has taught history for 12 years at West Point and for 20 more at the Army War College. One of his proudest roles has been to be a longtime presidential counsel for the World War II Museum, watching it evolve into one building into the national treasure and complex that it is today. Welcome. Before I set a, a framework for our discussion here, Dr. Crane has a question he'd like to pose to the audience. Yeah, um, 
this, uh, this panel is placed where it is with much malice aforethought. Uh, <laughs> we are basically, as, as you know, if, if you've read the news, that uh, the famous uh, entertainer Gallagher just passed away. In many ways, we are the Gallagher panel. We are up here, but we're going to smash historical fruit <laughs> to try to liven things up. And I have a question for the audience. How many of you were at the What If panel we did last year at the conference? Uh, they, we, we've got a realm, we'll probably delve some into the what if uh, environment in this as well. I, is the guy out there who asked the question about whether the, if the what happened if the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? <laughs> um, hey, Jeremy, make sure that the, the, the microphone stays at least 20 feet away from him <laughs> for the rest of the conference. Okay, it's all yours. Okay. Just by way of, of kind of framing the discussion here, because we're going to go all over the place, but uh, I, before we started uh, this uh, panel, I looked up the actual definition of a blunder. It's both a noun and a verb, and it's generally referred to in Merriam-Webster as a gross error or mistake resulting usually from stupidity, ignorance, or carelessness. Now, with that as a definition, I, I'm going to pose to, to our gentleman here, you know, when we look at these blunders, were the decisions made by these commanders reasonable given their knowledge, training, and experience at that particular stage of the war? And furthermore, since war is often defined by having three levels, strategic, operational, and tactical, should these blunders be viewed with this construct in mind? And if so, can we identify Axis or Allied blunders at various levers, levels and their proportionate results? So with that framework, I will turn the floor over to uh, our panel who can jump right in and go to their first blunder. Well, I mean, you know, when you're looking at the Second World War, there's so many blunders, it's kind of, where do you, where do you start? I mean, I, you know, when I first thought about this, I was thinking, well, you know, part Marco Polo Bridge incident um, in 1937, you know, then Colonel uh, Mutaguchi oh, Renya. Um, you know, you could say that was a little bit of an overreaction, um, and, and you could say that that was pretty careless because it ended up with um, Japan invading China. It didn't go very well. It ended up being more of a hindrance than a help to their uh, burgeoning... Uh, growing urban population and lack of resources, which then directly led to Pearl Harbor, and that didn't work out very well um, for anyone, but at least not the Japanese. Then I was sort of thinking, well, you know, 1st of September 1939, um, Hitler invading Poland, that was pretty careless. It didn't work out very well in the long run either. Um, so I think that's a pretty big blunder, possibly the biggest blunder of them all. Um, and then you sort of keep going, and you kind of think, well, you know, Red Army going into Poland, I mean, Finland rather, at the um, end of November 1939, that wasn't great. Um, then you think of kind of, I don't know, um, sort of lack of decision from the Allies about Norway and kind of, you know, thinking about it in September 1939, not actually doing something till April, by which time it was all kind of too late. That was careless, I would say, um, and, a, and a pretty big blunder. Then you've got kind of lack of defenses by the French at Sedan, exactly the same place where the Germans crossed, well, the Prussians crossed in 1870 and the Germans crossed in 1914, and they do it again on the kind of 13th of May 1940. That was pretty careless, and I think you'd call that a pretty big blunder. Then you go to the kind of, you know, the halt all Order, um, the Hitler's infamous halt order of the uh, 24th of May, just when he's got the, uh, got the British and French exactly where he wants them. And, you know, and I think you can argue and argue pretty convincingly that the closest Britain comes to losing the war is Monday, the 27th of May, which is the time when Halifax, who is the most respected politician in the entire country in Britain at the time, is threatened to resign, leave the cabinet, which would have almost certainly brought down the government. And had, at that point, BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, been completely surrounded, as it would have been almost certainly had the halt order not been imposed, then you can see that all kind of, you know, the whole edifice coming down and Britain kind of suing for peace in, in very quick order. So that's a pretty big, big blunder, too. Um, but, you know, we're only at kind of May 1940. Um, uh, and we've got a long way to go. Uh, and I'm sort of conscious that I'm sounding just a kind of, you know, a teeny bit glib here. And I know, Con, you had a, ha you wanted a kind of a slightly more um, um, forensic way of looking at it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, uh, so many blunders, so little time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I tried to, <coughs> I, basically, these are generally not stupid people making these decisions. Uh, I, I, was, I think we could argue, and we probably will, we'll talk about how ideology drives some stupidity here and there, but, you know, I, so I was trying to look at these things a little bit different and try to not provide excuses, but I guess explanations for some of these things. Like sometimes it's a, the right decision, but at the wrong time. Uh, a good example would be MacArthur in the Philippines, who realizes very early on that there's no way he's going to get relieved if the Japanese invade, so 
we're going into Bataan is a bad idea. He's got to defeat the Japanese on the beaches. So he decides to reorganize the Philippine army, takes 10 good regiments, turns them into 10 bad divisions, abandons the plans to go into Bataan. Problem is he makes that decision too late. You know, de de defeating the Japanese on the beach is probably the right idea, but by the time that he starts to exercise his, his, his plans, the Japanese invade, and so he's caught with an unprepared Philippine army. Bataan's not prepared either. He ends up with more people there than he expected in a place that's unprepared for siege. Again, probably right decision, but wrong time. Another example in the naval realm would be, let's look at Spruance and Halsey uh, in Basel, Philippine Sea and Lady Gulf. You know, that uh, we, we uh, you know, Halsey gets massive criticism for abandoning the, to go chase the Japanese characters at Lady Gulf and allows Corita to come in and almost destroy the fleet. Another blunder, Corita turning around. Though I, I gotta say that I, I appreciate what Corita did because the Battle of Lady Gulf is my favorite American battle of all time because there's so many great American one-liners that come out of the battle. <laughs> we, get, we get into that question and answer if you want to. But, uh, but again, if you flip-flop Halsey and Spruance, Spruance gets criticized in the Philippine Sea because he doesn't chase after the Japanese carriers and lets them get away. If you put Halsey at the Philippine Sea, remember he and Spruance are off alternating command. If Halsey is the Philippine Sea, the Japanese carriers don't get away. There is no uh, diversion at Lady Gulf. If Spruance is at Lady Gulf, he's not going to go chase the carriers. He's going to stay back and guard the fleet. So again, the decisions they made in those two battles would have been the correct ones in the other battle that they weren't at. Um, an, another one would be, and, and John, right, when he talks about the different levels of war, uh, talk about somebody, you know, Erwin Rommel, North Africa, and I know that James has strong feelings on some I've of I've got quite well. strong feelings about Spruance as well, actually. Good. Well, I'll, 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 let me prime the pump a little bit for, for James. The uh, Rommel, North Africa. Tactically and operationally, what he does is arguably okay, but the problem at the strategic level, that is a disastrous campaign for the Axis. There's no, it, it, another case of theateritis where an individual doesn't appreciate kind of strategic impacts, the Italians can't provide it, he's too ambitious what he tries to do, Commando Supremo gets, gets uh, overwhelmed by it. Part of it's because of, what's of the distance of Malta and what Malta does for supply lines across the Mediterranean, but again, it's, it's a theater commander who doesn't realize this, the strategic impacts of what he's doing. Uh, another set that I'll throw out for initial thoughts um, deals with uh, uh, resource decisions. Um, people not appreciating the reason, again, the decisions they make, that they had, there's, that there's a certain sense behind it, but they don't understand the resource decisions. I think that the whole air campaign in 1943 is a blunder. The Americans are suffering 75% casualties. Bomber Harris destroys the front line of Bomber Command and the operations against Berlin at the end of 43. I, I think the whole air campaign in 1943 is a blunder. Um, again, we can talk about that, but I think there would have been a lot less casualty prone ways to, to do some of the things that they are doing. I've got to say, Con, you know, that's going to keep us going for 61 minutes. No Good. Good. <laughs> and another one is, if one of the things that always strikes me, and we'll talk about some of this, is this whole idea of how alliances work together. It struck me how much of Lend-Lease to Russia goes right by Japan on the way to Vladivostok, and the Japanese never interfere with it at all. And it just it boggles the mind. Again, this is an alliance that isn't compared to one that is. So these are just some other ideas. You know, the other, another one would be that the uh, failure to prepare for catastrophic success. Uh, I'd throw that out. If you think about the Allied breakout from Normandy, that at D plus 90, the, the, the Allied forces are at the line that they initially projected for D plus 365. And the logistics are just not prepared to deal with that and you end up with the running out of fuel and all of the, the hard resource decisions uh, that you know, Patton drives Patton crazy. And also the, the rest of the, the Shafe staff, since he's stealing all the supplies, they're supposed to be going to other armies. Uh, but again, it's because they didn't, they didn't plan for catastrophic success. So is, is it a blunder or is it just, you know, the fact that war tends to go directions we, we don't expect them to? I'll throw, so I'll throw that out as some extra ideas. If I could, uh, Where do we want to start? <laughs> I mean... I'm going to try. Okay. Uh, both, with riffs on both what you just said, we're talking about 1940. 
and making the right decision at the wrong time or vice versa. I'm going to throw out France in 1948 and the doctrine that they follow as a result of the First World War. Oh, Firepower kills. Yes. Uh, method, uh, methodical warfare is the future. And that is their basic doctrine with the Maginot Line and those kinds of things and penny packeting their, their armor assets. So they have a doctrinal blunder on the front end as a result of their experiences from the First World War. But they're also, you got to understand also the French and there's a good book by Jenny Keesley, and also Bob Doty's written some stuff too. And the French, the French end up with the strategy they can afford. Yes. Not the one that they need. Yes. There's they an economic have, piece to this. There's an economic piece, and that's another. They knew they needed more, but they couldn't afford it. So I mean, when we're well, we're, you know, when, when you're looking at 1940, it's just one of enormous frustration. Um, anyone who's been to Sedan, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago, if you go there, you see all these kind of these the, these bunkers, these casements, all around, looking over overlooking the uh, the river. Um, the, um, over the Meurs. And you just sit there and you just feel really frustrated because it all could have been avoided. I mean, you know, had the, you know, there was sort of tail to bumper traffic in the Ardennes as, as, the, uh, as von Kleist's uh, um, panzer group were coming through. And, um, you know, it was literally the biggest amount of gridlock you ever see. And then suddenly the infantry divisions don't really buy into the whole kind of armored thrust idea anyway. They start coming, cutting in on it, and you haven't got enough roads, and it's just total, total mayhem. And various reconnaissance planes go over and go, my God, you know, that's a whole German army down there in these woods. You know, we've got a fantastic opportunity to bomb them. And the French go, no, can't be possible, can't be true. You must have, um, uh, must have misseen it. Uh, that, that didn't really happen. And so they don't go and bomb it. You know, I mean, it would have been so easy. And the interesting thing about the French is, is, is that they're kind of, they've got it wrong on a kind of strategic level, on an operational level, and on a tactical level. Uh, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about it is, is that they think the war is going to be long, attritional, drawn out, but static. And kind of most of that is correct, apart from the static bit. And even in, you know, actually quite a lot of static, there is quite a lot of static mix in, in, in World War II, as it turns out. But, but it isn't, it's a, it's a war of maneuver. That's the bit they've got fundamentally wrong. And it's really interesting that, that uh, General uh, Gamelin, who's headquarters at Chateau de Vincennes, sort of um, part of, just on the edge of Paris, you know, he doesn't have a single radio in the whole headquarters. <laughs> you know, they're dependent on, on good old fashioned uh, um, telegraph poles and, and, and wire and traditional telephone lines. And of course, what happens is, you know, Stukas come in, hit the telephone lines, and then there's kind of lots of refugees, and the roads get clogged, and no one can move. Um, and, and so the, you send out a dispatch rider, and the dispatch rider doesn't reappear at midday. So they think, okay, I wonder what's happened to, you know, Jean Pierre. Um, and Jean Pierre hasn't come back, so they send out, you know, Claude, um, and, and he disappears, and eventually he comes back at kind of nine o'clock. And then you've got to repeat that from, from kind of overall headquarters to army group to army, to corps, to division, to brigade, to battalion. And of course, the long, long shot of all this is nothing happens. They're just absolutely stuck. Um, uh, so there's that whole problem of just lack of, of being incredibly top heavy, um, uh, stifling initiative in lower ranks, uh, and unable to communicate properly. And the communication thing is really, really key. And it's really interesting that the, the, the Germans, of course, you can criticize them in, in many ways, and you, you can certainly criticize Hitler's invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939 as the start of a 10. But, but one thing they were really, really good at was comms. Um, and they were really, really good at propaganda. And what they realized in the 1930s is that what you want is you want to be able to send the same message out over and over, repeat, repeat, repeat. And what they do is they develop a thing called the Deutsche Kleinempfänger, which is the German little radio. Uh, and you can still get, you can buy these on kind of eBay or something. They're Bakelite and they're kind of nine inches by four inches by nine inches. And, um, and, and, and it's just fascinating because they're really cheap. Because in the early 1930s, a radio set was a kind of aspirational thing. And it was sort of made of sort of walnut veneer and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you had to be kind of at least middle class to own one. What the Germans do is they go, everyone can have one. Uh, and they repeat the same old, old garbage. And it's not just sort of Hitler's throwing spittle and bad breath at everybody. Uh, it, it's also kind of, you know, it is marching bands. There's even some humor there as well. Yeah, there really is. And, uh, and, and the, the thing is, the army then go, hang on a minute, this is cool. You know, we've got this, this really small radio. But what about if we put our radio in our, our command car and, and then we can put it in our Panzer and, you know, we've got all those really cool BMWs with sidecars, um, uh, motorbikes. We can put one even in there. And then the infantry and the artillery and the Panzers and the reconnaissance troops, they can all communicate with one another. How neat is that? And they go, Bonza, let's go. Uh, and, and of course, the, the French and the British and the Dutch and the Belgians don't have anything like this. And so what they're able to, the Germans are able to do is concentrate their force, the Schwerpunkt, smash them, uh, and take out the French in penny packets. And that's all because 
It's not one of, of finances and economy. It's because the French have totally misappreciated what this future war is going to be. And they've got their old and crusty uh, um, generals who are kind of, you know, a decade and a half older than, than all the senior um, German, um, most of the senior German generals. And they're just too stymied in the past, and their heart's not in it, and, and, and it all goes horribly wrong. And the frustrating thing about it is it needn't have gone wrong. You know, had they gone into the Tsar in, you know, the autumn of 1939 with a little bit more gumption, <laughs> it might have been a very, very different story. But that, that highlights, I think, one aspect that talking about the Germans being clogged up in the Ardennes. A lot of this, these battlefield blunders, I mean, think about it historically. If, well, yes, because that's a blunder that they get away with. What, but but it, because the other side makes a bigger blunder. I mean, right. a lot of this is, is a lot of this is about taking risk and getting away with it. I mean, MacArthur gets away with a lot of that in the Pacific as well. He takes mm. some very risky operation in New Guinea that the Japanese are getting ready to exploit, and then then Nimitz does something that distracts the Japanese away, and he gets away with it. Um, so a lot of it is 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 it, it's how much risk do you take and whether you get away with it or not determines whether the damn historians are going to call it a blunder or not. <laughs> I mean, there's a great uh, Bruce Hopper, who was the uh, historian for the U.S. Strategic Air Forces, was very frustrated dealing with the airmen trying to tell the story of the war. And he had a very prescient comment where he said that, that historians were wrong to think they could control the narrative of the war while it was going on. But he said, you military guys are wrong if you think you'll be able to control the narrative after it's over. Mm. And so in the, in the end, historians are always going to win. <laughs> Speaking of the economic piece that you brought up, Con, let's, let's uh, shift gear uh, to the Eastern Front and talk about Barbarossa. Yeah. And the fact that Hitler builds an army that can go to Paris or builds an army that can go to uh, Poland, but he can't build an army that goes all the way to Moscow. As a former logistician in a previous life, that frontage is basically from Kansas City to the East Coast, from Maine to Florida. And you have only about 20% of the German army mecked or armored up, and you're gonna take on that whole frontage. And you haven't even mobilized the nation in terms of production and economic uh, uh, production by that time yet. Uh, and so you have a strategic blunder again, not only on the military side, but as you mentioned, the economic considerations. Well, you've, you've also got a, a, an operational blunder. I mean, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's David Stahl, who I'm sure has been here in the past. In fact, actually, I think I met him here, here an Australian um, historian. He's, he's doing really, really fantastic work on, on the Eastern Front at the moment, and particularly the Barbarossa campaign, all the way through, actually, to the encirclement of, um, of Kiev in um, September 1941. And he's just completely rewriting all this stuff by, by having forensically gone into the kind of the, the German archives and looked at all. And it's, it's amazing that but when, when Smolensk falls on whatever it is, 15th of July, I think it is, 1941, you know, one of those leading panzer divisions, uh, I think it's 16 panzer, is down to something like 18 tanks left, you know, just by the 16th of July. And what you see is you see this incredible, fast uh, uh, advance sort of swallowing up vast armies of, of, of the Red Army. Um, but actually, for then, then until kind of beginning of September, the, the front only moves forward about another 100 yards. So this, this sort of great surge of, 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 of movement in the opening weeks of Barbarossa from the middle of July, you know, for the next sort of six weeks or so, actually doesn't really move at all. You know, 100 miles when you're talking about the Soviet Union is, is diddly squat, frankly. Um, and it's amazing, you know, they just, they just don't have it because they're so front-loaded, the German army, to these panzer groups. I mean, that's the whole principle in, in, in France, that, that actually you've got, you know, the 135 divisions that they use in the, um, um, in the invasion of the, of the West in 19, May 1940. Only, um, I think it's 16 are motorized. You know, that's 119 that aren't. And, and the 119 that aren't, that Rob Satino's written about absolutely brilliantly, amongst others, it, you, you know, they're, they're, they're dependent on the traditional ways of getting from A to B, which is using horse or, or you, using your own two feet. Uh, you know, and that's not a very efficient way of doing things. But they got away with it, you know, and so Hitler then thinks he's a military genius par excellence. <laughs> uh, and he isn't. Um, and, you know, what you get by the summer of 1941 is you've got the same principle. You've now got these panzer groups, these kind of panzer armies, but they are absolutely the spearhead and everything is front loaded. That is your kind of fighting elite. That's, your, that's the point of your spear. But of course, even when you're winning, you are kind of treating yourself at the same time. And if you can't replace those troops, and if you can't replace those tanks, and you can't do it quickly, then you can't move forward quickly. And the moment that you don't move quickly, you're, um, is there something wrong? No, everything's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, have to have a brief pause for the program to tend to an issue in the back. Everything's fine. Panelists? 
Drink your water, drink your scotch. We will be back momentarily. We won't, don't believe it'll take that long, but thank you for your patience. Please remain in your seats and just talk amongst yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to be restart the session momentarily. Thank you. All right, if you could please find your seats in your cell phones. And I get to serve as chair for 10 seconds. Uh, we were talking with James and Operation Barbarossa as one of the battlefield blunders. James? Uh, yes, so um, <laughs> I, was, um, I, I, was, I was making the point that so much of the Germans is front loaded to these panzer groups and, and they're Every, you know, all their energy, all their fighting, fighting um, edge all goes down into these. And the problem is, is you're getting attrited all the time, even when, when you're winning. Um, and you're getting attrited in, in a number of ways. You're getting attrited in tanks getting knocked down, men being killed and so on and wounded. But you're also getting attrited in just, you know, the wheels literally coming off because your supply lines are so long. And that's what's called the culmination point, the point where you can no longer operate in the way you want to operate because your supply lines, your logistic lines are, are too long. Uh, and it doesn't actually take a rocket scientist to work out, or a great strategist, or, or von Clausewitz, or whatever, to tell you before Barbarossa happens that it's extremely unlikely that the entire Red Army is going to be completely defeated and the whole of the Soviet Union will collapse within 350 miles of your start point in what was Poland. Um, but at that point in the war, they're already in a real big problem because they haven't got enough of anything. They haven't got access to the world's oceans. They haven't got any you know, merchant fleet worth talking about. Um, they can't get into the oceans anyway. Um, they haven't got enough natural resources. Um, they need to go and get it from somewhere else. And the only options that are left to Hitler, I would say, by the spring of 1941, are either to make peace, uh, which he's not going to do, or go into the Soviet Union and, and uh, you know, roll the dice. But the rolling of the dice is based on the principles of of the success the previous year. And of course, France is a very, very different place. It's kind of, you know, 250 miles from one side to the other, not, not thousands. Uh, um, the logistics are, are nothing like as, as bad. And of course, you know, it, you've got much greater infrastructure in France. You've actually got, you know, um, France is the most automotive uh, nation in Europe at the time and second in the world only to the USA. So actually, there's lots of petrol stations and lots of spare parts. And, you know, if your Panzer runs out, you can go into the forecourt and say, you know, Fill her up, please, John, Johnny Lair. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and off you go again. Well, you can't do that in the Russian steppes, let me tell you. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. And so what you then see in the rhetoric of the German commanders is lots of stuff about we will will it. You know, the will of the German people will get us. You know, the German army will get us free. But that's just, I mean, that's just absolute tosh. I mean, I mean you can't just will it. You know, I, I can't sort of go to the moon just because I want to, uh, um, because I will it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. Yeah, that, there's that, that great quote that uh, amateurs study tactics, but professionals study logistics. Mm. And, and that's a lot of the theme. I'll just throw out one other example, and then we'll move on to some other things. But again, going back to the air war in 43, Hap Arnold drives Ira Aker nuts because <laughs> he's trying to push, uh, talk about being front loaded. He does the same thing to Aker. He sends all the, the bomber groups, and he sends the bomber crews. What he doesn't send is spare parts and maintenance people. So Aker ends up with all this front-loaded organization, but he can't maintain it. And you know, operational rates are low, and, and, and you can't replace your... I mean, it, it causes them all kinds of problems. But even at the... You know, in, in the, if this is half Arnold in Washington, isn't thinking about the logistics requirements of managing the air war in 1943. So it's a, it's a problem that happens on both sides with a lack of appreciation of the logistic requirements for the, for the operations that they design. And to that point, you think about when the Germans go into Russia, they're taking a lot of captured French vehicles with them as part of their mobile movement. And if you're looking for the parts for a 37 Peugeot when you're in the steps of, of Russia, good luck. 
you know? Um, but let's shift gears now. At the break, we were talking a little bit about sea lines of communication and their importance in the Pacific War. Um, and the fact that you know, the Japanese, obviously living on an island nation, have a problem with natural resources and the ability to get those things from Java or their captured territories back to the home, the homelands. And so they have a strategic uh, resourcing problem already. Uh, and we were having this discussion uh, regarding the Pacific campaign, and I'll, I'll turn it over to our gentleman. Well, I mean, the, the really interesting thing about that is, of course, you know, one of the reasons you're going into what is now Vietnam or, um, you know, what Indochina as it then was, or Burma or all the places, so that you can get your rubber, so you can get your oil that you don't have, um, so you can get these, these precious resources. What's really interesting is they then don't have the capacity to then move it. So, you know, the British set fire to, the, to, to a lot of the oil, oil fields in, in Burma anyway as they're retreating, but even those that are recovered, you know, the, the, the Japanese don't have any means of actually transporting this oil and refining it and getting it back to back to home base. So what was the point? And you know, suddenly it's you know it it, it is incredible. And you say exactly the same with the Germans in 1942 when they're going towards um, the Caucasus. You know, the whole point of Case Blue, the sort of the main um, offensive of the summer of 1942, is to drive into the Caucasus. And obviously, as as I'm sure you all know, it got derailed by um, uh, uh, the site tracking at uh, Stalingrad. But but but. Even if they'd got to Baku, for example, what are they going to do when they get there? Because they don't have the rail capacity anymore. The Reichsbahn is absolutely the glue that is keeping the whole show on the road. And they just don't have enough capacity on the railway to get that oil back to Germany. There's no pipelines in those days. The only pipelines are going backwards to the, to the Urals, and there's not very many of them. And you know, they don't have any means of refining it. They don't have any ships. I mean, oil goes around the world in the 1940s by ship, uh, and the Germans don't really have any. So, so that's not going to work. And it's exactly the same with Rommel's drive to the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is, is not the kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of well um, of oil that it, that's become post-war. Um, the number one oil producer in the world in, in the 1940s is the USA, and the second is, is, is the Dutch East Indies, Venezuela. Um, and, and Baku is kind of third, and quite a long way third, as it happens. But, but the Germans, you know, if the Rommel gets to the Middle East, again, you've got the same problem. I mean, how is he going to get this oil from the Middle East back to, back to Germany? The, and the truth is, he's not. So the whole thing is kind of fatally flawed in the first place, and it's exactly the same with the Japanese. It's, it's, it's the, the, the carelessness to go back to your definition, of, of their logistics in the Second World War is just boggling. It, you know, and it really, really does make the, 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 the logistical blunders that the Allies make, and of course there's lots of them, you know, there's such a small bit by comparison. And you think about, too, uh, back on the Eastern Front for a second, the Russians take, what, 1.5 million rail cars and move them to the east so the Germans don't get them? Yes. And they tear up all those railroads that they do have, so the Germans have to repair those. And well, and they've got, different, they've got a different, they've got a different loading rail gauge. gauge and everything. And then the Rasputitsa comes, and you have you know those problems too. You know, comments? No, it, it's it's again, it, it it's there are. You know, there's a lot of factors obviously that play into this, and and we, we talked a bit about Rommel. Um, you know, another one of those campaigns that gets extended too far, and, and I think if you go back to Mataguchi Reign again. You know, talk about. If you, if you look in a, in a dictionary uh, for the, the definition of loose cannon, <laughs> there's a picture of Mataguchi Reina there. Uh, you know, he kicks off, he, he causes the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Well, in 1944, he's commander of a Japanese army in Burma, and he decides to invade India. And uh, everybody tells him, not a good idea, but again, the, the, we, we were talking a little bit, the, the, the Japanese command structure is bizarre. There is no joint command structure. I mean, the, the Army and the Navy don't talk to each other. The only person that can really make them talk is the Emperor, and he doesn't get involved. So the, the, it's really a bizarre structure, and, and nobody can really tell Mataguchi Reina not to go, and he does. And we, James, I know, has written a lot on Burma, and I'm sure I want to talk about it, but that turns out a disastrous campaign. He ends up getting his army destroyed. I you mean, know, destroyed. Right. I mean, just gone. Completely All of the destroyed. Army is completely destroyed. So but, but again, it's funny. He, everybody tells him not to do it. He does it anyway. And I know James gives some more details on the campaign. It's one that we don't talk a lot about, but it's it's a disastrous campaign. It's a, but there's some fantastic fighting at Kohima, Kohima in fall as well. Some heroic mm -hmm. combat uh, in a theater that we don't pay a lot of attention to. And well, see, yeah, it's, it's, it's a call. You say. I was just saying, and you see Mataguchi doing one of the classic blunders, to quote the Princess Bride, never get involved in a land war in Asia. You know, and so there, there's that. <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of wise, uh, wise, um, wise words in the Princess Bride, it has to be said. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, 
Yes, I mean, Margaret Chirena's uh, thinking behind it is is that that actually, you know, what's supplying the the Chinese, what's keeping them going is is this is his theory, by the way, is is, is American predominantly American supplies going over the hump, going over the Himalayas, uh, and those those airfields are all in Assam. So if you can get to Assam. Um, and you can cause sort of insurrection in, in Bengal, which is kind of pretty, pretty against the British anyway. Uh, and as, uh, uh, and, and the mood, you know, moods are, are, are sort of pretty rebellious anyway after the kind of the global, the, after the terrible famine that happened the previous years, back end of 1942 into 1943. Um, then maybe you could sort of foment a, a wider insurrection in the in the British Raj in India, and, and that would cause India to collapse. Then you could overrun the uh, overrun the um, Allied air bases in in Assam. Uh, and you know that would change the situation in China, um, which would then turn the tide of the war. I mean, it's quite a lot of ifs and buts to kind of to, to work in his favour. It has to be said. And yet, all he's got to do really is get out of the hills and get up to Dimapur, which is right on the edge of the Brahmaputra River, and, and that is then your gateway up into into Assam. And it's very interesting because that that whole area around um, the border of a uh, northern part of Burma and into into what is now Manipur State and Nagaland in northeast India is really really hilly, and it's and it's really difficult to get around. So it's it's getting into that kind of flat plain area of of, of Assam beyond the Brahmaputra that's the key. And the interesting thing is, that actually, they get very, very close to doing that. And the only thing that stops them, which is, um, stops them taking Kohima, which would then, it's only about kind of 30 miles from Dimapur, which then would open that road to Dimapur and then beyond to the Brahmaputra and the plains of Assam. The only thing that stops them is these two little sideshows at a place called Jessamai um, and, and at, at Sangshak which are two completely forgotten battles, which no one ever remembers at all, even if they remember anything about Kohima and, and the Battle of Imphal. Uh, um, but what happens is, as they're advancing towards Kohima, they get sidetracked by these two little outposts at Jessamai, which is this tiny little kind of hill village, and, and, and Sangshap, which is exactly the same. And it holds up the Japanese advance by the best part of a week, and, and, and attrits them as well at the same time. So that by the time they get to, to, to Kohima, the British have got just enough troops to hold on, and the reinforcements arrive just at the point where the British are breaking. But had they not had that extra week in which to kind of prepare things at Kohima, Kohima would almost certainly been overrun, then Dimapur would have almost certainly been overrun, and then it's kind of anyone's guess what might have happened. So actually, the biggest blunder of all, you could argue, is stopping and getting sidetracked at these tiny little villages of Jessamai and, and, and Sangshak, um, rather than the whole, the big picture idea of sort of getting to Dimapur and beyond beyond to Assam. I mean, obviously, inevitably, it would, have, it would have run out of steam anyway, so it was a kind of hopeless cause. But um, it didn't seem that way to Slim and, and uh, his generals on the ground and um, Montague Stockford and all the rest of it, who were the British commanders at the time. It, it looked like a really, really seriously perilous situation, and the whole thing was touch and go. No, and that, so it's not one of these examples where it's what makes it a blunder is very, I mean, it's a, fine, a very fine line. It, you know, it, it doesn't get this. You know, it may, may have turned out to be a, at least a moderate Japanese victory instead of a massive defeat with just that one little change in history. There, there's a great T. X. Hamas quote that I use sometimes. It said, "There's a very fine line between a vision and an hallucination." <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of these, you know, some of these visions almost come true, and and you didn't didn't know it was a hallucination until all the historians got together later, or else because of little things like this little sidetrack. I can't even pronounce the name of the village. Uh, it, it turns these these mistakes into massive blunders. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it is so fascinating, and you know, it, it absolutely does for for Madaguchi Renya, and finally his military career is over. And frankly, that's a blessing for everyone, including the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> We were also having a discussion during the break about command and control and the fact that the Allies, the Americans in the UK and the Russians, we get together, we, we plan strategically, don't always agree and have lots of intramural food fights between the various staffs over the next steps. But the Axis doesn't have that kind of a structure. You don't see the Japanese talking to the Germans in terms of grand strategy. And even within Japanese themselves, the Imperial Japanese Army isn't talking to the Japanese Navy. You know, and so the, their ability to effectively communicate and make strategy is hamstrung by the fact that they won't talk to each other. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, an interesting uh, blunder on the part of them on the strategic level, where the Allies actually figure this out relatively early on in the war. It's, it's absolutely amazing, and again, when you look at the, the Germans and how they treat their own allies, it's yeah. just, it, you know, it, it, it is absolutely appalling. I mean, there, there's been so much 
um, sort of ink um, spilled on you know, anglophobia on the part of American commanders and, all, and, and vice versa. And I think, personally, I kind of think it's incredibly overblown. I think, you know, if you think about the huge responsibilities on the shoulders of these men, of course you're going to get a bit tetchy at times and, and you know, you're going to have arguments. I mean, what I think is amazing is that the Allies aren't actually allies at all. They're coalition partners. There's no formal alliance. And actually, it's how well they all get on. Um, you know, and obviously, everyone has, has brilliant people like Eisenhower and... and, and Phil Marshall Alexander, to name a couple, you know, who, who are kind of holding the whole thing together, and also the, the combined chiefs of staff, who, who, who do incredibly well to kind of um, uh, keep, keep the show on the road and, and keep a kind of, you know, a happy, happy line. Um, obviously, there's disagreements. Of course, there are. There's cultural differences. There's, there's, there's overall strategic differences. But what's amazing about it is just how well it works overall. You would have to say so. And you think about the complexities of the kind of warfare that the Allies are trying to do, the Western Allies, that is, you know, which, which is air, land, and sea. You know, everything they're doing is amphibious. And you think about the complexities of global shipping in the 1940s, which are just mind-boggling. I mean, really, truly, truly mind-boggling. And you think about how much that's all coming into play. And you think about all those young men's lives that people have got responsibility for. It is incredible how well they do. And then, you know, you look at the Germans. You know, I remember when I was um, doing some work on the Sicilian campaign, you know, and you can see these transcripts of, of sort of Hitler conference, Fuhrer conferences. And, and the kind of language they're using to describe their, uh, their Italian allies is absolutely extraordinary. Well, you know, I knew they were all kind of just sort of feckless dogs and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I've never liked the Italians. They're all a bunch of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and you kind of think, really? You know, you're talking about your allies here. You know, OK, the relationship might have been kind of going downhill a little bit by this stage. But, but even so, it's, it's, it's incredible. And then you find that, you know, the, the Reggio era Nautica and the, the, the Italian Air Force on Sicily and, and the Luftwaffe on Sicily, they're not talking to each other at all. I mean, there's just no joined up thinking whatsoever. It's absolutely incredible. And, and you know, this is the same with the Japanese Navy and Army. They're just, they're just not thinking on the, you know, they're not talking the same talk. But you go back to the initial discussion John had about the different levels of war, it, it always strikes me that Ike was awful at tactics. You look at Ike's performance in North Africa, was terrible at tactical level. His, his, you know, he's the land forces commander after Normandy, and he makes a number of mistakes that contribute to some of the problems, the breakout. But he's a master at the other, the higher levels of war. And at the same time, you find the other thing: you find a number of people in the war who are brilliant tactically, and then they, you know, there's the old Peter principle. Eventually, they get promoted to a level where they become incompetent. I mean, they don't, they can't handle the the higher levels. I mean, Ike is unusual where he's, again, he's, he, he's not good at the lower levels, but people still promote him, and he ends up at the master of coalition warfare that he becomes. But it's, you know, I'd argue that in today's army especially that he never would have made, made a pass lieutenant colonel. Mm. That if you, can't, if you can't perform at the tactical level, you're not going to get promoted. I know that that's the way it is in the army. And, and it's, but here, again, and it, it, there are, Diff people, different, different levels of skills at, at, at different, you know, I, I, again, we go back to the Rommel discussion. I don't think Rommel had the strategic uh, sense that, that he needed. Um, but he, 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 obviously, tactically, he was brilliant. But that didn't translate to the success at the highest levels. Yeah, I don't think he understands the operational level either, really. Not really. I think he's, you know, he's, he's so imbued with this kind of sort of just dash forward and don't worry about your flanks. And, you know, this goes back to 1917 and his winning his, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Um, his, his Blue Max or whatever. And, <laughs> and, but, but, but he just doesn't get it. And, and you know, when he, get, when he gets sent out in February 1941 out to, to, to Libya, he's told, whatever you do, don't go past, past sort of El Aguila. Um, go and start, stop there. Just make sure that, you know, put some backbone into the Italians. Make sure the British don't get to Tripoli. That's all you've got to do. And he goes, roger that. Gets over there, charges off across Cyrenaica, um, and, and runs out of steam and gets pushed back. And, you know, and so you have this kind of sort of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, um, um, Ring is all for kind of subduing Malta. Um, they can't do both because they just don't have enough. So, you, you know, you need, you need air power to support your land campaign by the stage and, well, from the very start of the war, of course. And, and they can't have both, so they take all the Luftwaffe out of, out, of the, um, out of Malta, just at the point where they've actually done quite a lot of damage to the island uh, and neutralized it a little bit, but they completely take their foot off the gas. Malta kind of recovers very, very quickly. And 
takes all the, the Luftwaffe over, but there's no joined up thinking again. He doesn't get on with von Valder, who's the, uh, the commander in, um, of the Luftwaffe over there at all. They're, they're not, again, they're not speaking the same language. Charges off and, um, you know, had they subdued Malta properly, then that would have made, that, that would have enhanced their ability to supply North Africa much more uh, effectively than they actually did. And that was a big problem because of course, you know, the Italians don't have many ships. They're stuck in the Mediterranean. They don't have access to the world's oceans either. They don't have a ship building ca capacity really. And certainly not once the war starts. So once you start sinking ships and the, obviously the bigger ones get sunk first, you, you know, it's just going downhill all the time. So having an entire operation in North Africa is not a good idea for the Germans and the, and, and the Italians because they can't sustain it. They just don't have the, you know, they don't have the logistics to, to do that. But what does Rommel do in the end of May 1941, um, 42 rather, you know, not just happy enough to get, get to Brook, he then charges off into Egypt. You know, his supply lines get ever longer. They're using half their fuel just getting the fuel to the front. Uh, which is not an efficient way of doing things. Uh, and lo and behold, they get absolutely smashed and destroyed, and you know, it ends up with the great, great Allied victory in Tunisia in, in May 1943. And, and, and you know, you're thinking, it's just insane. And, and then Hitler then reinforces Tunisia massively in the winter of 1943, uh, 42 rather, in the beginning of 1943. I mean, to a really, really huge extent. And it's not just manpower, it's also with material, Tiger tanks, precious new Tiger tanks, aircraft, I mean, something like 2,600 um, Luftwaffe aircraft get destroyed between November 1942 and May 1943. 2,600, I mean, that, that is a gargantuan number. And another 3,500 by, by, um, by the fall that year. You know, so that's 7,000, isn't it? No, 6,000 6, 6, 6, aircraft destroyed in the Mediterranean at that time. I mean, that is just such an astonishing number. And these are mainly frontline aircraft. This is, this, this is you know, um, supply aircraft, fighter planes, Junkers 88 bombers, Stukas, uh, uh, and so on. You know, it's your, again, it's the it's your, it's your steel of your spear that's, that's been destroyed. 500 ships get destroyed in that time. I mean, th these are numbers that they just can't sustain. Wouldn't it have been better once, once, I mean, just not to get involved in North Africa in the first place, but if you are involved in North Africa, is to bug out after Alamein and reinforce Sicily and Greece and, and, and Sardinia and make it really, really difficult because doing a, a, an invasion, an amphibious operation across the Mediterranean is incredibly difficult, incredibly complex. And that would have made, you know, I mean, by the time the Allies do get to Sicily, there's just two German divisions on the island. That's it. And, you know, it's a cakewalk comparatively, and 38 days later, it's all over. And, you know, um, and, and the Allies have got a toehold in Europe. I mean, again, just look at the ripple effect. The ripple effect of Rommel's decision to go past El Aquila <laughs> yes. ends up costing 6,000 aircraft, 500 ships, hundreds... 6,000 aircraft just between, in one year, between November 1942 more, more than and that. It costs hundreds yeah. of thousands of prisoners, hundreds of thousands of casualties, and it gives the rookie Americans a theater to learn how to fight war. Mm -hmm. All because of one tactical decision that at the time was that Rommel was portrayed as this brilliant tactician. The strategic implications of that ripple for the rest of the war. I mean, he learns a bit. He's better by Normandy, but 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 you know, it's kind of too late by then. <laughs> I mean, the whole the whole charging into Egypt thing is is just absolutely bonkers. Really. I think what we're talking about in modern parlance would be called operational reach. Your right. ability to, to project combat power over long distances. And it's interesting, you know, around the same time, when as the Americans are building LSTs and, and those are in very high demand, there's this great quote from Churchill where he says, the fates of two empires rest on these goddamn things called LSTs. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because, again, the shipping piece, this ability to project combat power, yeah. vast distances just isn't there with the Axis, where the Allies are able to build those kinds of things. Yeah, but you can also say that a, a big blunder from the Allied point of view is that, you know, any future war, you know, you're going to have to cross an ocean other than, other than just defending your own territory. Sure, yeah. uh, and again, you know, smart thinkers should have kind of realized that, that at some point you're going to have to cross the sea um, in, in any future wars. And, and that's going to involve landing troops. And so you need landing craft, uh, uh, which are developed with uh, an unbelievable speed and brilliance and, 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 and ingeniousness um, come the 1940s, but haven't really been thought about in 1939. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a blunder by Britain. It's a blunder by the United States, I would say. Absolutely. Probably need to, yeah. No, we need to. You ready? Uh, what we'd like to do at this point is uh, we got about uh, 25 minutes left. We'd like to open the floor for questions uh, of our distinguished guests. And with Jeremy, I'll let you take over. There's a, there's a lot of blunders we missed, so I'm sure you guys will yeah. fill us in. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for John Curatola, James Holland, and Conrad Crane. 
First question is going to be in the center aisle here in the back. Please stand. Morning, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, this round table kind of dovetails perfectly with uh, a book I recently finished, which was Omaha Beach, A Flawed Victory by Adrian Lewis. Yeah. And I'd uh, like book. to hear your thoughts <laughs> on the decisions and flaws by leadership with regards to the planning of that assault. Just on Omaha. Right. You focus on Omaha Beach. Yeah. You want to go ahead? Huh? Yes. Just uh, take I, it. I, it's not one of my favorite books. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that the, he, there's a lot of hindsight in the book. Um, again, it, we're learning as we go. Uh, again, we talk about it, the number of amphibious assaults. The Army does a lot more amphibious assaults than the Marines do. Uh, but, and, but they have a much steeper learning curve in many ways, too. And yeah. a lot of the mistakes at Omaha are just, you know, you, 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 a lot of it is the experience teaches you hard lessons, and there's a lot of that at Omaha. That's what I would say. Yeah. And if I dovetail off of what Khan just said, uh, the Mediterranean is an important classroom for the Americans and the British to learning with regard to amphibious assault. As late as 1940, the Army's not even interested in amphibiosity, and the Marine Corps is doing its thing in the 1930s looking for a job. Um, and what happens is that with the Mediterranean, the Army has to learn to work with the Navy. Who drives the, the, the boats? Who are the coxswains? And, and how do you do a beach party? And how do you establish a beachhead? These are things the Army has to learn. And Omaha Beach is, is kind of the, the crescendo that we see in the European theater. Um, so again, th there is a flawed uh, approach, but because the Army's happen to come to the game late and learn these lessons really quickly. Yeah, I, I would say that the flaws are pretty small, really. I, I mean, I think the D-Day plan is, is the best one available, and again, the constraint is shipping. You know, that, that, that's the biggest thing. You know, of course they would want to land more men. They've got all those men back in, back in the UK, got all those stores and tanks and everything. Um, there's no issue at all, overwhelming amount. Um, the problem is, is how do you deliver it in quick order to the beaches? Well, you know, that's, the, that's where shipping comes into it. I think all things considered, it's a I can't really see what else they could have done. I mean, I think the five beach decision was right. I think dropping in the airborne troops at the flanks was right. Um, having a vast armada of 7,000 vessels and, you know, 4,127 landing craft and 1,203 warships, you know, but, but <laughs> what more can you ask for? I mean, I mean, of course you can ask for more ship, yet more ships, but, but you know, they're down on numbers of, of LSTs and landing ships, um, um, landing ships. They don't, they're, they're 33 short, which is a, big, big number, and that's because of the huge demands of war, you know, a huge war going on in the Pacific, war going on in the Mediterranean, you know, the demands of war are just absolutely immense, um, and, and yet D-Day is pretty successful. Okay, so they don't 100% get to all their D-Day objectives, but you're always going to give an objective which is beyond what is realistically achievable on day one, because you don't want to finally get there and then not have a plan B. But, but, but it's, it's a great, great you know, D-Day is an incredible success. And the bottom line is, is Omaha is, is costly, and I think it's 840 um, um, people, allied troops killed on, 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 on Omaha Beach, something like that, you know, which is a lot, but it's, it, it could have been a hell of a lot worse, and everyone's expecting it to be a lot worse. And, and it's a pretty successful operation. And, and you know, most of those, those strong points are, are, are reduced and um, in pretty quick order. Um, and yes, there's still fighting later on in the day, but, but it's, the battle is all over, really. I mean, it's, it's not, no longer a debate by, what, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, something like that? You know, I'd say that's a pretty successful mission. And the and other you, four beaches are a lot better. I mean, it's, it, you look at, again, you look at, got to look D-Day as a whole. Omaha has a lot of problems, but the other four beaches are much less problematic. And the Army does this in the short span of three years, which is a huge... It's phenomenal. Feet. It's absolutely phenomenal. And, and, and this is the thing that everyone kind of, there is this sort of, in the kind of sort of popular narrative, there is this assumption that the U.S. just arrives in December 1941 in the war with this sort of fully formed kind of massive behemoth. And, and nothing could be kind of less, than tr uh, um, less true. Where was it, 19 in the world in, in September 1939? 17th, I think. Yeah, yeah, between sort of Uruguay and Portugal or something. I mean, it's got, a, it's got an army of 189,000, which is gigantic compared to the, the British army of 2022, but is, is absolutely minuscule by 1939 standards. You know, it's, it's got nothing. It's got hardly any tanks. It's got hardly any... I mean, it's got 72 fighter planes or something like that, and they're kind of, you know, not particularly advanced types. You, you know, it's got a... It's, it's, 
it's just incredible. And yet, you know, you look at, at, uh, at the, I don't know, the, the port, the quayside of Bizerta, for example, in Tunisia in, in early July 1943, and you just see these rows of landing ships and rows of Shermans being rolled onto them. And you think, blimey, that's, that, that, is, that is exponential growth. And part, and part of the, 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 the thing about blunders is how do you learn from them? Right. And, and the Allies don't repeat many. Whereas we talk about the, the Axis continues to make kind of the same mistakes throughout. And so that, that's a big deal. The, the Allies are a much better learning organization than the Axis. And the United States are just yeah. the best at learning lessons. I mean, it is incredible how quickly they take hits on the chin, learn from them, and improve. And, and you know, that's why the US Armed Forces are the best in the world, bar none, by, by kind of 1945. <laughs> Or is it, is it, well, I hit the spot, next question is going to be to your left towards the front. Isn't it Churchill says, though, the Americans always do the right thing yeah. after trying everything, everything else? else yeah. <laughs> Over here, gentlemen. Uh, great panel. Thank you very much. Um, so during the little, you, know, you guys have focused a lot on the sort of operational and strategic level. Uh, but during the little break, I was talking with my uh, neighbor about more tactical level blunders. And he was arguing that the failure of the American army to bring M26 Pershing to Europe uh, was a blunder, which I actually don't think it is. The Sherman is, a, is one of the greatest tanks of World War II. But turning, yeah, yeah. Things, turning things around, what do you think of the um, idea of the focus of the Germans on heavy tanks and Tiger Ones and Tiger Twos as a huge mm. industrial and tactical blunder? Mm. Well, well they, they, they just can't compete industrially with the United States. They can't compete industrially with Britain, as, as it happens. So, you, you know, if you can't produce, or indeed the, U, the USSR, if you can't produce, you know, 85,000 tanks like the Soviets can with the T-34, for example, um, what do you do? Well, you go for quality over quantity. The, the problem, of course, is that with that quality comes greater complication. And maintaining them at the battlefront is very, very difficult. Um, and they don't help themselves by, by, of course, making them incredibly, incredibly complex. I, I mean, you know, anyone who knows how to drive a stick car can drive a Sherman tank. You get into it, it's the same configuration. OK, you don't have a steering wheel, you've got, you've got sticks. But, but trust me, I've done it. It's really, really easy. And, and, um, and, and you can't do the same with a Tiger tank. The Tiger tank is sort of like, like a, a, an 18-year-old new recruit getting into a Lamborghini Contact. And, and, and hoping they're not going to kind of grind the gears. You know, it's, it's just, they're too complex. I mean, uh, uh, the fabulous tank museum at Bobbington down in Dorset, which is really close to where I, where I live, you can see a cutaway of a Panther um, transmission, a gearbox. And it's just, it's mind boggling. And, and when it does break down, you can't get at it. <laughs> Um, whereas with a Sherman, you kind of do a few bolts at the front, pull it, you know, there it is, you pull it out, put another one in, you know, and you're good to go in two hours. And you can, you know, you can do that in the field. Uh, and the point about the Pershing is an interesting one, but, but we don't need that quality at that stage. What you need is lots. You need numbers. Uh, and you need, you know, you need to maintain the front and you need to be able to fit it into a Liberty ship, uh, into a compartment, because you don't have shipping containers in those days. You, you have to be that they're, they're working out how to do boxing up, but you don't have containers. Uh, and so everything has to be shipped in an easy way, in a convenient way, and the Sherman fits that. Uh, and you've got lots of them. I mean, you know, 74,000 Sherman hulls and 49,000 Shermans, that, that counts for a lot when you think about the numbers of a, of a Tiger tank, which I think if I'm right in saying is 1,347, um, which is not very many, 492 King Tigers. That's not going to win you a war. It might win you a rather kind of la -di da fancy tactical engagement at Villa Bocage, but is it going to um, affect the outcome of the war? No. Next question in the center aisle to the back here. Having gone into Manchuria in 1931, the Japanese picked December 7th. So they have 10 years of war fighting experience. They attack on a Sunday when most of the personnel are not on the ships. They use two waves and do not bomb the fuel dumps nor the dry docks. Was it a blunder to not we wait actually talked about this last year. until later than December 7th and use three waves 
and kill a lot of Americans, sink ships, bomb the fuel docks, uh, bomb the fuel depot, and the dry docks? Or did they choose two waves December 7th because of what was going on in Europe and try to get the Americans to negotiate? We actually talked about that last year at the What If session, uh, and basically the, the panelists decided that bombing the dry docks wouldn't have made any difference and, uh, or the, the fuel dumps, but uh, it, that's, that's an Agumo decision, though. I mean, they, had, they, had, they were prepared to launch that other wave, and he made the decision not to launch the wave because he, he, they hadn't taken out the American carriers. He didn't know where they were. So he, he leaves early because he's, 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 they've had a tactical success destroying the ships, and he wanted to get away. But they actually had a plan to do that third wave, but he decided it was too risky and, and backed off. Next question is going to be your left, halfway back with Connie. You haven't mentioned Mark Clark. What do you think his place is <laughs> in this discussion? I, 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 all I heard was Mark Clark, and then everyone laugh. I yeah. didn't hear the second bit. Yes, go ahead. What is his place in this discussion? I'm a big fan of Mark Clark, and I, and I say that with a completely straight face. I, I think he's been much maligned. He was an absolutely brilliant planner. Um, he was responsible almost entirely for, you know, he was heading up the planning for, for Operation Torch. First time of uh, 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 amphibious operation of that scale had ever been mounted. Three different invasion forces, one coming from 3,000 miles, two coming from 1,000 miles, uh, and they all landed pretty much in the right place at the right time. I mean, that is, that is some achievement. Uh, he, he's a fearless commander, as he proved repeatedly, going into um, Vichy-occupied North Africa ahead of the invasion. His actions on Salerno, he, he always fronted up to stuff. Um, uh, uh, one of his big criticisms is, is the Rapido. Um, you know, I don't really buy that because you know, it's not an army commander's job on how, you know, you, I want you to get across that river. That's a reasonable order uh, in, in the circumstances of the time and what their allies are trying to achieve. You know, how you do it is, is up, to, up to the divisional commander and his subordinate commanders. Um, so I don't, I don't think he's particularly to blame for the Rapido. Um, the breakout from Rome and not going to Valmontoni is the biggest non-story ever, um, because the truth of the matter is, is, is in the pre battle plan for Diadem, which is the, the offensive that's launched on the 11th of May 1944 to take Rome, break out of Casino. The idea is that 8th Army will push down the down um, Highway 6, the Via Casalina, which is on the kind of sort of right-hand side of the Liri Valley. And the, the US II Corps and, and the French Expeditionary Corps on their left flank will move through the mountains at a lower pace. So the idea is that at a certain point, 6 Corps, which is bottled up at, at Anzio, will break out and cut across to Highway 6 at this town called Valmontoni. And then 10th Army, German 10th Army, will be caught in this pocket by 8th Army meet, pushing forward and, and coming into the bit on the kind of left-hand flank where 2 Corps and, and the FEC are, are kind of following up behind. But what actually happens is the, the French and the Americans on the flanks of 8th Army do much, much better. And so 10th, 10th, German 10th Army, when it retreats, doesn't retreat at all down the Highway 6. Not a single soldier escapes from the front down that road. They're pushing much further kind of um, eastwards um, in, into the mountains. So going to Valmontoni is not going to stop you. On the other hand, as 6th Corps is driving out of the Anzio bridgehead, they're going across the flanks of the entire German 14th Army. And so what Clark does instead is he turns and puts most of his troops towards dealing with that and utterly destroys 14th Army. So in the pre-battle um, plan, the aim is to destroy 10th Army. What actually happens is they badly maul 10th Army and destroy 14th Army, which isn't in the battle plan at all. And I would say that's a pretty good result. Uh, and that is Mark Clark's decision. And the other thing is, is that there's been this kind of, this historiography of um, Alexander, who was the army group commander, being absolutely furious, he'd never incandescent with rage uh, that when Mark Clark didn't go all out for Valmontoni. That is just absolute nonsense. There is nothing in any of the diaries at all at the time to suggest that was the case. And Alexander was, was famously imperturbable uh, and phlegmatic about everything and tended not to lose his temper. In fact, the only time he's ever known to have lost his temper was in 1917, um, where, when one of his soldiers refused to give a drink of water to a wounded German prisoner. Um, uh, but otherwise, he was famous for keeping his cool. 
And it turns out that it all comes down to a, co a quote in a Raleigh Trevelyan book, who was a junior, um, who was a subaltern, a, a second lieutenant at Anzio, uh, part of a uh, British lieutenant, but, but part of, of the US Sixth Corps. And he interviewed Harold Macmillan, who was the British minister in um, Italy at the time, and uh, was a great pal of, of Alexander's. And he interviewed him in the 60s. And, and it was Macmillan who said that um, Alex was furious when, when Mark Clark didn't go all out to Montoni. But the weird thing is, is Raleigh Trevelyan never cited that quotation. So I rang him up. And I said, Mr. Trevelyan, you know, I just got this question about Harold Macmillan. You know, you, you never cited it. He went, gosh, did I not? I can't think why. I said, well, when, when was that interview? He couldn't remember at all. Now, to be fair, it was the 1960s, and that was quite a long time ago. But all I can tell you is no mention of Alexander losing his temp temper at all in Macmillan's diaries, which were written at the time. And even Lease, who hated Mark Clark's guts, they just didn't, they just did not see you eye to eye. They were kind of total chalk and cheese. Says, I have to say, the Americans have done absolutely brilliantly. You know, Mark Clark's done fantastically. Well done, Fifth Army. You know, so. And then, when Alexander gets bumped up and becomes Supreme Allied Commander in the Mediterranean, he has to choose a new Army Group Commander. And there is no pressure in Italy at all to choose an American. He could have chosen Dick McCreary, who's the um, Eighth Army Commander. He doesn't. He chooses Mark Clark. And why does he choose Mark Clark? Because Mark Clark's really good. So I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. For a, for a competing view, read Rick Atkins' book, Day of Battle. Yeah. He has a very much more negative view of Clark. And, and Clark's, Clark, in some ways, is his own worst enemy. Some of his personality rankled people, and especially later on, it, it leads to some acerbic. Yeah, 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 and... but, OK. And, this is, and I'm going to say this on a number of things. There's a lot of people that don't like generals and, and criticize them, historians who criticize them. You know, Monty is one, uh, um, Patton is another. You know, there's lots of people like that, who, and the reason people criticize them is because they don't like their characters. But I would argue that being an arrogant, um, vain, um, slightly narcissistic character doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a bad battlefield commander. And I think a lot of time, historians have conflated their personal dislike of the character with their abilities as a general. The two things are not necessarily uh, go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I have never met a humble general. <laughs> Alexander. We're going to go I never towards, him. No, I never no, no. Him. towards your right here in the front. <laughs> yes, you can say that about historians too. Definitely. I'd like to uh, have you address uh, the training of the individual soldiers. It seems that time again, uh, the American Army, especially our leader units, are trained that if the leadership is gone, you have to take over. And I wonder if that was true in the Axis powers or whether they were stymied by that chain of command. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> training is not a constant in the Second World War. Um, so, so training of elite, uh, of, of the primary divisions, and we're talking about the army here, let's just talk about the army for, 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 that, for this particular question. In the German army is really good in the 1930s. But only 33% of the troops in 1940, German troops in 1940, are in the kind of top echelon of, of, of training. So the lots of the, the other, whatever that is, 57% are not fully trained at that point, even though they're going into war. So again, there's not, there's not a consistency about training, and training changes as the war progresses. So, you know, your, your Fallschirmjäger, your paratrooper of 1940 is supremely well trained and highly motivated. He's a volunteer, he wants to be there, you know, he's, 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 he's gung-ho. And, and if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're motivated, you're more likely to use your initiative because you're motivated to do so. If you're just a conscript, all you want to do is keep your head, head down and kind of, I just want to be led. Just tell me what to do and I'll sort of do it. Um, but you don't really want to be there. By the end of the war, you know, you've got Fallschirmjäger who are, you know, got six weeks of training, they've done a couple of jumps, they're kind of kicked off to Brittany, you know, training continues on the job, you know, and what, what training do they do? You know, clearing mines, laying mines, doing route marches, that kind of stuff, putting on beach obstacles, and they're not particularly well trained at all. Um, um, so so it, it, it really, really depends. I mean, what you do find is that most troops, of allied troops, for example, landing on Normandy have had at least two years training. You know, that's pretty, pretty good. But you've got a fundamental problem. Your fundamental problem is that the vast majority of people don't want to be there. 
Um, and, and certainly from the point of view of British and, and Canadian and American troops, for example, you know, they're conscripts from democracies and, you know, they're not going to be shot if they run away. Uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's it, how you motivate them is, is very difficult and Americans motivate them by making sure they have regular post and, and Hershey bars and, and Coca-Cola and, you know, ice cream on ships and all that kind of stuff and, and, and making sure that they're, you know, not too much is expected of them. Um, and a lot is expected of them. By today's standards, it's a, it's, it's a fearsome amount. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very hard to kind of generalize about training because training is, as I say, it is, it's just not a, it's not a constant at all. And you know, you look at the, because of those 10 years that the gentleman at the back was talking about that the Japanese have had beforehand, you know, their fighter pilots at the start of the war when, the, when, you know, when they enter the war in the end of 1941, they're absolutely unbelievable. You know, they've got sort of 700 hours in their logbooks. They're supremely well trained. They're highly motivated. You know, they're absolutely a, a core delete. Uh, um, but by 1944, they're absolutely rubbish. You know, one of the reasons why my um, Mitch's mob kind of makes such a, um, a mess of uh, Azawa's um, aircraft uh, on the 19th and 20th of. of June 1944 is because they're undertrained, yep. you know, and it's exactly the same with with the Luftwaffe by 1944. You know, you've got you've got pilots coming in who've got 90 hours on their logbook against people who've got 350. You know, it's a, it's you know, and when and when your new fighter pilot comes and joins his Mustang group in March 1944, he's got 350 hours in his logbook. He's then kind of given a kind of you know a bit of a a, a week or two to acclimatise, get used to kind of his air base at Boxstead in Suffolk in England. Um, he's taken up by the old hands, taught some tricks so that, you know, his pilot skills are augmented by tactical nous and knowledge and experience. Then he's sent on a kind of, you know, a couple of milk runs. Uh, and only then is he kind of finally unleashed a kind of, you know, on a trip to Berlin or something. So his preparation is just superb. Whereas because of the shortage of fuel and shortage of absolutely everything, your 90 hour Luftwaffe fighter pilot arrives at the front, he's absolutely bewildered, he hasn't got it, he can barely take off in his 109, gets taken off, gets shot down immediately, and that just lands to a slaughter. So it's just... Um, and I think to yeah. that point, when you look at the, the production rates of German fighters in 1944, they go through the roof, but you don't have pilots to put in the airplanes, you no, know? Exactly and so you right. gotta well, have both things. A couple things on that. Number one is the... A book I recommend everybody, it's a book by Robert Rush called Helen Hurt and Forrest, where he has a great comparison of German and American replacement systems. And he talks a bit about how this training fits and the superiority of the American individual replacement system over the German replacement system. And on the fighter pilot thing, the deadliest job in World War II is being a German fighter pilot. 90% are killed or maimed for life. You don't fly 25 missions and go home, you fly till you get killed. Uh, but the one decision that I, the, one of the blunders I often wonder is, it, Hitler makes a decision to turn the ME-262 into a bomber mm -hmm. that delays the fielding of the ME-262 for a year. It's one of those great what ifs. What happens if ME-262 show up a year earlier? What does that do to the air mm -hmm. war? I mean, that's one of those decisions, that's a great what if thing, but I mean, that's a massive blunder by Hitler at, on a production level that I think has massive strategic effects down the road, kind of like the, some of the tank stuff as well. Next question in the back to your right. Uh, going back to Italy, was it a blunder by General Lucas not to go on to Rome instead of consolidating at Anzio? <laughs> oh, that old chestnut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's so hard to answer that one because the truth is the whole Italian campaign is blighted by insufficient shipping <laughs> and, and also by the prioritization of the um, US 15 strategic air force and, and the truth is I think that Anzio just doesn't have enough so I, I think he probably wasn't uh, I think he was probably right but I also think it was right that he left when he left because I think he'd kind of, he'd lost his way a little bit, and, and, and I think he was a bit too ponderous, and, and it needed fresh blood. And I, and I think the decision to remove him from post was the right one at the time. You know, these are really, really tough decisions. It's not that he did anything particularly wrong. It's just that he suddenly wasn't the right man in position anymore. And, and, and that's a gut instinct, which, which Alexander went for and, and which Clark concurred with. And I think it was the right call. But he couldn't have gone to Rome. It, it, he, he, he would have outstretched his, he'd have reached his own uh, um, culmination point in very quick order, I think. No, so. a, a bigger question would be, should we have gone to Italy at all? 
I mean, once once yeah. they took the the, the the southern boot and had the airfields at Foggia, what what good was the rest of the? You know, should, should Anzio even really have happened? I mean, that's another question about. You know, there was always that fear that you know Marshall had the fear that we got sucked in the Mediterranean, we'd get involved in these peripheral campaigns, which we did. I mean, with Marshall's fear in, in 1942, valid ones. I mean, that's one of those. It was was the Italian campaign. Well, well, well yeah. You know, the, the the huge strain on the Allied war effort is is absolutely enormous. And yet, you know, as, as you point out, you know, the getting those airfields at Foggia. Um, you know, I was there just a few weeks ago, and, and it's amazing. You know, it's, it's, you, you literally couldn't find a more obvious kind of bomber-friendly area than, than that, that weird sort of flat plain mm -hmm. around Foggia. It's extraordinary. And it absolutely drew German troops away. It absolutely forced them to kind of, re you know, replace the Italians in, in, in the Aegean and the Balkans and, and, and Greece. You know, so that's, that's a big tick. It's quite hard maintaining a front if you're permanently on the defensive. Um, but again, they just they just don't have quite enough of everything, you, you know. And, and the Americans agree to a, a Germany first policy, but it's a but it's a Pacific only just a narrow inch behind coming second. Um, and you know, in terms of shipping, there's a lot of times where actually it's it's that's the primary theater, not the secondary theater. So, you, you know, there's a there's an awful lot going on, and and. I, I, I feel for all those guys in, in Italy. I really do. I think they were given a really, really impossible task. Ladies and gentlemen, John Curatola, James Holland, and Tom Crane. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a true pleasure. Thank you so much. We will now have an abbreviated break. We will be back here at 10.15 to start our second session promptly. The three authors on stage have agreed that they'll be made available throughout the rest of the weekend as this is a shortened book signing break. 1015, thank you very much. I want to tell you about the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Like no other museum in the world, it brings to life the lessons and values of the war that changed the world. And not just with aircraft and boats and tanks, but with the powerful, personal stories of the men and women who served and sacrificed for our freedom. It's a remarkable place in an extraordinary city that every American should experience the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Every June, D-Day survivors, veterans of every war since World War II, family members, and visitors from all over the world come together to honor and remember the service members and civilians who sacrificed everything to save a continent and ultimately the world during the largest amphibious invasion that history has ever seen, June 6, 1944. In 2024, the National World War II Museum will return to Europe 80 years later to explore the battlefields, landing zones, airfields, and legacies of D-Day and the Bomber War. The 80th anniversary of D-Day cruise will sail May 29 to June 8, 2024. On this iconic voyage aboard the exclusively chartered Seabourn Ovation, guests will travel alongside esteemed historians on an epic 10-day journey along the northern coast of Europe with ports of call in Hamburg, Amsterdam, Dunkirk, East Anglia, Normandy, and disembarking in Dover. Each day, guests will choose from a wide variety of shore excursions at every port, custom curated by museum travel experts in collaboration with featured historians who will present a signature lecture series on board the ship. Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, an expert on World War II in Central and Eastern Europe and a veteran of museum travel programs, shares what's so special about traveling with the National World War II Museum. The National World War II Museum cruises are absolutely outstanding. The, the atmosphere on board the ship is just amazing because you're actually traveling with hundreds of people who absolutely share your obsession, interest in World War II history, and interest in the places that we're going to visit. So they're always amazing conversations. It's always interesting, and we have a chance to actually interact with so many different people. But it's also hugely luxurious. So yes, we're going to visit beaches, or we're going to visit sites, but then you get back on board, and it's absolutely the top of luxury and the top of comfort. Embark in Hamburg, where an optional three-night pre-cruise extension is available. 
Featured historian Keith Lowe, author of Inferno, The Fiery Destruction of Hamburg, 1943, discusses Operation Gomorrah, the devastating Allied raid on Hamburg that proved to be a pivotal moment in the Bomber War. The devastation of Hamburg was, was a shock, not only for Hamburg, but for Germany as a whole, because, you know, a million people fled the city afterwards, and they took with them stories of of disaster, of, of burning bodies and, and so on. It was a, so in the places where they arrived as well, you know, they were hearing these stories of devastation. So it, it, it was a not only a problem for Hamburg, it was uh, it destroyed the morale of Germany more generally for a couple of months after after it, it happened. Continuing to Amsterdam, learn of the occupation, the resistance, and a Jewish population forced into hiding. Before landing at Dunkirk, where an emergency evacuation facilitated partly by a civilian boat navy rescued the British Expeditionary Force. In the east of England, large areas of farmland became airfields for the American 8th Air Force. This rural landscape was soon dotted with dozens of what appeared to be small cities designed to support thousands of American crewmen. Dr. Donald L. Miller, author of Masters of the Air, America's Bomber Boys Who Fought the Air War Against Nazi Germany, is a frequent visitor to this part of England. Because they are intertwined, as Eisenhower pointed out when he takes over as Supreme Allied Commander of the D-Day operation, we can't land in France if there's Germans above us, unless we clear the sky of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, the most powerful air force in the world. We can't have an invasion. The men, the landing boats will be slaughtered. Finally, guests land in Normandy to spend four days traversing the beaches, hedgerows, and battlefields, honoring the service members who broke Hitler's Atlantic Wall and marched along the road to Berlin. Dr. John McManus, author of numerous books on D-Day, is always moved by his return to Normandy. I think the National World War II Museum, in, in putting together these tours, um, understands this kind of confluence of, of uh, real sort of deep dive history uh, for people who are quite into World War II, to, that you're going to learn something even if you've read voluminously on World War II. The, the confluence of that and luxury living, um, you know, because it's, it's just enjoyable, you know, to go to these accommodations and then to, to work with people who understand how to move a tour group through and, and to make sure that they're responsive to the guests, that they get out of it what they want. From that tour. Join us on this magnificent voyage aboard the award winning Seaborne Ovation, complete with luxurious amenities, world class historians, and an all inclusive, one of a kind itinerary not found anywhere else. My name is Tom Chikansky. I'm the director of collections and exhibits at the National World War II Museum and I was in charge of overseeing the restoration of the P-40 that's now hanging in our campaign's pavilion. The P-40 had an extensive career in World War II. Uh, it was one of the planes that we began uh, using as a Lend-Lease plane for Britain, uh, and it was also the first plane that we had for Lend-Lease with the Soviet Union. At the beginning of the war, it was our primary pursuit plane. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they were answered with P-40s. Uh, and it was also important in the China-Burma-India theater, and that's often overlooked or underrepresented. It served in every theater of the war, served with all of our allies, and continued in service throughout the end of the war. Alaskan Flying Tigers, commanded by the son of China's famous General Chinoo, are constantly on the alert. Taking to their ships, ready for instant action, they're playing an important role in keeping the Japs from American soil. The identifiable plane serial number that goes with our restoration was a plane that was flown up to Cold Bay, Alaska. Uh, and that's at the very tip of the uh, Alaskan Peninsula that re leads down to the Aleutian Islands. At the time it was in Cold Bay, it was uh, flying patrols and support missions. That was this is the same time that the Japanese had taken over uh, Kiska and Attu and so there was very active war up in the Aleutians at the time that it got there. And it was a dirt field and it was very cold and it had a ground taxing accident and was so badly damaged that they shoved it off to the side of the field, probably uh, took parts off of it as needed 
and eventually when the Air Force left Cold Bay, they shoved it in a ditch and buried it. As you can see how the whole aircraft is put together here, and we've assigned different teams to different assemblies. No single part on this aircraft is flat, square, or 90 degrees. Everything has to be made uniquely. Our restoration crew, uh, Flyboys, is based out of San Diego. Rolando Gutierrez and his crew, and they did the uh, actual restoration of the plane. I'm an engineer by degree, and uh, after 35 years of being an executive, I returned to school and studied uh, and obtained my aircraft maintenance certificate and began to do what I dreamed of doing all of my life, which is restore old World War II aircraft. Well, it looked horrible when we first got it. It was just beat up, corroded, disintegrated. Um, one of the wings that we got looked like there are some panels that we could um, take off and then put new ones on. Um, but when we pull started pulling the panels off, um, the skin panels, we realized that there was nothing left inside, that all the bulkheads, all the ribs, all the stringers was just dust, it was gone. Uh, everything is just so rare. So having to duplicate a part and the original part is twisted and mangled and it's been through a war. Uh, a lot of it was, they don't have the tooling and stuff that they had back then, it's just, it's all gone. There's hardly any of these planes left, so there's no need for the tools. So we had to make all the parts by hand. That was, that was, some of those were challenging. And there's sometimes six layers, seven layers of material that you have to build in different areas. Plus there's bulkheads, webs, and all these things have to fit in perfect harmony. And if they don't, you know, one of them just knocked off, it just doesn't work and we gotta start over. The plans show a, a flat representation of the, uh, of the part, and it doesn't tell you the order that the parts go together. It just tells you what parts are where. And the challenge, aside from getting the dimensions is sometimes we can't read the dimensions. So we have to do the calculation of how that engineer was thinking and how he went about in solving that part. I came to San Diego, Camp Pendleton, when I joined the Marine Corps in 2000, where I learned to work on aircraft, and uh, I've been doing it just about ever since. My great-great aunt was in the war, and she was an aircraft mechanic. Um, my grandpa was an aircraft mechanic. So it's kind of something that is in my heritage. I joined the military when I was, when I was about 18 years old. Uh, went to Iraq and got injured as an infantryman and kind of rethought my uh, my future. So I went to school for uh, airframe power plant mechanic. My father was a depression baby. As a child, I remember him always drawing images of World War II fighters and that's how he and I connected. And when he passed, I felt that the only way that I could keep that connection was to pursue something that I felt that he would be very happy with me doing, that he would be very proud. But it's, it's really that, that, that bond and that connection that I had with a father who grew up during the war and who grew up during very difficult times. This aircraft was built up using the original techniques and plans uh, so that the parts internally are replicated and when you're finished with it, you can see that you know, the rivets end up in the right places, the density of the rivets, the, the whole plane really presents itself well. Most of the time we were building it, you know, in pieces here and sections there, and then finally getting to see, you know, that piece come together, this piece put together, the wings on. It was, it was cool, it was really cool feeling. There's only a handful of people in the world who have built one of these planes. There's, there's so few left. And just being a part of that was, that's what was rewarding for me. Coming from a, like an infantry background, I know what it means to have planes in there. Building the, the P-40 in there just kind of gave me a more, more respect for the guys that came before me in World War II. Our crews were comprised of mostly uh, wounded warriors, uh, veterans of the current wars, and, and students, is a way for us to not only understand what they went through, as we were putting the planes together, we would see that there was very little protection between a pilot 
and his, the hostile environment that he was flying in. So it was a way of us understanding how brave these men were, and it is also a way for us to say, thank you, we will never forget you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please make your way back into the ballroom and find your seats and your cell phones. Seats and cell phones, please.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats and take your cell phones and silence them. Seats and cell phones, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, please, uh, please find a seat. We'll continue mission. Hope you enjoyed the first panel, and uh, the, uh, the the adventure continues. So this session features two historians that uh, many of us heard from yesterday: Dr. Zhao Bing Li from the University of Central Oklahoma and Dr. Ethan Mark from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, we brought the band back together. Uh, and, but today, they're, they're going to discuss uh, different facets of the Asia-Pacific War, how China fought back against Japanese occupation, and some of the social and economic impacts of Japanese control of Southeast Asia. This promises to be, yet again, a fascinating panel and uh, to lead the discussion, we have a prolific author, noted expert on the topic, and museum presidential counselor, Rich Frank. So, Rich, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And good morning to everyone. Good morning. For all of you who were here yesterday, I have to uh, state that you were present for a historic event. Never before in the 15 international conferences of this institution, have we had a panel, myself, it was Ricardo Jose, and Ethan Mark. All three panelists had entirely reversible names. <laughs> <laughs> and in all these years, we've never managed to do that before. So we're entering that in the Guinness Book of Records. So today, uh, yesterday in the pre-conference, uh, both uh, Dr. Zhao Bing Li and, and Ethan Mark talked about China and Indonesia, respectively, uh, in uh, one framework of sort of the participation uh, in the war as, as a military uh, effort or strategic effort. And today, we want to get much more into really one of the, v in my view, one of the most important areas with respect to the Asia Pacific War, which is the tremendous impact of Japanese uh, conquests and imperialism on the nations and peoples that it overran uh, during its war between 1937 and 1945. Now, as I indicated yesterday, I'm, I'm not really big on introductions. I've never yet had people walk out of a session saying, eh, that session was not so hot, but the introduction was really super, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we pick our historians because, you know, I'm from Missouri, you know, the Show Me State, so, we think they're going to show you just exactly why we picked them. But nonetheless, let me touch at least a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Xiao Bing Li is an absolutely top flight scholar of Chinese history and what in China is called the War of Resistance and into the Cold War. He is past president of the Chinese uh, Historians of the United States and currently is secretary of that organization. He's the editor in chief of that publication. Of course, as uh, Mike mentioned, he teaches at the University of Central Oklahoma. And I note uh, one facet is that he was a past chairman of what was called the, there, the Department of History and Geography, which reminds me of a story. Mark Twain once remarked that war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> <laughs> and there is more than a little truth to that, isn't it, you know? You know, stamp collecting and studying military history will, will do that for you, whatever here. Um, it's a fact uh, that in the US and in the West in general, uh, both the academic and popular literature is skewed very heavily towards uh, the European war. Uh, I used to do counts in bookstores and get like three or four to one compared to publications on the Asia Pacific war. And really, if you look at that on a population and geographic scale, uh, Dr. Uh, Bing Lee, which is how I prefer to be record, referred to, would not be a historian of one nation in Europe. He would be a historian of most of Europe in terms of population and geographic scale. And the particular emphasis uh, that uh, Dr. Mark has has been on uh, Japanese imperialism, and then he's done very 
extensive and very important work on Indonesia and the war. In fact, he's one of the very rare scholars we have who've really done really important and impressive work on Indonesia and the war. Um, the uh, remark I made yesterday is equally true that uh, one of the things about Dr. Mark's work is that he was dealing with a, a huge topic that had very problematic uh, academic quality resources in terms of documentary evidence, and he had to use great resourcefulness in order to uh, get to the uh, real story of what happened there. So with those opening remarks, let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bing Lee, and he's going to talk about China uh, and uh, the aspect about what, what's really going on inside China during the war. Thank you, Rich, for your introduction. Last night, during his conversation with Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, Dr. Richard Aubrey discussed his new book, Blood and Rain, The Last Imperial War, 1931 to 1945. The conversation helped us have a better understanding of the war between China and Japan. I learned at least three things. Point one, the beginning time of China's resistance war. Point two, Japan's resettlement. The last point, the economic nationalism. So it is important to note that Japan's imperial war against China started on September 18, 1931, when Japanese imperial army attacked Chinese army and occupied Manchuria. China fought his resistance war for 14 years, from 1931 to 1945. Now, Japan's resettlement Dr. Overy talked about resettlement of the imperial powers like Germany. His aggressive actions in the 1930s were retaliatory and getting back what they lost in the 1920s. But what about Japan? Japan never occupied Manchuria before. How the fantasy imperial idea fit to Japan's invasion? Well, we need to learn a little bit about geography and history of uh, East Asia. Japan defeated China in the first Sino-Japanese War of uh, 1894 over Korea. According to the peace treaty between the Qing Dynasty and the Meiji government in 1895, China agreed to cede the eastern Manchuria to Japan along with Taiwan, Penghu, Sankaku, and other offshore islands in the East China Sea. However, because of a Russian diplomatic intervention, Japan did not get Manchuria. Japan was not happy. During the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 over Manchuria, Japan defeated Russia. But because of American diplomatic intervention, Japan did not get Manchuria. When the peace treaty was signed between Japan and Russia in America in 1905, Japan not happy. So the last point, economic nationalism played an important role in Japan's war decision against China. Under economic pressure after the Great Depression of uh, 1929, Japan decided a pan-Asian expansion policy, a land-going expansion into Asian continents to solve his economic problems. Again, in 1931, Japan occupied Manchuria for economic reasons. Next year, Japan established state of Manchukuo, a puppet state 
independent from the Republic of China. However, the occupation of Manchuria had a little economic return because of his uh, backward agriculture, low productivity, long winter, and small population. Japanese Imperial Army even had problem to feed his one million troops in Manchuria. Well, half of the troops prepared the war against Soviet Union. Okay, because Tokyo believed that his land going expansion into Asian continent soon or later would face a showdown with this Euro-Asian power, the Soviet Union. But occupation of Manchuria did not provide economic needs, including the raw material and market. So Tokyo decided to move into central China, into Yellow River and Yangtze River Delta, China's rice ball. On July 7, 1937, Japanese army crossed Marco Polo Bridge and captured the city of Peking. Total war between China and Japan began, or the Second Sino-Chinese War. China's resistant war can be divided into three phases. The first, strategic defense from 1937 to 1941. Second, stalemate from 1941 to 44. And strategic counteroffensive from 1944 to 1945. For the first time, Chiang Kai-shek became a national leader. Well, General Li Small Jiang was the president of the Republic of China since 1927, but he only controlled 14 out of 23 provinces, half of the country under the control of the Chinese warlords. Jiang also fought a civil war against Chinese communist forces. Now, by 1937, Jiang established a united front, included all the warlords and Chinese communist forces. Jiang able to mobilize 14 million troops against Japan's invasion. In 1937, Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, accepted Jiang Kai-shek as a national leader and stop anti-government insurgencies. Thereafter, Mao sent communist troops behind the enemy line and conducted guerrilla warfare against Japan's occupation. In November 1937, Japanese army took over Shanghai. A month later, Japanese troops defeated Jiang's 700,000 defensive forces and occupied the capital city of Nanjing. After lost the defense of Nanjing, Jiang Kai-shek removed the seat of his government to Chongqing for the rest of the war. By 1938, Japan had two million troops in China. However, the total war, again, still did not serve Japan's economic needs for the raw materials like oil, coals, and rice. There was a strategic debate in Tokyo between Japanese army and the Navy. Japanese naval officers began to question this uh, land-going expansion. Look, Japan is an island country like Great Britain with limited human resources. Let Navy do the job. We should move to the south. We should begin a 
ocean going expansion instead of land going expansion to those countries in Southeast Asians like Indonesia, Philippines, Malaya, and Singapore. So Emperor Hirohito agreed with Naval's argument. Thereafter, Japan began his uh, southward expansion into Southeast Asian countries. The strategic shift provided the stalemate for China's resistant war from 1941 to 1944. From the very beginning, of course, Japanese naval officers warned the emperor that their ocean-going expansion would face a Pacific power, the United States. So Japanese Navy prepared war against America from the early years. And also they sent their naval officer to study in America. <coughs> After Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the airline aid became available for the Chinese army. President Franklin Roosevelt sent General Joseph Stilwell to China as the U.S. top advisors to Chiang Kai-shek. Since Vinegar Zhou did not get along with Jiang, he was replaced by General Albert Widmer later. During those years, from 41 to 45, United States provided more than two billion military aid to Chiang Kai-shek, either through the Burma Road or uh, air lifting over Himalaya from India, <coughs> over the hump. Chiang Kai-shek also served as the commander of China Burma Indian Theater. He became one of the big four as an airline leader next to FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. In 1945, after the two atomic bombs, Japan surrendered to China on September 2nd, 1945. China's resistance war was over with a high cost, including 3 million military deaths and 10 million civilian deaths. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. I'm happy to be back and to talk a bit more about um, the experience in, in Southeast Asia and Indonesia in particular. But I wanted to start with a segue also, um, talking a little bit about the, the, the war in China. And, um, and its impacts on, not only on Southeast Asia, but on the rest of the world. Last night, again, to segue also to connect with how you opened, I wanted to also congratulate um, Richard Overy once again for a um, really impressive, uh, uh, overwhelmingly impressive study, I think, which raises this very important uh, issue of empire to the center of our understanding of the war. Um, and one thing I think as an, as an Asia historian, one thing I might even emphasize even more is the role of China um, in this development and the war in China and Chinese resistance um, as, a, as really a part of global history. And to think about the fact that the Japanese in the 1930s were facing not one but two crises. One was the Great Depression, but the other was anti-colonialism. Um, so the Japanese faced this crisis and a lot of their behavior in the, in the 30s and 40s followed from that. And that, that crisis was generated by Chinese resistance. Um, and what we see in some ways is a pattern with the Japanese trying to suppress that and, and escalating, um, which is a pattern that we see after World War II in a lot of places around the world where um, uh, societies that had been relying on their empires and assumed that that would continue forever uh, were confronted with, with a new kind of resistance and they didn't know how to respond. And, the Jap and this generated um, uh, fear, and it generated also fantasies. And, um, and these resulted in, of course, tremendous uh, human costs. So let me um, start uh, with, in fact, does this not want to work? The green one, then. 
I don't have a I don't have an advance of my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So it's again important to keep in mind that uh, we are at, at the as I also mentioned yesterday the situation the. the um, the situation before the war starts in the in the Asia Pacific is a um, an Asia that is uh, certainly Southeast Asia and South Asia that is colonized um, by the various uh, Western powers uh, and Japan itself also as a colonial power in East Asia. Um, and so today I'm going to focus a bit uh, on the on the toll. Uh, of the Japanese um, uh, invasion of, uh, of Southeast Asia for uh, the Netherlands, East Indies, uh, what we now know as Indonesia in particular. So colonial economies in general were export economies. Uh, and this is a critical uh, aspect to keep in mind if we want to understand the disaster that befell uh, Southeast Asia uh, and other parts of Asia during World War II. The Japanese um, did not pursue uh, a genocide, um, uh, at least not consciously, of the of the level that we see, for example, with Nazi Germany, um, the the casualty figures and the kind of um, the Japanese uh, uh, attitude towards uh, the Chinese and the Chinese resistance um, certainly um, um, is comparable to what the what the Germans, for example, did in in uh, in the East, in particular, and in the Soviet Union. Um, so those can't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into this question of, of you know, of comparability necessarily, but an essential, an, I think a really basic factor of understanding the disaster that befell uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia in this period had to do with the fact that these economies had been geared for international trade and they were not self-sufficient. They, uh, they needed to import, many places in Southeast Asia and South Asia needed to import food. They needed to import clothing. Um, and this is something we can blame the Western powers for. Um, this, is how, this is how empires and, and uh, colonialism works. Um, so that uh, the colonies were turned into basically resource places of, uh, where, that are producing resources that are profitable to the, the, uh, to the European um, and uh, Japanese empires. Um, so, a very delicate balance, and, um, and that balance is reliant on international trade staying open and working. And what we see in the 1930s is that that system starts to break down as a result of the Great Depression, and um, this is going to be um, a, uh, exacerbated much, much more by the Japanese invasion of these areas. So the Japanese already in that sense are, uh, are undermining uh, and and, and uh, uh, present, uh, creating a situation that's going to be disastrous. Um, so for Indonesia, the uh, very important exports there, oil I have in bold because the Japanese were the most interested in the oil, uh, also rubber, uh, sugar. These are, these are uh, essential uh, um, uh, exports uh, around which the Indonesian economy was, as I said, kind of designed by the Dutch over a long period. And they were importing rice, clothing, manufactured goods, and machinery. So their lives and livelihoods were dependent on being able to produce for the international market and using uh, what the, you know, the, the, the amount that they were able to earn to purchase their, their, uh, their basic foodstuffs and clothing. Any disruption to this system was therefore going to have huge consequences. Japan, uh, for its part, we've talked about this some already, uh, but just to remind everyone very briefly that Japan also is in a, uh, an insecure position um, globally. The Japanese throughout modern history really have a, a basic choice to make, which is whether they are going to get their resources that they need through trade or whether they're going to get them through aggression. Um, and what we see in the 1930s and 40s is Japan's leaders deciding that in this hostile climate of the global depression that they're going to choose aggression to try to guarantee their access to, uh, to the resources that they need. Um, and um, again, this, this kind of creates a, 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 um, uh, a global disaster. So what happens in the Great Depression is that the, uh, the uh, Western powers, those who have empires, start to close off their markets to, uh, to outside competition. Uh, and this is a, a disastrous kind of snowball effect. We've been talking about this uh, recently also, the kind of debates in economics about whether protectionism is a good idea when there's a recession. And we look back to that example of the 1930s, and, and that lesson is watch out. 
because if you have, if everyone starts to practice protectionism and closing down their markets, you get a snowball effect. And this is particularly dire in the, in the 1930s when, some, when the great powers have these large empires that they, they can close the, the, the borders around them, you know, they can wall them off in terms of, by, by imposing tariffs and so on, to make it difficult for others to compete. The Japanese had been relying on their access to Asian markets in particular, and then they find these Asian markets harder and harder to penetrate. Um, so, the, from the Japanese perspective, they blamed the West, uh, the Western powers, for basically um, cutting, cutting off their access. Um, so, from the, the Japanese perspective, was one of actually that, that we're being, we're being surrounded, we're being choked by the by the Western powers. So, that aspect of the of the picture has to be acknowledged that there was kind of a give and take, a to and fro, um, through through the 1930s, uh, which the Japanese saw as you know they're the ones who actually are to blame for our predicament. We can't count on them. We need to get our resources with our own uh, with our own military um, and by seizing territory because we can't trust the Western powers to uh, to keep the, these these access lines open for us. So. Um, this was the goal of expansion. Assure access to raw materials, cheap labor, markets. Manchuria was the first target, but as uh, uh, Professor Bin said, uh, Manchuria didn't yield very much. Uh, there, were, there were some important uh, raw materials there. Um, the Japanese wanted to ship some of their excess population there, but a lot of, they, they had a lot, hard time getting Japanese to go. Uh, Manchuria is not a really uh, fun place um, in terms <laughs> to live. It's, it's really cold, it's, it's barren. Um, so the Japanese ended up having to try to force, actually, uh, poor Japanese to go and settle there without a lot of success. And then we get the problem, as I mentioned, to start with Chinese resistance, which, uh, uh, which the Japanese don't know how to handle. Um, and and it, it, they, they end up uh, trying to basically to, to force the situation by using force and more and more of it, an excessive force. I don't know, the word excessive is kind of strange to use here. Um, but we see, we see uh, rising atrocities uh, committed on the Japanese side. Um, so uh, the war is stalemated in China. Again, I don't have enough time to go into detail on that, but the Nazi victories in Holland and France in 1940 create a situation where the Japanese become, they see opportunities. There's even an expression at the time, don't miss the bus, meaning the Japanese leadership see that, for example, Indochina is now under Vichy control. That means the Japanese can move in there without much trouble, because now Vichy is a, an ally of, of Japan, in fact. Um, so in 1940, Prime Minister Matsuoka, uh, this is in the flush of the Nazi victories in Europe, uh, floats this idea of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, uh, and the aim, what he talks about, is to construct a self-sufficient economic bloc uh, that includes the Netherlands, uh, East Indies, uh, French Indochina, um, and the South Seas. Okay, hold on just a second, yeah. Um, so, but the move into French Indochina meets with allied um, embargoes. The Japanese actually aren't expecting the West to, uh, to have so much backbone. Um, and, uh, and this, uh, they, again, they feel like they, the, they are being the ones being kind of pressured. I'll go very quickly past this one. Um, but just very quickly, I wanted to mention that in the 1930s, uh, Indonesia and other places in Southeast Asia actually uh, were flooded with Japanese products. This was how the Japanese tried to get out of the Depression. And, um, and this is what the Western powers were trying to, to stop during the 30s. So this was a point of tension. From the perspective of Southeast Asians and certainly people in Indonesia, there was actually a, a very positive response to this. Here, the Japanese are actually providing uh, cheap and reasonable quality products for us. Maybe if the Japanese come in and, and, and liberate us from the West, then we'll, we'll get a lot more of that. So there was, there was an, an Indonesian kind of, um, uh, that was one of the attractions that, that was part of the, the welcome of the Japanese, uh, was this idea the Japanese might be able to bring prosperity. In fact, the Japanese had privately Certainly, the Japanese leadership had very grim, uh, uh, grimmer understandings. So, it's important to note that the, the, the disaster in Southeast Asia that, that happens is not only something that kind of overtakes the Japanese, that they had good intentions. Uh, they knew, they knew beforehand that this was going to be disastrous for, for the people of Asia. Um, privately, at least. They didn't make it save much in their propaganda. One uh, Japanese analyst in 1940, Professor Machita Masahisa from Rikyo University, said, quote, we can take from Asia, but we have little to offer. It would be more honest to call it Lebensraum than a co-prosperity sphere. Um, 
And a second one is Finance Minister Kaya Okinori in November of 1941, just a month before Pearl Harbor. He says, for a considerably long period, we cannot afford to pay attention to the economic well-being of local people. We cannot but adopt so-called exploitative policies. In order to obtain nat natural resources and labor, we will issue military notes and other currencies, but maintaining their value will be difficult. It's a a prophecy, actually, of what's going to happen. We adopt the principle of self-sustenance of our expeditionary forces and exportation of commodities from Japan to the occupied land must be kept at the absolute minimum. Local inhabitants are, however, culturally primitive, and their lands are rich in natural resources. Maintaining their lifestyles will therefore be relatively easy in comparison with some other areas, such as in China. This is brutal colonial realpolitik. Um, and in reality, this is this, we see that the, the occupation uh, quickly uh, in Indonesia, for example, and other places, turns into a disastrous situation for those colonial uh, populations. Brutal punishments. International trade is cut off. The Japanese print military scrip, as, as the, the finance minister had privately said. We're not going to be able to support the value of this because we're printing it without any basis, basically. Um, so this is also foreseen and yet pursued nevertheless. This shows a kind of a callousness towards the basic uh, necessities of, of uh, Southeast Asian and Asian life, um, and quite a contradiction in that co-prosperity sphere idea. Japanese priorities were elsewhere, and firstly, with their own strategic interests and their own, their own uh, uh, living standards. And indeed, the Japanese, meanwhile, often lived a very luxurious lifestyle, taking right over from the Dutch, in the case of Indonesia. Indonesians observing this were quite perplexed and disappointed, to say the least. Um, and we have an, I have an, one more quote here from the Japanese uh, military government in 1942, October. Uh, they, the Japanese like to uh, have cartoons like this, which showed, you know, we have a common ancestry and common practices, uh, and this is one big happy Asian family. Uh, our, the rice fields look the same in Japan as they do in, in Indonesia. But, private, uh, but even publicly, this is a public statement, a Japanese military government uh, official says, there is no progress among Java's blessedly simple peasantry. They lack the farmer's spirit of tenaciousness seen in, Java, in Japanese villages. If a Japanese-type farmer's spirit is, Im is imported to Java's villages, which are naturally possessed of favorable growing conditions, it will not be too difficult to get four or five harvests. After all, even if you do nothing, you get three harvests. Uh, incredible colonial uh, ignorance, uh, and it's not a joke, right? We end up with, uh, with massive... Uh, starvation and, and death uh, coming out of this. Or, and, and from the second half of the occupation, from October 1943, food and clothing uh, are in very short supply. Meanwhile, the Japanese raise the production targets for food, uh, and, um, and um, the, the common people face deprivation, corruption, profiteering, and black markets. As the Japanese answer to the problem is to try to control the economy, and this only makes things worse. And then we get the Romusha, uh, these forced laborers who worked on airfields, shipyards, roads, railways, and defenses. They were officially volunteers, as uh, I mentioned yesterday, in reality, slave labor. They had very little choice. Uh, Indonesian uh, officials on the ground often helped the Japanese, alas, in carrying this out. By 1945, we have clothes made of gunny sacks or rubber, uh, rice requ requisition rates in some places up to 60%, inflation up several hundred percent. We have a, a terrible drought on top of everything else, which was out of the Japanese control, but it certainly didn't help. Uh, forced labor, we have people dying along the roadsides, and we end up with casualty estimates in Indonesia, three to four million, or roughly 6% of the population. In Vietnam, by the way, a similar uh, situation with as much as 8% of the population perishing. Um, so um, that, that's, uh, that's it for, for my uh, presentation, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I've spent a lot of time now in my professional career on the Asia-Pacific War. And one of the issues which has become uh, a very powerful uh, source of my concern uh, is the dead. And one of the, of the principles I apply in looking at this is to first count all the dead and treat all the dead as sharing a common humanity. And by that, I mean, I'm not going to neglect the Japanese uh, during the fire raids or the atomic bombs. I provided graphic descriptions of those in my book, Downfall. 
But the problem I have with much of the historiography, especially for decades after the war, is that no sense of the tremendous number of deaths and the suffering of the people in China, throughout Asia, and the Pacific that was brought by that war. Now, Dr. Bing Li gave you some basic numbers, and um, as I'm sure he'll agree, no one knows with absolute certainty what the, what the death totals are. We only have reasonable approximations because there was so much chaos and no one was keeping count. I've collected over the years uh, estimates uh, from one was a 3,000 Chinese civilian, uh, 3 million Chinese civilians dying. That was very early in the war. And the highest I've ever seen is uh, one scholar who said that there were 37 million Chinese who died during uh, the war resistance. And Dr. Li gave us a, a 10 million figure for civilian deaths, which is, which is well within the range. I would even venture maybe low or whatever here. And what I would like to emphasize to you is that it's not just a number. If you, if you work this out on a linear basis, the war that China fought for eight years is about 2,963 days. Divide that into 10 million deaths. That's roughly 3,500 Chinese dying every single day, every week, every month, every year for eight years, which is vastly above the number of Japanese uh, non-combatant or civilian deaths during the war. And I wanted to turn to Dr. Bing Lee and, and talk a little bit about that. I mean, it, it's not just the numbers. It's sort of what happened. You've got starvation. You've got poison gas. You've got biological warfare. And we normally don't get that story here in the West. Well, for the uh, civilian death so high because of the uh, war-related uh, event, like uh, during the defense of uh, Nanjing, the Chinese government mobilized not just uh, a military defense, but also mobilized the civilian population to defend the city. So after Japan took over the city, Japanese generals uh, issued an order to uh, eliminate all the Chinese military personnel as well as those laborers who served or helped the military. So after uh, Japan took over the city, about 300,000 Chinese civilians uh, were killed during late 1937. Uh, and Ethan, I, I know you mentioned between estimates about three to four million. Once again, I mean, this is one of the huge problems. And it's not just in Asia Pacific, I mean, even in Europe, obviously, we have uh, disputes about what the exact totals are. And I think most historians recognize there is no such thing as a definitive exact total. You only get ranges for most of these uh, episodes over here. Uh, the US and the UK kept rather better records in many respects or whatever, but they are fairly unique in that respect. But, you know, in terms of three to four million uh, Indonesians dying during the war, and actually, I've, I've done it one way, a sort of linear basis, but in Indonesia, it really hits very heavily in 44, 45. Yep. A very disproportionate number of the total deaths are in that period. Can Absolutely. You talk a little bit about that. Yep. Um, well, the the second half of the occupation um, is a period where the Japanese are losing the war, very obviously, right? And they take. And this is a pattern that we've seen. We've seen it in some of the other presentations um, that we see extreme measures taken in response. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, you might say, well, the, the Japanese were in a desperate situation, uh, but it doesn't excuse. Uh, again, the, the, uh, uh, the, the extremes, that, the measures that were taken, um, again, a callousness towards human life. Um, no one perhaps could envision or, or uh, anticipate exactly how terrible and, and deadly it would be. But uh, from October of 1943, um, the Japanese start to um, uh, do a couple of things. One is that they mobilize uh, laborers to build defensive fortifications in particular, but all kinds of infrastructure as well. They're expecting an attack. Um, you know, the Japanese don't have a crystal ball, um, and they don't know that the Allies and the Americans in particular are gonna, are gonna go right past um, Indonesia, because except for New Guinea, it's not actually, the, the Allies decide it's not uh, so strategically important. The Japanese, meanwhile, are, are gearing up 
for uh, a huge defensive campaign. They're, they're ch one of the things they also do is to train Indonesians. Um, before, they weren't ready to do that, but now they start training Indonesians as soldiers. Um, and uh, and an another thing they do is uh, they, they heighten the, so they, they, they mobilize laborers, but they also heighten the requisitions. So they start to demand um, agricultural produce uh, to, again, to support the war effort. And you see more and more kind of fanatical uh, focus on raising production, raising production. Um, but this is not to feed Indonesians. This is mainly to supply the Japanese uh, themselves. And okay, what's left over um, will hopefully be distributed to the Indonesians. There is a contradiction here in the sense that the Japanese, many of them certainly on the ground, did not see Indonesians or other Southeast Asians as an enemy. So uh, we're not, in that sense, we're, it's a little bit of a different situation from China where you have active resistance. Where the Japanese encountered active resistance, you know, they, they were absolutely brutal and, and, and you know, comparable to, uh, to their allies in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, but in Southeast Asia, they did not encounter a lot of resistance, particularly, certainly not in Indonesia. And so they saw the Indonesians as, as uh, um, at least abstractly, as their, as their allies and their little brothers. But as we've seen from some of the quotes I've mentioned, they also had you know, colonial attitudes towards Indonesians, um, and they were, they were all too willing to sacrifice them uh, for these uh, massive projects. So they are forcing the Indonesians to work um, in a time when there's very little food, when there's very little clothing, when there's very little medical supplies. It's just a recipe for disaster. One of the other dimensions of the war uh, in China that is, to me, is stunning, is because of the Japanese brutality, both with respect to random murder of not only Chinese military personnel, but anyone they suspect might have been or might be a soldier, as well as their actions against Chinese women. Uh, they create an incredible state of terror. And as a result of that, as the Japanese advance uh, from the coast and particularly up to the Yangtze and the Yellow River, there is this tidal wave of refugees that flee. It's an incredibly large portion of the Chinese population. As with the deaths, we, no one has exact figures. I mean, one of the recent scholars, uh, Ron Mitter uh, of Oxford, who posted a really wonderful book called Forgotten Ally about China during the war, he estimated that as many as 80 million Chinese refugees, maybe 100 million, were created by the war of a total population, he put it about 450 million. Uh, it's almost incomprehensible uh, what happened. And Dr. Lee, you want to t talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit? Yeah, this uh, war of refugees uh, is a major issue during the war. Since the war so long, even you count it, so eight years or 14 years. So, uh, so many Chinese try to survive, not just uh, uh, Japanese uh, brutality. Also, there were other conflicts, like we mentioned here, uh, there were communist movement in China as well. So Mao Zedong, as a Chinese communist leader, had a different way of war from uh, Jiang Kai-shek. Jiang fight war, tried to protect civilian population, like we talked about the defense of Nanjing and Wuhan. But Mao and the Communist Party tried to involve the Chinese people into the war, what they call people's war. So they armed, trained women and children against Japanese army. You don't need to leave. You can defend your own village, your own town. So the large populations uh, afraid of the involvement in war they have to leave the town, they could not stay because either they killed by the Japanese invading troops or they may die also in the war against Japan organized by the Chinese Communist Party. So as Rich mentioned here, by the end of the war, Mao had the development of the military force. In 1937, the Chinese Communist forces totaled 50,000. By the end of the war in 1945, the total of Chinese Communist forces reached 1.2 million, a large army. 
and Mao controlled a total population of 100 million, about a quarter of the total population. Uh, just one more before we turn it over to questions from the audience. But Ethan, do you want to talk a little bit about one of the other searing issues, uh, comfort women in this uh, period? Yeah, um, I, I uh, wanted to include them in the lecture, so thank you for raising that. Um, it's, it's hard to get to fit everything in into 15 minutes. But, um, f and if we think about forced labor, we don't necessarily think about the comfort women first, um, uh, because it's, it's not necessarily, we don't think of, of uh, you know, we, we think of the, the corvée Romusha. Um, but uh, the comfort women is another um, uh, you know, atrocious uh, development during World War II on the Japanese side, um, which is now a, a, a kind of a, has been in the last 30 years or so, a hot uh, point, hotly debated, um, certainly on the ja among Japanese nationalists who see, who think that the, the story is exaggerated and have tried to kind of, uh, um, I think to, in some ways they, they're trying to kind of cloud the waters um, to, to keep us from uh, understanding the basic facts. Um, the fact is that the Japanese uh, military had um, an extremely uh, patriarchal attitude um, towards, uh, towards women. Um, they used uh, women from, uh, cynically uh, uh, used a, a vast majority of women that they, that they um, mobilized or rounded up uh, to serve as comfort women uh, were women from the colonies, so particularly Korea. This was a way of avoiding um, uh, avoiding uh, the kind of unrest that might be generated if they drafted too many Japanese women into this kind of service. Um, it was also a way of trying to avoid international law, which forbid uh, the trafficking of women. Um, so the, the Japanese tried to get around that by saying, well, these are Korean, these, are, these Koreans are actually Japanese subjects, so it's not international trafficking. Um, they, they, um, had this idea that, um, that the soldiers needed to be protected from venereal diseases, um, that soldiers needed to also to uh, be, have their needs uh, um, serviced in a organized way that would not create a, a kind of unrest and chaos um, in the areas that they were conquering, therefore basically assuming uh, that, that these Japanese soldiers, young men, needed to be serviced. And that was the role of, uh, of women, particularly, of course, working class women, Korean women by and large, in, in each of the areas that the Japanese occupied. Um, they set up uh, these, uh, uh, what they called comfort stations. Um, there were private uh, entrepreneurs involved in it. And this is one of the, also one of the areas where the Japanese uh, uh, revisionists are trying to obfuscate, c confuse uh, the discussion. Look, most of the people who were operating and, and trafficking these women were actually Koreans. So it's not our problem. This is absurd. It's not absurd because it's not true necessarily, but it's absurd to suggest that the Japanese military would have let this happen without being involved in it. Um, so it was very much organized from the top. Yes, Korean, uh, Korean entrepreneurs and Korean traffickers were involved heavily in the operation. Civilians, of course, uh, had their, their part to play, and there were Koreans who profited from the enterprise. Uh, but this was also, in the case of colonial Korea, a, a, a result of a terrible economic situation as a result of colonialism, which drove many Koreans into, um, into uh, uh, all kinds of, of, of uh, um, work and and, and, and uh, enterprise at the bottom of the social ladder, basically. And that included um, being involved in, in this, this kind of, unfortunately, this kind of trade. Um, the only uh, uh, Japanese who were ever prosecuted for the comfort women were those who had engaged in uh, the kidnapping of, uh, of white women uh, in the Netherlands East Indies, as it happened. So the Dutch did put some Japanese on trial for doing that. Unfortunately, this highlights another kind of contradictory aspect of this period. This is a period we haven't talked much about race and racism as a problem. In World War II, it was a problem not only among the Japanese, of course, and not only among the Axis powers, but the Allied powers as well. Um, and so this between attitudes towards women and attitudes, uh, race, racist attitudes um, and understandings of the world um, really put this problem on the back burner in the, in the eyes of the prosecutors at the time. This has changed, right? I'm happy to say that, that our global kind of understanding of these issues has changed a lot. Um, and particularly, as I mentioned yesterday, in the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years, uh, we've come to recognize that the, the, the comfort women um, were, uh, you know, was another war crime uh, and needs to be treated as such and investigated as such. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, at this point, uh, let's turn it over to Jeremy for our question and answer period from the audience. Before we get to that, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Frank, <laughs> Zhao Bing Lee, and Ethan Mark. Please raise your hands high so we can see you and get to you. We'll start with Connie in the back left. I would appreciate your discussion of the occupation of Vietnam and whatever resistance went on there. Thank you. Shall I take that, I guess? Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yeah, we had a panel on that yesterday. Um, so I, I, I would like to, I, I think both of us would probably want to defer to the experts from, from yesterday on, on, on that big question. Um, but I can say, you know, in terms of basic background, the situation in, in French, what's called French Indochina at the time is quite different from, uh, from the situation in other parts of Southeast Asia because uh, Vichy is an ally of Japan and therefore the Vichy French uh, are left to administer uh, Vietnam, uh, Indochina. Um, for most of the war. And the Japanese are, are very much around. Uh, they're using Indochina for their military strategy and, and for uh, supplies and so on. But they leave the day-to-day -day operations to the French. Um, and it is, uh, you do have the rise of a, of a resistance movement, which uh, was, of course, the, the Viet Minh is very important, um, led by Ho Chi Minh. And yesterday we had really a wonderful uh, presentation which looked in, in detail on, uh, at that relationship between that resistance um, and, the, and the Americans in particular, and they were working together. Um, from March 1945, the, uh, the Japanese take over um, as uh, the situation in Europe uh, and their, their suspicions about, uh, about the French um, uh, of course, because France is now liberated, so they're no longer able to uh, trust the French administrators anymore, so they take over and rule, and, and, and uh, they take over directly. I mentioned in my lecture that there was tr tremendous suffering and famine, uh, also forced labor in, uh, in Indochina, what, what we now know as Vietnam. I, I keep saying Indochina, but it's Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos now. Um, and uh, so we see a very clear uh, resistance, which, which uh, um, is led by, again, by Ho Chi Minh, um, who at that time is viewed as an ally, of course, by the, by the Allied powers. And later, after the war, uh, we know the history, um, the, the very uh, difficult history that, that ensues. There were questions yesterday raised about, you know, could, could some kind of a, a more amicable uh, agreement and understanding be reached? But I I'll leave that to the experts. I just add to that that, uh, the resistance in Vietnam or Indochina at that era was mainly at a political level. Uh, they were still in a preparatory phase for actual military action in, against the Japanese. So in French Indochina, uh, there is no resistance movement like in the Philippines or in the Soviet Union or something like that. Next question is going to be in the center, halfway back, please. In, in looking at the places Japan went after, if, if they had succeeded, what was their end game? What was their goal? How did they envision their empire? L let me uh, address that. I think what you really have to understand, uh, uh, one of the earlier panel today talking about what I think is the most incredibly dysfunctional political and military decision-making organization during World War II, which was Imperial Japan. But if you were looking at the situation as the Japanese did between 39 and 40 or even earlier than that, remember that that was that long run in which the Axis powers appeared to be triumphant wherever they went, no matter what the circumstances. They signed on with Nazi Germany in Italy. And from their perspective, well into 1941, uh, it looked like they'd signed up on the winning team. And they were going to basically pick up uh, the crumbs are things that were left over after uh, the Germans had carried the main weight during the war. And in 1941, initially, they thought the Soviet Union would collapse uh, under the uh, German onslaught, and if the Soviet Union collapsed, and then as they expected, the Germans would wheel and knock the UK out of the war, they thought at that point the Americans would be deterred from entering the war. So if you're looking at it from Tokyo in 1941, uh, 
even though, for instance, as we talked about that earlier panel today, like the Imperial Navy does this study, I think it was in 1940, and says they war game the, suppose we move south and we get down to Indonesia and seize the oil. And the study then cranked out, well, even if we do that, we're not going to be able to get it back to Japan in sufficient quantities to support the war. So the whole, I mean, the chief of staff of the Imperial Navy looks at this and says, so the whole thing would be pointless, wouldn't it? You know? So they, they know that, you know, in 1941. But the problem is the Imperial Navy, which really, because it was going to be a maritime war, maritime and air war primarily, they really had the decisive uh, vote on going to war. And we know now from the work of Eri Hoda and other historians that within the Imperial Navy, uh, they were talking among themselves. They were talking to their staff. They were quite candid and said, this, you know, th we're not going to win. But not a single one of those individuals in the important meetings and councils had the moral courage to state flatly that embarking on a southern advance is a disaster. Lack of moral courage more than fanaticism or anything else uh, in the dysfunctional the structure of their uh, decision making. That was really the key, in my view, to how the Japanese blundered into this disastrous war. If I could just add to that, since we're on, on that last question, so thinking of a man in the high tower scenario. Um, so the, suppose the Japanese did win, which it's, it's so far-fetched that I think it's very important to have this, um, you know, to, to have this, this uh, reality check before we even enter into the topic. Um, but the Japanese vision was a self-sufficient economic bloc, and a world indeed divided up into these self-sufficient regions. Um, and the idea would be that you would have a Jap Japan as a metropole that would be doing the industrial production. Um, and the other colonies that were close to Japan were going to be absorbed into a greater Japan. So eventually, Taiwan and Korea were, were going to be, become part of Japan. Um, that's, that's also a reason why the Japanese forced, for example, forced Koreans uh, to speak Japanese, to take Japanese names, because they had a, their plan was to turn them, actually to turn them into Japanese, full of contradictions, because they, they had colonial attitude towards Koreans. So they, every time they, they, they opened up and, and said, well, let's, let's incorporate Korea, there was also pushback. Wait a minute, the Koreans are inferior to us. They can't really be Japanese. So um, there's, you know, at every turn, this is fantasy. Um, but the idea was then you would have this inner, uh, inner empire that would be greater Japan, and then the, the outer areas would be supplying uh, Japan. Um, so Indonesia, Southeast Asian colonies would basically be, instead of all those riches that had gone to Europe and made Europe rich, um, uh, maybe even India, if they were lucky, all of that would now be going to Japan. And in a peacetime scenario, if the Japanese could enforce that and they didn't have to worry about American submarines or anything else, um, you know, that might have been a, a very profitable arrangement for the Japanese. I'm not sure how it would have turned out for everybody else. And I'd be remiss if I didn't plug our friend Gerhard Weinberg's book, Visions of Victory, that talks about the access powers and what their intentions were. Next question is going to be to your left with Connie. Um, I have more of a comment probably than a question. We often, in, in these sessions, talk about the reverberations of the war, mostly in a geopolitical context, you know, the evolution of the Cold War, the end of the colonial empire, that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to share a story related to Indonesia um, that was where the war is clearly still reverberating. 2005, I'm a pediatrician. I have an Indonesian family come into my practice with a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and they come for starting routine well child care, immunizations, et cetera. Six-year-old weighs 120 pounds. Three-year-old weighs 75 pounds. So I start the conversation about how this is problematic. Um, I get mom reasonably on board that the idea that these children actually do need to lose weight, not just stop gaining. As is typical in many, many of my Asian families, grandmother is part of the package. I send them home with an appropriate diet, come back in a month for follow-up, both children have gained eight pounds. <laughs> have a long conversation. Grandmother is feeding them three cans of Pediasure a day. Grandmother, you know, is very eager to teach me that fat babies are healthy babies because of her experiences 
during the war. So I was taking care of children who functionally became casualties of World War II oh. in 2005. Thank you for that. Yeah, the impact is uh, obviously on the, on the wartime generation around the world. Uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, we also have the, the, the hunger winter, it's called, in 44, 45, uh, which I heard from, I um, married into an, a Dutch Indonesian family, so from the, the mother's side, I heard also stories about uh, surviving the hunger winter. So obviously these leave all kinds of, uh, of impacts. My, my mother-in-law never wanted to throw anything away. The fridge would get full of uh, everything you can imagine. Um, and so these, uh, you know, these legacies can last a very long time, indeed. Let me, let me uh, move that uh, in a little bit different direction. Uh, the long reverberation of the war. And one of the places where the reverberations are still very strong is in China, because they have not remotely begun to forget what happened during the uh, War of Resistance. Would you like to talk a little bit about that, Dr. Bingley? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a uh, different memories between uh, China and Taiwan. So uh, in mainland China, uh, uh, the Chinese memorized the war as a uh, uh, humiliation uh, with this uh, as a victim of the powerful countries like Japan. So the Chinese try to, or Chinese government try to use the case to educate it, the next generation or the Chinese youth, we need to build a stronger China. A weak China will be beaten up, will be invaded. That's so-called the century of uh, humiliation. Not now, no more, it's our time so China should be build a stronger country, and uh, it is our turn. So that case of World War II used as the historical lessons for the Chinese use. But the, for the Taiwanese government, mostly look at the sacrifice the Chinese people's made. As we discussed here, China, uh, Taiwan had been one of the Japanese colonies actually during World War II. Not only Korea, you know, Korea sent 200,000 soldiers to join Japanese army in the Pacific. Taiwan sent 50,000 Taiwanese soldiers to Japanese army against American in the Pacific from 41 to 45. So Taiwanese government emphasized the sacrifice of the Chinese people. So we try to avoid another war in East Asia, like the war with Japan. Very good. Next question is up front to your left, please. Thank you for your work and presentation, it was great. I'd like just briefly to comment on what you just said here, because my wife is Chinese from uh, Dongbei, the northeast of China. And first time I met uh, her grandma, she doesn't speak any French or English, and she said to speak to me in Japanese, because uh, it's the only foreign language she knows, and I'm in a tourist business, so it <laughs> makes sense to her. Um, I, l I have to, to, to ask something to Dr. Mark and Dr. Um, Lee Xiaobin. Dr. Mark, I was thinking when you spoke about the issue, the terrible issue of comfort women, um, it's also linked to Japanese culture or cultural values. I remember something like uh, there is a saying in Japanese that uh, there are three needs for uh, your kids when you're a mother to feed them, I think, good sleep and sexual, basically. Um, what do you think is part of that in this um, comfort women issue? And to Dr. Lee, um, I want you to comment also on the, there's nothing comparable to the Holocaust, you know, in Asia, um, but there is a very sensitive topic about uh, the, the experiences conducted by uh, Japanese scientists on uh, civ Chinese civilians. Could you comment on that? Uh, it's also in Dongbei, but anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. 
A very difficult question. Um, I think it's, uh, it's of course, the, the comfort women uh, system is to some extent uh, unique in history um, in terms of the, the level of organization that was involved. Um, and um, a mix also of, of this kind of scientific uh, rationality, this idea that uh, we're going to scientifically sort of prevent uh, venereal diseases, for example, by doing this in an organized way. Um, is that Japanese culture? Um, you know, it, it's, it's a mix of things. The, the Japanese, uh, J Japan historically did have a, a legal prostitution. Um, there, you did not have, uh, to some extent, the kind of inhib inhibitions about prostitution that might have come from in, in, in Christian religion, for example. Um, it's not just unique to Japan in that sense. You have in, in, in East Asia, um, patriarchy has historically been very strong. One of the reasons that the comfort women actually for so long did not want to speak out in Korea was because of the taboo uh, that was attached to, uh, to having served. Um, so very, uh, you know, the, the, the women suffered doubly in that sense because first they, they were victims during the war and then they were victims of the patriarchy in, in Korea as well. And again, patriarchy is a global problem. It's a period, we're talking about the 1930s and 40s, um, where, uh, uh, you know, uh, male, from our contemporary perspective, this was a, a, a male chauvinism was a common theme um, in many places. It's the reason that this issue did not get as much global attention. But certainly it's, it's hard to disconnect it completely from, uh, from that Japanese history as well. Uh, there's uh, two, two answers to your question. The first about the cultural assimilation or Japanese colonization. In Manchuria, I believe that's where your uh, mother-in-law is living from. So, because of the occupation so long, Japan established uh, a puppet Chinese government in China under the leadership of Wang Jingwei as a native government and uh, to uh, support Japan's policy in China. So, the Wang's government began to introduce Japanese language, culture, and offered uh, are the opportunities for the Chinese to study, to learn more about the Japanese. But during the same time, on the front, on the battleground, uh, Japanese army continued the brutal uh, war policy, used uh, excessive power against the Chinese war potential. It's because Japanese army had the problem to identify the Chinese soldiers so in many cases, after they took over one city or town, they willing or able to kill all the servable or uh, able men, uh, doesn't matter the civilian or uh, military. So that created a so-called uh, Holocaust of Asian, including the rape of Nanjing because of the large uh, casualty of the Chinese uh, civilian population. The question now is about, is this the military policy or the individual behavior? So was this from the top, train of command, or just a, a soldier's retaliation after the battle? So it's still ongoing and controversy. Thank you. Next questions in the very far back to your left, gentlemen. So it was interesting to hear about the uh, Japanese training Indonesian to be ready to resist. What effect, if any, did that have on the subsequent war of independence against the Dutch? I guess that one's for me. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, the, uh, huge effect. Um, and not just on the War of Independence, but on post-war uh, Indonesia and, and independent Indonesia as well. Uh, the Japanese at first were skeptical. The Japanese leadership was very nervous um, about arming, arming the natives. Um, so this is, a, again, a kind of a classic colonial pattern. On the one hand, they see advantages to doing so. On the other hand, what happens if the Indonesians rise up against us? Um, so we see for the first half of the occupation, there's a lot of hesitancy about it. Uh, a pilot project is launched in early 1943, which, which uh, by very motivated uh, kind of idealistic Japanese, who, uh, who actually the, the leader of this pilot program is somebody who is uh, a relative, uh, 
somebody who believes in this kind of shared struggle and, and eventually the notion of giving the Indonesians independence eventually if they, if they can earn it. Um, so the, he, he trains some very motivated Indonesian youngsters. This is a success. Um, and the, the, the project is broadened in the, in the context of the Japanese now losing the war in the second half of the occupation. The Japanese decide we're going to make this a large scale operation um, and they, they start to train large, uh, larger groups of men. Um, and so uh, tens of thousands of, of Indonesians end up getting uh, military training. Um, and, um, and by the end of the war, they are going to be used um, uh, the Japanese plan to use them. They probably would have sacrificed them uh, first if they got a chance to do that. Um, but they, uh, for Indonesian nationalists, this is a, this is a big win um, to get the kind of expert Japanese military training. And some of these officers and, and men, by the time the occupation was done, they were, you know, in, they they were very well trained. Particularly that first group of officers who had started in, in early 1943. Um, they, by the end of the occupation, so, uh, some of them were better trained than the Japanese that uh, that they ended up serving under. So. This this created some tension. Um, and, uh, but by the time the Dutch came back, they, uh, they, they ran into um, a very unexpected, um, a very professional Indonesian resistance. Um, so you had these uh, uh, Indonesian youngsters I mentioned yesterday in much larger numbers were motivated to fight against the Dutch. And then you had a, a smaller number that were really expert uh, with military training. Then they had to get the weapons. Um, and that was a whole problem for the, for the Indonesians because the Japanese, after the surrender, uh, they were told not to turn over their weapons to the Indonesians. Some of them did. Some of them, some Indonesians ended up in firefights with Japanese and seized them by force. And, and, uh, and some, in some cases, the, they weren't able to get the weapons. But by the time the Dutch come back, uh, for the first group that comes back is actually the British uh, into Surabaya in November of 1945. And they run into uh, well-armed and very motivated uh, Indonesian uh, nationalists who are uh, not about to allow uh, a Dutch return. Um, and so we end up with the British uh, and a lot of Indian troops, as it happens, in a major firefight in Surabaya. Um, and that group ends up, uh, those, those soldiers who were trained by the Japanese end up in very high, uh, you know, very central position in the Indonesian military. Um, they are important for, uh, for um, Indonesian successes on the battlefields and Indonesian strategy. And even as late as the 1970s, about three quarters of the Indonesian officer corps had originally been trained. Uh, by the Japanese during the war, so that that role was huge. Um, there are some uh, so another another uh, impact is uh, the Indonesian army. Ironically, this is something that I want to work on more um, as I go forward. Um, the Indonesian role in actually overthrowing Sukarno, because a lot of these Indonesians were uh, were anti-communist uh, and were concerned about the left. So there was there were also tensions that evolved to some extent out of that wartime experience of the Japanese uh, pushing the anti-communism um, as a feature of, of uh, the Indonesian military. Um, and that, that creates kind of a whole new picture in the Cold War uh, with kind of ambivalent uh, results. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Richard Frank, Xiao Bing Li, and Dr. Ethan Mark. It's now our break for lunchtime. Um, please feel free to bring your lunches back in. This is a relatively short break of 45 minutes. We will begin our next session at quarter past noon. Quarter past noon. Thank you very much. You know, the, the, the audience that, that see it, um, will learn a lot about the ordinary, everyday Americans that went to war. They set their, their tools down, they set their work down, they raised their hands, and they went to war. You'll learn that through the stories and the letters that, uh, that are shared in Expressions of America. You'll learn about the entertainers. Uh, you'll uh, experience the music of the time, which it lifts your spirits. And it was almost like the entertainers said, well, we're not necessarily going to reflect the darkness that the world is in right now by through music. We are going to try to elevate the world above that darkness through music. This is innovative, it's exciting, and I think it's gonna bring a new generation 
of uh, young Americans into the National World War II Museum. I've had the privilege of traveling with hundreds of World War II veterans and walking uh, the property and, and walking throughout the exhibits with the men and women who served during World War II. Every trip has solidified even more my deep commitment to uh, the World War II Museum. I think it's uh, one of the premier uh, places in New Orleans that everyone who's in New Orleans, visiting New Orleans, should, should see. This is state competition, so the competition is fierce. You have the best of the best in Louisiana competing against each other. Today is Louisiana History Day, and it is the affiliate contest for National History Day, which is a national contest that actually happens to be a history research competition for students in grades 6 through 12. So all the students had to compete at their regional level. Um, there were several regional competitions throughout our state, and then once they uh, competed there, the students who placed moved on to the, the state level, and now they're here to compete for that, and then hopefully they'll move on to the national level. This is the first in-person competition since 2019 because of COVID-19. So this is the first time that students are able to actually do this in person because the last two years were virtual. I think for this particular competition, the variety of projects that they can do um, really does draw them in um, because I have students that have done very contemporary topics to very historical topics. I chose to do individual performance because when it's a tea party, I wanted to include the liveliness and the energy and I wanted to humanize the people and not just put them in a paper. I wanted them to see really the movement of what was going on. When it comes to History Day, being a judge is an exciting opportunity to see budding young students put their historical thinking and research into work. You know, you often hear these comments that kids just aren't interested in history anymore. Well, you come here today, that's not true. There are kids of all ages who are excited about history and want to keep doing this research. History is important because we have to look at history to see how we go about shaping the future. It's, it's not just something that can be put away like social studies. It's, we have to actually develop it and obtain knowledge from it because if I hadn't researched this project, I wouldn't have known anything about these events. And even like I can apply it in my everyday life with how I negotiate and talk to people. I would want to compromise, unlike how they didn't compromise. I want to come to these conclusions. So I think it's very important in building us as people, but also preventing any future bad things such as wars can happen. What I hope my students can take away from this is that they can do it, that they can achieve something like this on their own because they've done all this research on their own. I guided them in the right direction, but they did it on their own. And I think that's really something to be proud of. And also it just gives you, you know, a little bit hope for the future that they are on the right path to helping to make this a better place. It should have been impossible, crossing the world's widest ocean to answer an attack made by a powerful adversary. From island to island to island, we fought through hostile terrain, malnutrition, disease, and at every step, an enemy that just kept coming. It should have been impossible. Find out how millions of Americans pushed past impossible on the road to Tokyo, new at the National World War II Museum. In World War II, the road to Berlin followed many paths. Some marched the sun-scorched deserts of North Africa, while others crawled the sands of Omaha Beach. From the rubble-strewn streets of Italy to the frozen forest of the Ardennes, each soldier, sailor, and airman's journey was his own. But all were united by a common cause, victory. Follow in their footsteps on the road to Berlin, new at the National World War II Museum.
The American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum in New Orleans have partnered together to help educators better learn the stories of the American experience of the war in Europe. Join us for a four-week online teacher professional development course that will explore critical campaigns, decisions, events, and about those who served in the European theater through the lens of ABMC's cemeteries and memorials. Beginning with the invasion of Sicily and Italy in 1943, each module will cover the Allied efforts to eliminate fascism from Europe. This course will provide access to noted World War II scholars, museum and ABMC staff members, and virtual resources educators can incorporate into classroom instruction. Employing a rich array of curriculum built upon primary source materials from both the American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum, this free online course will aid teachers in finding new and exciting ways to bring the legacy of World War II to life. My name is Tom Chikansky. I'm the senior curator at the National World War II Museum, and I'm speaking to you today from our vehicle storage facility. I have here with me an M3A1 Scout car. Before Pearl Harbor in the early 1930s, the U.S. Army decided that it needed to start thinking about mechanizing itself. They weren't really sure what to do, where to go, how to do it, but one of the ideas was the armored car. It was popular in many armies, and the United States started to work on that. Congress gave them only limited funding, so each year they might make 100 or so armored cars, test them throughout the year, and then make improvements during the next budget. Eventually, by 1938, they had the M3 and then the M3A1. So this was in production before Pearl Harbor was bombed and was starting to be distributed to units. It was intended as a reconnaissance car. It's a heavy truck, it's armored, half inch and quarter inch armor, and carried three machine guns. Had a normal crew of two with space for six more people. It continued to serve as a reconnaissance car through the beginning of the war, serving especially in North Africa, Sicily, and the beginning of the campaign in Italy. This vehicle was equipped with a six-cylinder straight engine, burned gasoline like most of the vehicles at the time, and had four-wheel drive. In the front, we have an anti-ditching roller. This was designed to help get the front of the vehicle out of a ditch if you had to drive through one to get off a road. By the time of Normandy, it was beginning to be phased out in favor of other armored cars like the M8 Greyhound. Thank you for joining me here today, and I hope you'll tune in again as we feature more vehicles from the museum's collection.
Hi, I'm Don Miller. I'm the lead historian for this trip back to the bomber bases of World War II. Uh, I'm an historian and a writer, author of nine books, one of which is Masters of the Air, the book upon which this tour is based. And we're doing a nine-hour HBO series uh, with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg based on the book. And it's one of the most unforgettable and absorbing stories I've ever heard. It's the story of the Eighth Air Force flying out of England in the first bomber war in history. And they delivered a lot of punishment to Germany. They knocked out 60 industrial cities and disabled the German economy. But they took staggering losses. Uh, 26,000 Eighth Air Force airmen lost their lives in these battles. That's more than Marine Corps lost in all of World War II. Your chances of surviving a mission were one in five. These guys flew in, in freezing skies, unheated planes, perilous missions, almost a thousand of them. And they flew from airfields that were cut right out of farmers' fields. And farmers lived there during the war. And we're going to go back to those fields in England, in East Anglia. It has beautiful cities, but it also has this rolling countryside where the airfields are currently located. And they've been restored lovingly by the Brits who lived there, many of them as kids during the war. So when you go back there, you'll be talking to people who were there when the American flyers just kind of dropped out of the sky like spacemen, gum chewing, smart, you know, mouthing Sinatra lovers, you know, they, they changed the whole culture of East Anglia and these kids adored them. And when you talk to those locals who knew the airmen well as kids, and you stand on the observation tower at Thorpe, Thorpe Abbott with the wind whipping in your face, you will never feel closer to the war. Uh, and we concluded with a spectacular experience at Duxford Air Force Base. We're going to watch an actual, uh, watch a dogfight, a simulated dogfight. We're going to go down to the, uh, the place where they take off, or we'll watch them take off, touch the wings of the plane, shake hands with the pilots, off they go. And the dogfight will take place right over our heads. Then when we go into England, we go to the Imperial War Museum. That's connected to Duxford. Duxford is near Cambridge, of course, with its high spires and the colleges there which also, by the way, has a very moving, powerful cemetery dedicated to the American airmen who died in this conflict. And then we'll go down underneath London to the, the Churchill War Rooms, where Churchill had his map room and his cabinet planned and directed the entire war from there. We'll sit at the chair, the actual chair, not just the table that Churchill sat at, and you get a sense, really, that, again, you're soaking in the war, you're feeling it personally. I've done a lot of trips from the museum, this is unique, and it's, it's my absolute favorite. The towns are gorgeous. Bury St. Edmunds has an abbey. It's got a beautiful cathedral. It's got a great you know, brewery in town. It's got a beautiful square. We'll be staying at five-star hotels wherever we go. If you sign up for a tour like this, you'll be signing up for an experience unlike any you've ever had before. And it combines the personal with historical and, uh, and intertwines them. Here this morning, I warmly welcome you all to this pride of our nation monument. And this monument was erected in memory of those Solomon Islanders who had served with U.S. Marines during the Second World War, and also in memory for the Islanders to see and to think about the importance of the role, the courage, the loyalty, and the sacrifice of the Islanders who had served during the Second World War. Welcome to the Unity Square here at Point Bruce in the heart of the nation's capital, Honiara. We have this biggest flag in the country standing at a back, surrounded by nine small flagpoles, which represents the nine provinces that form part of the nation. Welcome this morning to the Guadalcanal American War Memorial up here at the Skyland on Hill 73, as numbered by the American Army after the war. And the purpose of erecting this war memorial is in the honor of those U.S. servicemen who had fought during the Guadalcanal campaign and lost their lives for the liberation of the Solomons. This site was also selected for this memorial because of this spectacular site. You can see from here out to Tulagi, where it's another landing site of the American Marines on the 7th of August 1942, 
and also on Guadalcanal at Red Beach, also on the same date, 7th of August 1942. In addition to this, you can see within this memorial, there are five pillars that records the history of each battle that took place around these areas and also records seven sea battles that also uh, took place during the Guadalcanal campaign. Blood Ridge is a mile south of Henderson Field and why it is so important uh, in the history of the Battle of Guadalcanal is that it was the battle up here that fully determined the turning point of the Pacific War. Because the Japanese forces were in retaliation to take back their airfield which they had constructed. The American Marines took over the airfield just a day after they landed at Red Beach and also after they landed at Tulagi. On the 12th to the 13th and 14th of September was the, the dates of the battle that ranged these ridges. But it was on the, on the 13th, on the night on the 13th, that the Japanese actually attacked right on top of this ridge where we are standing. Right here is where the first defense line of the Marine Raiders and uh, the Japanese fought so strongly during the night and they broke through the, the first defense line and the Marines had to retreat back on that ridge, which is a hill number two, and they have to rebuild their defense line, the second defense line on that ridge. They broke through the second uh, American lines and the Marines had to retreat further down to hill number three which is right beyond this valley, and they built a, their third defense line on hill number three. And it was on hill number three that the Americans have held back the Japanese uh, who tried their very best to capture the, the airfield on that early morning of the day on the 14th. The determining battle took place, and the Americans managed to push back the Japanese uh, from going through hill number three to capture Henderson Airfield. On this ridge, we have two memorials. The first one we are just standing cl very close to is the Japanese memorial. It was erected here because of the, the broke through the Japanese forces uh, made during that first uh, battle on the 13th of uh, September. And uh, the memorial at hill number three uh, was dedicated in the memory of the first marine raiders. On the 7th of August 2017, a ceremony was held up on this ridge, and during the ceremony, it was declared by the government and the people of Solomon Islands to the marine raiders to develop this ridge into a World Heritage Park. This 10-inch figuring are made by the World War II Museum in New Orleans, together with the Solomon Scouts and Coast Waters Trust Board in Solomon Islands, for the purpose of being souvenir for those veterans overseas and families who will be visiting Guadalcanal in Solomon Islands. We are now standing in the War Memorial Garden up here at Henderson Field. This garden was initiated by the U.S. Consular, Kitty Saunders, who was also the geology for the soil and viral purification. At the bottom of each tree, we do have plaques in commemoration of those sailors, marines, airmen, soldiers who fought and died on Guadalcanal. The garden is still open for those families and relatives who may wish to sponsor each tree in commemoration for their dear ones who fought and also died on Guadalcanal. My name is Alexandra Ritchie, and I'll be your lead historian 
for the rise and fall of Hitler's Germany. This is one of the latest tours that's been put on by the National World War II Museum. And it's a fantastic journey through the history of the Second World War, but is seen as from the perspective of Germany and Poland. We start our journey in the city of Berlin, where Hitler came to power and where he really took power. Berlin was really Hitler's nerve center from which he controlled the entire Third Reich. And we go to the places where he seized power. We go to the Brandenburg Gate. We see the massive torchlight parade. We go to the scene of the Reichstag fire, which gave him the powers of the Enabling Act to take people's rights away. We go to the book burning scene where the where Goebbels burned books. Uh, and we, we also go to the Olympic Stadium, where Hitler staged the 1936 Games. We also go to darker places, to the Villa at Wannsee, where Reinhard Heydrich finalized the mass murder of the European Jews in the final solution. And we also end up in Potsdam, where the famous 1945 conference took place, which registered the borders for post-war Europe. From Berlin, we journey south and head toward the city of Wrocław, site of the very famous siege of Breslau in 1945. We then follow General von Rundstedt's footsteps as he prepared for the invasion of Poland in 1939. And we go to Zagan, where the famous camp Stalag Luft III was, where Allied prisoners of war were kept, and of course was made famous by the film The Great Escape. We next journey to the beautiful city of Krakow, which was very little destroyed during the war, but of course it also has a World War II history. This was the place, for example, where Hans Frank set himself up, half-jokingly as the king of Poland in the Wawel Castle, and took for his own personal property and Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine, which he put in his bedroom. We also go to the once thriving Jewish quarter in Kashmir, some of which still remains. See a restored synagogue and some of the places that still exist, the old houses and so on. But the next day, we make the tragic journey to Auschwitz and Auschwitz-Birkenau, where so many hundreds of thousands of Polish Jews and Jews from all over Europe perished. From Krakow, we go up to Gdansk. We stay in the Grand Hotel Sopot, where Hitler, Ribbentrop, Goebbels, Goering, and many other top Nazis came to stay or visited during the invasion of Poland. We go to Westerplatte, where the first shots of the war were fired. And we go into the beautiful city of Gdansk, which has now been renovated, but which was very badly destroyed at the end of the Second World War. We journey from Gdansk down toward the Wolfschanze, Hitler's headquarters in what used to be East Prussia. This is the place from which the Wehrmacht and Hitler and the top brass really defended the Third Reich and attacked the Soviet Union. This is a very terrifying place. One really starts to get a hint of Hitler's madness by looking at these massive bunkers. And he lived there for over 800 days during the Second World War. This was also the site of Stauffenberg's attempted assassination of Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944. We end our journey in Warsaw. The first evening we go to the Warsaw Uprising Museum, where we meet Polish veterans from the Second World War who fought both in the uprising, but also in places like Monte Cassino and in Holland. We then have our final evening at a Polish dwar, a Polish manor house, which was taken over during the war by Herbert Gila, who was the most highly decorated Waffen-SS general in the Second World War. He made it his headquarters during the Warsaw Uprising and the fighting on the Eastern Front in August, September 1944. This is a very personal journey. Of course, we look at some very difficult and tragic aspects of the past, but we also have a lot of fun on the way. The hotels are fantastic, the food is magnificent, and it really is up to the standards you've come to expect from a luxury tour from the National World War II Museum. So please come and join me at, a, I think, what I think is a historical journey of a lifetime through World War II history in Central Europe, the rise and fall of Hitler's Germany. We had to create another tour in, in Germany and Poland because there's just simply so much history. You know, this is really where uh, the Second World War, when it comes to Hitler and the battle with the East, really takes place. And so with uh, the Megastructures tour, we were focusing on a slightly different angle from the rise and fall of Hitler's Germany, which is to look at the consequences for the people who actually were enslaved under this regime. We look at things like uh, the creation, these massive bunkers, uh, um, Hitler's prora, this, this massive, huge concrete um, 
sort of hotel that he built for, for his workers. But he also, um, we also look at Pinamunda and the importance of the V1 and V2 rocket program and the whole history of Werner von Braun, who of course later comes to head NASA in the United States, throwing up all sorts of moral questions about what did you do with the Third Reich after it had fallen apart. But of course Werner von Braun knew about the massive slave laborers that were um, used in places like Nordhausen to build these rockets. And so it's a very complex, interesting tour which looks at a different aspect of Hitler's Germany. We return to Warsaw, so for those people who've been on the Rise and Fall tour already, we do have a different program for Warsaw. We're going to places like Paviak Prison, which was the notorious Gestapo and SS prison in the center of Warsaw. We're also going to go to Treblinka, which in my view was really the most deadly of all the extermination camps, where over 850,000 human beings lost their lives. And it's an incredibly sobering and tragic place, but it's also a very important place to visit. And again, we end up with a dinner uh, at my manor house just outside of Warsaw to celebrate uh, what we, this journey that we've all been on together. I'm here with David Morgan from Kualoa Ranch. David, can you tell us a little bit more about the ranch? Sure, it's uh, been around for quite a while. I'm the sixth generation of my family here. Uh, it was originally started by my great-great-great-grandfather in uh, 1850. And it's been a cattle ranch for pretty much all that time. This might be the most beautiful cattle ranch I've ever seen. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. And so as the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor approaches us, we have heard that you have a personal connection to December 7th. Yes, uh, 1941, my dad had uh, graduated from college the uh, June before. And uh, so he had moved home and he just started working for a company in downtown Honolulu. And he was living in the house where he grew up, which was in downtown. And on December 7th, that morning, he and his brother had decided that they wanted to come out to the ranch here, but they didn't have uh, much gasoline in their car. Yeah. And so they were driving around downtown Honolulu trying to find a, a gasoline station that was open. And uh, while they're driving around, they noticed that there was a whole bunch of airplanes flying around up in the sky and then little puffs of black smoke. And uh, they thought that was very curious because leading up to that day, there had been a lot of uh, practice with anti-aircraft guns right. that was going on. And when they do that, they would send an airplane up with a target that was, that was being towed. And then the guys on the ground would shoot their guns at the target. But when the shells exploded, there would be little puffs of white smoke in the air. And this is now puffs of black smoke instead hmm. of white smoke. And so they're curious, looking up and thinking, what, what, what's going on here? And they saw an airplane get hit and go down. And their initial reaction, it still hadn't dawned on them what was happening yet. Their initial reaction is, holy cow, somebody's going to be in big trouble. They're not supposed to shoot these airplanes down. And uh, just a little bit after they, they experienced that, there was an explosion on the ground somewhere nearby them. And in retrospect, uh, they found out that what was happening is the guys that are shooting the anti-aircraft guns were occasionally getting so excited that they would set, uh, forget to set the timer on the shell. And so the, the shells, instead of blowing up in the air, would arc over and come down and explode on impact in Honolulu. Oh. And so when that happened, they decided oh, something serious is going on here. So they drove up on the slopes of Punchbowl, uh, right above downtown. And they were looking down at uh, Pearl Harbor and seeing all these planes and smoke and everything all over the place. And they think in that retrospect, they might have seen the Arizona blow up because there's all of a sudden a huge explosion with a pillar of fire going way up into the air and all that. And so they realized, okay, this is serious. We better go home. So they got in their car and drove home and they lived on a hilltop right behind uh, uh, upland from Waikiki. And so they, they pulled into their yard and the neighbor uh, came running out and told them, we're under attack, we're under attack. And so being young men at the time, they decided the best course of action would, let's go up on the roof and watch what's that going on. Of course. So they went up on the roof and they're standing on the roof looking down toward Pearl Harbor. And then down Manoa Valley, 
uh, nearby their house, these two airplanes come flying down the valley at treetop level. And when they reach their house, the, the two planes bank a turn to go toward Pearl Harbor. And as they're turning, they can see the red circles on the wings. And then when the, the airplane started to straighten up, the one that was closest to them was close enough that they could see into the cockpit and see the, the pilot's uh, face. Wow. And while they're looking at him, they saw the pilot turn and look back at them and waved, and then he flew off. You know, the, the, the audience that, that see it um, will learn a lot about the ordinary, everyday Americans that went to war. They set their, their tools down, they set their work down, they raised their hands, and they went to war. You'll learn that through the stories and the letters that, uh, that are shared in Expressions of America. You'll learn about the entertainers. Uh, you'll uh, experience the music of the time, which it lifts your spirits. And it was almost like the entertainers said, well, we're not necessarily going to reflect the darkness that the world is in right now by through music. We are going to try to elevate the world above that darkness through music. This is innovative, it's exciting. And I think it's going to bring a new generation of uh, young Americans into the National World War II Museum. I've had the privilege of traveling with hundreds of World War II veterans and walking uh, the property and, and walking throughout the exhibits with the men and women who served during World War II. Every trip has solidified even more my deep commitment to the World War II Museum. I think it's uh, one of the premier uh, places in New Orleans that everyone who's in New Orleans, visiting New Orleans, should, should see. This is state competition, so the competition is fierce. You have the best of the best in Louisiana competing against each other. Today is Louisiana History Day, and it is the affiliate contest for National History Day, which is a national contest that actually happens to be a history research competition for students in grades 6 through 12. So all the students had to compete at their regional level. Um, there were several regional competitions throughout our state, and then once they uh, competed there, the students who placed moved on to the, the state level, and now they're here to compete for that, and then hopefully they'll move on to the national level. This is the first in-person competition since 2019 because of COVID-19. So this is the first time that students are able to actually do this in person because the last two years were virtual. I think for this particular competition, the variety of projects that they can do um, really does draw them in um, because I have students that have done very contemporary topics to very historical topics. I chose to do individual performance because when it's a tea party, I wanted to include the liveliness and the energy and I wanted to humanize the people and not just put them in a paper. I wanted them to see really the movement of what was going on. When it comes to History Day, being a judge is an exciting opportunity to see budding young students put their historical thinking and research into work. You know, you often hear these comments that kids just aren't interested in history anymore. Well, you come here today, that's not true. There are kids of all ages who are excited about history and want to keep doing this research. History is important because we have to look at history to see how we go about shaping the future. It's, it's not just something that can be put away like social studies. It's, we have to actually develop it and obtain knowledge from it because if I hadn't researched this project, I wouldn't have known anything about these events. And even like I can apply it in my everyday life with how I negotiate and talk to people. I would want to compromise, unlike how they didn't compromise. I want to come to these conclusions. So I think it's very important 
and building us as people, but also preventing any future bad things such as wars from happening. What I hope my students can take away from this is that they can do it, that they can achieve something like this on their own, because they've done all this research on their own. I guided them in the right direction, but they did it on their own. And I think that's really something to be proud of. And also, it just gives you, you know, a little bit hope for the future that they are on the right path to helping to make this a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please make your way back to the Arcadia Ballroom, find your seats and find your cell phones. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you could please find your seats, locate your cell phones and silence them or turn them off so they do not interrupt the, our next session, which will begin momentarily. Thank you. Well, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that lunch and uh, ha hopefully had a chance to get some of those book signed since we compressed the earlier book signing. Uh, but, uh, you know, for those, uh, you know, get comfortable in your seats for this uh, next session, which is a panel on women at war. Now, women, uh, as, as, as we, we may not always realize, but uh, it becomes uh, clear played an important role in resisting fascism and Nazi occupation during the Second World War. In this session, archivist and public historian Elizabeth Hyman discusses how women sacrificed their lives to make the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943 possible, while best-selling author and former journalist and foreign correspondent Lynn Olson provides a new look at French Egyptologist who used her intellect and her determination to save priceless ancient artifacts from Nazi looting. So, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chairing our session today is uh, Jenny Craig Institute's senior historian, Dr. Steph Hinnerschitz. <coughs> Steph joined the museum in 2021. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Maryland and is published widely uh, and is a award-winning author on topics on the US home front during the war and Asian American history. And so uh, with that, Steph, yeah. over to you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And I wanna reiterate how excited I am to be here on this panel. So today we're gonna be hearing from Lynn and Liz on their work on the role of women in resistance movements during World War II and their own fight against fascism. Now, this topic of women in resistance isn't exactly new. Historians have been uncovering the role of women in these networks and these nodes for quite some time. Lynn, in her own work, particularly her 2019 book, Madame Fricade's Secret War, The Secret War of Madame Fricade, which looks at Marie Madeleine Fricade, who was a 31-year-old woman who led an intelligence network that was part of the French resistance. She's really at the forefront of this, and she has been. And Lynn has dedicated her career to writing and analyzing political trends, and she brings that determination and dedication to writing many books on World War II, and especially the role of women in the war. And then Liz, as an archivist, she has a special, what I would call like a special power. <laughs> so you always want an archivist on your side because they can hide things for you and cover <laughs> things up, but also because <laughs> they are really good at uncovering new sources. And so Liz is also at the forefront of a new movement and scholarship to uncover the role of women. And she focuses on young Jewish women 
and how they created and maintained a network of resistance that was part of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. And also as a public historian, Liz is really well situated to bring this story to the public and again use her special powers as an archivist to look for new documents and new resources. The one thing though that I can say is that I'm not quite sure if uncovering is the best word to use because these women, especially the Jewish women in the ghetto, and then also the woman who Lynn will talk about today, so um, Christiane de Roche, who is a, was a leading archeologist at the time, who was responsible for really leading networks to get some of these priceless artifacts out of France and save them from Nazi looting. So both Christiane and the woman that Liz focuses on, when I say uncovering, again, that's not really accurate because these women were well known at the time. They were known among their networks. They were respected for the work they had done. Certainly men recognized and respected the women who they came to know. So it's not really uncovering. Again, they knew that. Historians are discovering more about their roles, but they were certainly no secret. Everyone knew and recognized them at the time. But what we're gonna do in this panel is bring some of these stories to you. And we are going to uncover them in the sense that we're gonna, perhaps you don't really know that much about the topics, but you might not know about this specific woman that we're going to discuss. And I don't think it's out of line to say this is a very male conference. Most of the panels that we've had are male focus. And what we're not trying to do today is just be that women's history panel at this conference. What we're trying to do is to get you to think about how essential women are to understanding World War II history. So with that, I will turn it over to Liz to talk about her research. Thank you, Steph. I'm just gonna head over here. It's hard to do. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is the most famous instance of Jewish resistance to Nazi terror during the Holocaust. It has been depicted in every form of media, from comic books to film, yet one element nearly all fictional artistic and cultural representations of the uprising have in common is that they all depict it as an exclusively male event, commanded by men, organized by men, and fought by men. If women exist in these depictions, they do so as tragic mothers or silent girlfriends. In reality, young Jewish women played a vital role in every aspect of the uprising. Their contributions were such that I feel comfortable saying that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising could not have happened without the bravery, ingenuity, and action of young Polish Jewish women. When I say young Polish Jewish women, I am speaking of members of the generation born between approximately 1914 and 1924. This distinct generation of Jewish youth shared a series of experiences as they came of age in interwar Poland, which uniquely prepared them for their underground work during the war. Interwar Polish Jewish youth, as a result of a clash between traditional Eastern European Jewish ways of life, the modernizing trends of the 1920s and 30s, and systemic anti-Semitism at all levels of the Polish state were an extraordinarily ambitious, politicized and independent generation. They looked away from the home and traditional centers of Jewish authority for guidance and structure and found them instead in Jewish political and ideological youth groups, a common feature of European politics in this period. These youth movements commanded their members utmost loyalty. They taught Jewish youth how to act collectively and how to fight for the vision of Jewish life in Poland they wanted to see without waiting for the guidance or permission of their elders. Unlike the older generations, they weren't afraid to practice confrontational politics, and they didn't hesitate to demand their rights as Jews from the generally hostile Poles. That said, the older generation did have some influence and control over these young people's education and socializations. Jewish law prescribed that only Jewish boys were required to study Torah. 
In Eastern European Jewish society, this exemption led Jewish families to provide their sons with a private religious education while sending their daughters to public school. There, Jewish girls were introduced to Polish secular culture, language, and customs. They learned to speak Polish without the easily detectable Yiddish inflection of most Jewish speakers, and gained both Gentile social contacts and a level of comfort in Polish society that Jewish boys did not have access to. Eastern European Jewish gender roles dictated that after completing his religious education, Jewish men were supposed to dedicate their lives to religious study, while their wives went out into the world to earn a living. While this was a cultural ideal as opposed to a reality, the existence of this ideal legitimized Jewish women's presence in the world of business and commerce. These wage-earning women, in turn, raised their daughters to be assertive breadwinners. Therefore, the ambitious, independent, and self-directed Jewish women and girls who came of age in the interwar period were both comfortable in Gentile Polish society and were socialized to fit the ideal of the strong, savvy, capable Jewish woman. When catastrophe struck the Jews of Poland in 1939, these young women became the backbone of the organized Jewish resistance. Nazi Germany and the USSR invaded and partitioned Poland in September 1939. In doing so, they threw the youth groups into disarray, cutting their communications with the outside world. To rebuild communication networks, a series of volunteer couriers ran letters and other forms of communication between the isolated Jewish communities of Poland, navigating two distinct occupation authorities as they went. Most of these couriers were Jewish women and girls, some as young as 15. The Nazis began to ghettoize Polish Jewry in 1940. The Jewish population of Warsaw, at approximately 400,000 people, was sealed inside the Warsaw Ghetto in November 1940. The Germans extended this ghettoization policy to Eastern Poland and Lithuania upon its June 1941 invasion of the USSR. Within the ghettos, and specifically the Warsaw Ghetto, a patchwork of undergrounds emerged as each youth group organized its own system of covert activity, typically centered on, non, sorry, typically centered on education, culture, publications, and mutual aid. Now sealed within the ghetto, the youth groups continued to rely on female couriers for contact with the outside world. In this period, the couriers transported not only letters, but money, illegal literature, forged documents, and rumors of mass executions of Jews. They only had their false identity cards and travel permits, Aryan passing looks, wits, and genitalia, which could not betray their Jewish identity, to shield them from detection as they dodged Nazi inspections and patrols. Any sign of fear, any waiver of confidence could mean death. Out oh, and beside me, you'll see one such false document. These are the false papers of a woman known to us as Vlad Kamid. She's written heavily about her experiences during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And as a courier, I encourage you to look her up and look deeper into her after this uh, session concludes. <clears throat> in light of the courage it took to conduct this work and the role they played in connecting their communities to the outside world, these women's comrades and organizations hailed them as heroes and bringers of hope. Jewish resistance leader Mordechai Tenenbaum wrote the following of Tema Schneiderman, a courageous courier and his girlfriend. Over 20 times, she crossed borders that separated different parts of Poland. Tima visited every ghetto, knew Jewish life and troubles in every town and city. She was a living treasure of information. She brought messages from the movement to every area. Even Poles and Germans could not reach every part of Poland as she did. And when she came, there was such joy. Ruszka Korzak, based in Vilna, wrote the following of courier Tosia Altman. Tosia came. It was like a blessing of freedom. Just the information that she came, it spread among the people. That we have Tosia visiting us from Warsaw, as if there was no ghetto, as if there were no Germans, as if there was no death around, as if we were not in this terrible war, a beam of love, a beam of light. 
After the Nazis realized that a quick victory upon their 1941 invasion of the USSR was not to come, they transitioned from a policy of ethnic cleansing of their unwanted Jews to one of genocide, using death camps and poison gas. In the Warsaw Ghetto, this process began in the summer of 1942. Through a combination of terror, disinformation campaigns, and a reliance on the Jewish insist instinct to cooperate with authorities, between July 22nd and September 10th, 1942, the Nazis deported approximately 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to their deaths at the Treblinka death camp. It was only after the deportations when none of the 55 to 65,000 Jews remaining in the Warsaw Ghetto could deny the truth of Nazi intentions that a true united Jewish underground could emerge. And in early October 1942, the Jewish Fighting Organization, or ZOB after its Polish initials, was formed. The youth groups were a vital part of this process and retained their structures under the umbrella of the ZOB as planning for an armed uprising began in earnest. This is when the mission of the couriers turned from information gathering to arms acquisition and rescue. To complete both of these tasks, the couriers had to commit to a dangerous underground life on the Aryan side of Warsaw. As they smuggled Jewish children out of the ghetto before the uprising, the couriers were responsible for finding safe accommodations, securing false documents, and managing their care. Each of these tasks was enormously time-consuming, complicated, and risky, and the arrangements could fall apart at any moment as a neighbor or landlord grew suspicious. While making these arrangements, the couriers also had to focus on acquiring guns, explosives, and ammunitions, and smuggling them past the German guards into the ghetto. They slept with chemical explosives and instructions for the manufacture of homemade bombs beneath their pillows, and smuggled dynamite into the ghetto through labyrinthine factory passageways. In her memoir, They Are Still With Me, courier and arms smuggler Havka Fulman Raban wrote of one such mission. For a short while, I lived in the same room with Tama Schneiderman. Under the bed was a suitcase containing pistols and grenades. Tama and I brought the grenades to the ghetto. Each of the girls hid a grenade in her most intimate place, her undergarments. From a suburb of the city, we took a streetcar in the direction of the ghetto. I recall our odd behavior during the ride. Tima stood at my side and asked, what would happen if a gentleman invited us to sit beside him? We broke into laughter, hiding our fear in this way. ZOB commander Yitzhak Antek Zuckerman wrote that he would never forget the celebration which took place in honor of courier Frumka Plotnitska when she smuggled the ZOB's first weapons into the Warsaw ghetto. She'd done it by placing the weapons in a basket of potatoes. When she was stopped by a German policeman, he put his hand into the basket and groped around, but did not notice anything amiss. Stories like these proliferate through the diaries, memoirs, autobiographies, and testimonies of surviving members of the ZOB. Male and female resistance leaders alike made it very clear in their post-war writings that no uprising could have happened without the couriers. Indeed, Sivia Lubetkin, the highest-ranking woman in the ZOB, wrote in her memoir that, one cannot possibly describe this work of organizing the Jewish resistance or the uprising itself without mentioning the roles of these valiant women. Many couriers were discovered over the course of their missions. Most were tortured and murdered upon their capture. A courier named Chasia began her underground work in a group of 23 women, and only five of that group survived. When the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began on April 19, 1943, women were vital in all theaters of the uprising. They were sharpshooters, reconnaissance officers, fighters, and commanders. Tosia Altman was charged with using one of the few working telephones in the ghetto to relay information to commanders on the Aryan side while courier Vlad Kamid was ordered to remain on the Aryan side and continue her rescue work. Zivia Lubetkin, upon the destruction of the main command bunker and the murder of the highest ranking commanders of the uprising, led survivors out of the ghetto through the sewers to the Aryan side of the city, holding her gun aloft over her head the entire time. Much later, after the war, Zivia testified in the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann. 
What I've spoken about today barely scratches the surface of the full extent of these women's actions, and there is so much more to say about each and every one of them. I hope, however, that this has provided you all with a good introduction. Thank you. So I will turn it over to Lynn, talk about her work. Thank you, uh, Steph. It's really wonderful to be back at the World War II Museum. I consider this my second home. Um, and I haven't been here for several years, so it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be with you all. I'd like to start by taking you back to 19, November 1940. General Charles de Gaulle is in London the only French official willing to abandon his homeland to continue the fight against Hitler. It's still early days in the war, but it does not look good for Britain, which is, as you know, the only allied country at that time still fighting the Germans. De Gaulle, though, is optimistic. He decides to create what he will call the Companions of Liberation, an elite group of those that he and his Free French movement considered to be heroes in the struggle to free France in World War II. Those named to this group will include members of the French military and civilians fighting in the resistance at home. By the end of the war, only 1,038 people will be considered worthy of this honor. Of that number, 1,038 1,032 were men. There were six women. So what's the con conclusion to be drawn here? That French women played almost no role in the resistance? Of course, that's ridiculous. Tens of thousands of French women risked and in many cases lost their lives by defying the Germans. They played a crucial role as resistance members, not only in France, but in virtually every other occupied country of Europe. Indeed, one US intelligence officer called women the lifeblood of the resistance. They acted as couriers, collected intelligence, transported arms, escorted allied pilots caught behind enemy lines to safety, hid other resistance members in their homes, and even led armed bands of resistance fighters against German targets. The largest escape network in Western Europe, called the Comet Line, was created and run by a young Belgian woman named Didi de Jong. As was true of other escape lines throughout Europe, the majority of Comet Line workers were women. Let me tell you a little more about what it was like to work for an escape line. It was by far the most dangerous form of resistance work in occupied Europe. The most perilous job of all in an escape line was handled mostly by young women, many of them still in their teens, like the ones Liz talked about, who escorted stranded Allied pilots and other troops hundreds of miles across enemy territory to neutral Spain and safety. Unlike resistance fighters who were in hiding much, if not most of the time, these young women did their work out in the open riding on trains and other forms of public transportation with foreigners whose appearance and actions were often uh, so unlike everyone else around them. Didi de Jong, as it turned out, was one of the boldest, most important resistance heroes of the war, whether male or female. Another was a young woman named Marie Madeleine Forcad, who, as Steph pointed out, at the age of 31, became the leader of the largest and most important allied intelligence network in occupied France. The only woman to, he to head a major French resistance organization, Marie Madeleine was in charge of some 3,000 spies who infiltrated every major port and sizable town in the country. I first became aware of her while I was doing research uh, on the resistance in France for an earlier book of mine called Last Hope Island. I couldn't believe it when I found only scattered references to her in the books and other material I was consulting. It was clear she was a really major figure in the resistance, 
but there was very little written about her. Certainly there was no English language book about her. So I decided to write it myself, and that was Madame Foucault's Secret War, which was published three years ago. Was Marie Manlin added to the list of de Gaulle's uh, organization of heroes? No. The only woman who had actually been a chef de resistance and whose network's intelligence achievements were unparalleled was not judged worthy of the honor. The same was true of the woman who is the main character in my latest book, Empress of the Nile, which will be published in February. Her name is Christiane de roche Novocorp. She was a French archeologist, a trailblazing female version of Indiana Jones, who led what seemed to be a hopeless campaign in the 1960s to save several ancient temples in Egypt from being destroyed. That, that crusade, as it turned out, led to the most important archeological rescue in history and the greatest example of international cultural cooperation the world has ever known. But before she did that, Christiane was a member of the first organized resistance network in Nazi-occupied France. It was called the Museum of Man Network, named after its Paris headquarters, the Museum of Man, which is France's main anthropology museum. This was an unlikely collection of rebels. Most of them were scholars like Christiane, who was at that time acting chief curator of Egyptian antiquities at the Louvre. They were anthropologists, archeologists, art historians, museum curators and directors, linguists, writers, and librarians. In the summer of 1940, at a time when almost nobody in France was resisting yet, this relative handful of intellectuals joined together to revolt against the Germans and France's collaborations government in Vichy. Another striking feature of the Museum of Man Network was the major role that women played in its creation. That was very different from most of the later French resistance groups, which were dominated by men and in which women were relegated to supporting roles. Here again, neither Christine Christiane de roche Novocor nor any of the other women who were, were responsible for creating this network were included in de Gaulle's list of heroes. So the obvious question is why? Why was this true? There are a number of reasons, but the main one was simply because they were women. They didn't fit and don't fit into the traditional historical narrative of the French resistance, namely that all its major figures were men. The omission of these women reflects the sexism that prevailed during the war among de Gaulle, the Free French, and most resistance leaders. In their view, men fought and women stayed home. In the words of one of France's most noted historians of World War II, discrimination based on a notion of inequality between, between the sexes was as solidly rooted in the resistance as it was everywhere else in France. You have to remember that France was, at that point, a deeply conservative patriarchal society in which women were largely confined to their domestic duties as wives and mothers and still did not have the right to vote. Just think about that. We're talking about the 1940s here, and women in France did not have the right to vote, did not have the right to hold public office, did not have the right to do anything on their own. What these women in the resistance did was not only to stand up to the Germans, but to the mores of their own country, to the idea that women were second-class citizens and did not have a role and a place in this fight. I particularly love the story that I tell in Empress of the Nile about Christiane's arrest by the Gestapo in the town of Moulin in late 1940. She was taken to a large room which was occupied by seven or eight Germans in SS uniforms, several of them leaning back in their chairs, their boots on a desk, smoking cigars. One of them asked her in French if she spoke German. Although she did, she replied, 
Not only do I not speak it, I don't understand a word of it. Right from the start of her interrogation, she said later, I was not willing to be amiable. The Germans refused to believe her claim of being an Egyptologist. To them, she was a spy. In reality, she was both. But she continued to refuse to answer their questions. As the interrogation proceeded, her temper grew shorter and shorter. She'd already had plenty of experience in dealing with arrogant men like these. In the macho, rough-and-tumble world of French archaeology, women were an extreme rarity, and she'd been shunned and harassed since her earliest days in the field. Even at a moment when her life was clearly in danger, this young Egyptologist could not abide the idea of men refusing to take her seriously. At one point, she scolded the Germans for their bad manners, saying, I can't believe how poorly you were raised. Is, it, is this any way to receive a woman with your feet on the table? For a moment, they were speechless. <laughs> then they tried to silence me, she remembered, but I kept going. I couldn't stop cursing at them, and they ended up sending me back to my cell. The next, the next day, they let her go. This kind of feistiness was not unusual for women resistors during the war. But after the war, they didn't brag about it. They didn't say, look at the amazing things I did to win back freedom for my country. In fact, many of them minimized the importance of their achievements. Unlike a number of their male counterparts, they neither demanded credit for their contributions nor asked to be rewarded for them. As the British historian Robert Gilday has noted, after the war, those who had done the least in the resistance often spoke the most, <laughs> while those who had done the most spoke the least. Women, Gilday added, were particularly modest. Even Marie Madeleine Foucault felt obliged to downplay what she had done, describing herself to an interviewer after the war as the wife of an officer the mother of a family, a member of no political party, and a Catholic. As one French writer aptly noted, it was a rather humble and misleading self-description by the only woman to have led a large and important resistance network in France. So what I and Liz and a number of other historians, mainly women, have done over the last few years is to bring Marie Madeleine, Christiane, and so many more of these amazing women out of the shadows to tell their stories and to finally give them the credit they are due. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn and Liz. I have a couple questions that are more directed to you individually, and then a couple that I think bring your work together. My first question is for Liz, but now that I think about it, I think you could also probably jump in, Lynn, as well. And that would be for you, Liz, as an archivist, mm -hmm. again, your special powers as an archivist, <laughs> what, what were some of the sources that you maybe uncovered or that really haven't been looked at that you use for your work? And then I'll ask the same question to Lynn as well. So I'll start with you, Liz. Of course. I first heard about these women in the graduate school seminar. The professor mentioned a woman named Vladka Mead who had smuggled weapons into the Warsaw Ghetto. And I hadn't known about her. I was in my third year of graduate school as a, folk, as a specialist in modern Jewish history. So I was... <coughs> slightly outraged. Um, so I began by reading her memoir, and from then I used my special uh, archivist powers to research much more memoir, uh, oral history, diaries, and testimonies. Um, as Steph also mentioned, I am both a historian and an archivist. I work in the field of modern Jewish history, so I have many friends and colleagues at various archives, museums, universities, who have these women's writings in the collections of uh, their institutions. So I've been able 
to find, locate, and source a lot of diaries that way. Um, a lot of these diaries uh, and testimonies and writings, however, have not been translated into English, which has been an ongoing obstacle in these women and their stories really entering public Holocaust memory outside of Israel and small parts of Eastern Europe. So that is the short version of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just I'll tag Lynn in on this as well. Um, well, my writing about women is, is a fairly recent thing. I mean, I've written nine books, uh, most of them about World War II. And most of them, the earlier books, are really about men, because I was writing about various subjects like the Anglo-American Alliance and uh, um, uh, Poland uh, during World War II. And, and because it's about war, it was about men. I tried to include women as much as I could in these, these books, but you know, the emphasis was, was largely male. Um, and then I, I started changing when I discovered all these references in um, about Marie Madeleine Fricot. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I just was so struck by her and, and what she had done and the fact that nobody had paid any attention to her that for the first time, I decided to write a book about one person. My earlier books were kind of broad panoramic stories about an event involving a lot of different characters. But Marie Madeleine, she just, just, just fascinated me so much that I decided to, uh, to, to, I mean, there, there's, there are a lot of people in this book, but the through line is Marie Madeline. And um, I mean, it was like, I don't know, in a way, coming home. I, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it, I think, writing that book. I mean, I've loved all my books, but I, I enjoyed writing that book uh, more than any of the others. Basically, because, you know, as a writer, it's a lot easier if you have one character that goes all the way through a book. It's a through line that you can, you know, you can, um, you can add, but it, it makes it much easier. But I just was just fascinated by her as a person and what she was able to accomplish. And the same thing with this latest book. I discovered Christiane. Um, I was originally thinking about doing a book about the, um, the network that she was involved in, uh, the, the group of intellectuals. Um, but the more I found out about her, um, the more I thought, oh, this woman, again, has not been written about. Believe it or not, there, was, there is not a French or English book about her. Um, a, a French book has just been published, uh, but um, I, I was just stunned by not only what she did during the war, but m more importantly, what she did after the war, which was, was incredibly important. Um, so again, I had a great time. Uh, doing it because both of these women were such extraordinary characters. Christiane is, was more fun in a way to write about because she is just out there, elbows out, as you could tell from that story. Uh, Marie Madeleine was more, um, she, was in touch, she was a spy master, so she was very secretive. Uh, it was hard to put my finger on Marie Madeleine. Um, I, I, it was, People have asked me if I liked her, and I, it's, it, liking her is not the right word. It's I'm in awe of her. Um, I couldn't imagine doing what she did, and I can't imagine how she do, did what she did. Christiane was, is a different story. I love her. Um, you know, she was just, uh, she wouldn't let anybody tell her what to do, you know, whether it was de Gaulle, whether it was Nasser in Egypt, or Gestapo officers. Um, so I don't know if that answers the mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. but it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I wanted to ask that question because we always have a survey for attendees to fill out. And I did receive an email, I think it was last week, from an attendee who wanted to know more about how historians come to their work. So what inspired them? Where do you get your sources at? How do you, how do you trace a character through a book? And it seems like both of you are doing amazing work in finding new sources, but also reading against the grain. So trying to get a sense of where women fit in a lot of stories that are dominated by men, so you do have to weave through a little bit and kind of pick out and, and pull out something that would be good for your story. So that was a, a question that struck it, Liz, but then I opened it up to, to Lynn, because I think it's important to hear both of you with your sources. So my next question is for Liz, because I do want to make sure I talk about 
this point of your work, because I think mm -hmm. it's really, really important. So like I mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of work that's starting to be done about the role of women in these resistance movements, getting their stories out there, incredibly important. But Liz, what you are also doing is grounding this story in sort of a bigger historical context. Mm -hmm. Both of you are doing that, but Liz, your point about these women are part of a generation mm -hmm. and the generational importance. At this museum, we talk about the greatest generation all the time. And there's a lot of discussion about how accurate is that? You know, what, what does that actually mean? But I think there is something to be said, like you bring up, that these women are young, really young, and they are part of a generation of young Jewish people. So not just young Jewish women, but mm -hmm. teenage Jewish youths in general. So can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of keeping in mind the generational mm -hmm. connection to your women in your work? Yes. Of course, the generation of young Polish Jewish people born between about 1914 and 1924 were extremely unique in Jewish terms and generational terms. Um, that generation's parents had grown up in a Poland that was partitioned between three powers, the Prussian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. After World War I, and the Paris peace process, all of the borders were reshifted and reallocated, and we saw the Second Republic of Poland become an independent power for the first time in over 100 years. So they just had a very different social and political context than their parents. Um, in this new Republic of Poland, while it's an immensely complex topic in and of itself that I hate to generalize, but anti-Semitism was a very strong force in Polish nationalism, and after the, de after the death of uh, Joseph Pilsudski in 1920, I'm sorry, 1935, it grew much, much more intense, heavily influenced by Nazism. So Jewish youth always came, grew up in understanding that there was this hostility between them and the Poles who were their neighbors. There were some exceptions. Uh, many Polish socialists and communists did not necessarily share this anti-Semitism, but it was, a big part of life in Polish society. So Jewish society in Poland was very much forced to be a separatist culture. Jewish society had its own school system, its own cultural institutions, had an incredibly intricate world of warring politics and political parties. And the children, this generation I'm speaking about, found that their parents really had no way to guide them through this new world of independent Poland. They also dealt with the modernizing influences of the 20s and 30s, the new woman, flappers, radio, cinema. So their parents were fairly lost as how to reach their kids and guide them, especially after the Great Depression, as the global economy fell apart and Jews were excluded from the Polish economy. Their parents really lacked the ability to teach their kids how to succeed as adults in the world of late 1930s Poland. So as I mentioned briefly, they very much turned inward to each other and to themselves and joined a wide variety of youth groups, which their parents were not happy about. A lot of the parents would say things like, oh, she's run off to the communists and you know, they'd be writing illegal literature at the kitchen table and fighting with their brothers and sisters about the fine points of Zionism and the Internationale. Um, so it was both a general difference and a difference wrought by geopolitics and long-term forces within Polish society. That's the short version of the answer. It's a great version of the answer. <laughs> I also really like this idea of, of thinking about the greatest generation with your work about. We, we use it here mm -hmm. in the United States, but if you really want to broaden it out, <laughs> Right? We're talking about an entire global generation mm -hmm. of young people who are at the forefront in a lot of ways. And actually, I'm going to, just kind of thinking out loud now, so tag in Lynn as well. With your newest book, which I had the chance to read an advanced copy, and it'll be out in March, and you should definitely, definitely check it out. Um, with, with Christiane, do you see any kind of generational connections with what she is able to do? Is this... Is there something going on at the time with how she is able to get into the position that she has as an archaeologist? Or is this really her kind of driving her own path? Uh, it was her driving force. No, there was no generational. I mean, again, women didn't have the right to vote. I should, I should have said, and I will add this now, you know when women, French women, got the right to vote? 1944. The war was still going on. Do you know why they got the right 
to vote because of women in the resistance, um, the effects of women in the resistance, the contributions of women in the resistance. Uh, Christiane, now, uh, it, you know, she uh, came of age in the 1930s. I mean, she went to the Ecole de Louvre. Uh, she wanted to become an archaeologist, an Egyptologist, and that was just unheard of. In, in, in France, uh, you know, the, the French archaeology in general, uh, until just a few years ago, was very much of a male club, um, and they did not want, archaeologists did not really like to have women around, um, but, but that was particularly true in France. And so it was, it's just her sheer um, willpower, her personality. She grew up in a family in Paris who, and had parents who were incredibly broad-minded, and basically uh, encouraged their two children, Christiane and her brother, um, to, to be who they wanted. Um, and she was clearly bright and uh, outgoing and um, ebullient from the beginning, and her parents didn't try to put her into the mold of a, you know, a well-brought-up, young um, French girl from an upper-middle class. I mean, they allowed her to do whatever she wanted. Um, and, and so she had a rude awakening when she went to school at the Louvre uh, and made it clear that she wanted to be an archaeologist. And uh, her, her professors actually encouraged her, but the young men that she went to school with and who later were her colleagues uh, wanted nothing to do with her. In fact, uh, she won a fellowship to a very elite um, French institution in Cairo, uh, the institution of... of uh, archaeology in, in Cairo, and the male, she was the first woman to win this fellowship, and, and the men uh, 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 mounted a mutiny and said uh, that she could not possibly be part of it because she would die in the field. They refused to have anything to do with her. Um, and meanwhile, she went out basically and became, you know, the premier uh, Egyptologist, uh, much, much more well-known and much more uh, accomplished than they, but she had trouble with men, these colleagues, all her life. Maybe not surprising. Maybe not surprising. <laughs> um, so, Lynn, just to ask you a question, because I think it ties in well with what Liz spoke about. Different, this was a theme yesterday, obviously, our, our whole theme for our symposium was resistance, but thinking about different ways of resistance. Mm -hmm. So. When we heard Liz, we heard some of these great stories about what we might think of as typical acts of resistance, mm -hmm. uh, what, we, what we think of in our, our imagination. Right. But with Christi Christiane and her work with the Museum of Man and that network, uh -huh. could you maybe give us an example of resistance that might not fit in exactly with what we, what right. comes to mind? Yeah. Um, that, that is a problem. I think not only in France, I'm more familiar with uh, the French resistance, because I've written about it more than, than other countries, but the way resistance is defined, I mean, basically, resistance is defined by, um, by combat, by sabotage, by uh, active um, defiance of the Germans, whereas there are all sorts of different kinds of resistance. Uh, women, as I said, who, who hid uh, resistance members in their homes or hid uh, escaped Allied pilots in their homes. That was resistance. Women who provided food uh, to uh, young men um, in the Maquis, in the, in the uh, uh, later on, and in, in, you know, the young men who fled into the mountains and into the, um, you know, the unpopulated areas of France and fought. Um, there, there were all sorts of ways that. Uh, women could and did help. So, you know, I think the, um, the, the figure is like about the estimate of, of active uh, resistance, resistance in France is about 200,000, which is a very, very small number. I think that number is far, far greater because uh, historians have not included these kind of support roles. Um, but these support roles are not you know, they weren't danger free. In fact, if, if these women were caught, and many of them were, um, many of them were sent to concentration camps, a lot were executed. Um, so it, it, the resistance, the French resistance, 
has been defined by men right from the beginning. The, the main culprit, if you will, the culprit is too hard, harsh a word, but is General de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle and his Free French basically defined for history how the resistance was going to be seen. And that um, has still has its effects. Um, it, I think historians are gradually beginning to um, uh, widen that uh, definition, but it, it really had an impact. Just like Winston Churchill, I've written a lot about Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, um, um, I'm gonna be, basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm gonna be great in history because I'm gonna write it. And, and that's what he did. I mean, Winston Churchill's definition of, of Britain's role in World War II has, has held sway, um, um, you know, s since then. I mean, again, a lot of, of writers are, are coming out and, and saying, well, that's not exactly what happened. But um, de Gaulle really had a major impact on how um, the idea of defying the Germans was going to be perceived um, by later generations. Excellent, thank you. So I have one more question for both of you before I turn it over to the audience for Q&A. And that goes back to the point that I brought up at the beginning of our session. What does incorporating your examples, the women you focus on, back into the story of resistance, how might that change our understanding of World War II? I know that's a huge question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> um, for me, I think what it changes is the idea that it wasn't special people. I mean, it wasn't um, you know these these larger than life heroes uh, that won World War II. It was ordinary people, and uh, a lot of those ordinary people were women. You know that it, that's one thing that I've tried to uh, emphasize, especially with uh, the Marie Madeleine Fricod book. Marie Madeleine Fricod never ever ever uh, tried to. Um, she, there was no self aggrandizement about her. She, she didn't want to talk about herself. What she wanted to talk about were those 3,000 people, those spies. Those spies were not trained spies. They were housewives, they were farmers, they were fishermen. Um, you know, they came from every walk of life in France. Um, but their common denominator was they were not gonna let the Germans take away their freedom. They were gonna fight back. They were ordinary people. And I think that's what this story teaches us that ordinary people can do extraordinary things if they stand up and fight together. Excellent. And building on what Lynn said, a lot of which can be applied to the women I'm working on, I'm going to answer this question both in terms of World War II and the Holocaust and the way we remember both. Um, I think within both fields and both forms of memory, there remains an unfortunate idea that Jews went like sheep to the slaughter. Um, that has been challenged in recent years within the historiography, but I think not only what focus on Jewish resistance, but focus on Jewish women within the resistance can do is really demonstrate that these were ordinary people fighting not to be heroes, not to be war heroes, not because they had delusions of grandeur about being soldiers, but because they were people and refused to simply sit down and watch as their people and their communities were destroyed. In fact, you know, a lot of people misunderstand the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and similar movements. They were not fighting to win or because they thought they could beat the Germans. They had no expectation of surviving. They were fighting to assert their humanity as people and as Jews. So I think if these women and the women Lynn has and is writing about can change our understandings of World War II and the Holocaust, it's to understand the role of quote unquote civilians, women's and Jews and to bring them back into this already massive narrative. Excellent, so I wanna thank uh, Lynn and Liz for their presentation. <laughs> Thank you to all three of our panelists. Uh, wonderful conversation. That's why we have Simone on the front cover. If you haven't read about her, please uh, flip through. Before we get to the first question, it's my honor to introduce someone we'll all hear from tomorrow.
and that is our dear friend, uh, Nicole Spangenberg, who served in the French Resistance as a teenager. Nicole, could you please wave or stand? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, questions, please raise your hands. Great, we'll start with someone we recognized yesterday and we'll hear from this afternoon, Tony Krzyzewski. Well, two questions. I understand that uh, one question, that there is after World War II, uh, a book was written about in Jewish in Canada about the role of the women in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, it never was published in English, apparently. Is it true? And the second question is about uh, Christina Skarbek, who was a favorite spy of Winston Churchill, who was active in France most of the time. Could you talk about that a little bit? I'm so sorry. Could you repeat your first question? And the first question was about the apparently book about the role of women in the Warsaw Ghetto, published in Jewish, apparently either in Canada or in Israel after World War II. Okay. And it was never published in English. It should be, probably. Mm. Um, and the second question is about uh, Christina Skarbek, a Polish-Jewish uh, spy in, in France, who was a favorite spy of Winston Churchill. And for the second question, uh, Nicole and Steph will actually talk about that tomorrow. Yes. Are you aware of this, uh, this memoir, this diary in Hebrew, Liz? So, um, Sylvia Lubetkin has a memoir in Hebrew. A lot of the memoir literature is in, also in Polish and Yiddish. The vast majority of the available English versions and editions are translations, and many have not been translated. Um, Dr. Samuel Casso, who wrote Who Will Write Our History, is working on extensive uh, translations of um, Rachel Auerbach's memoirs. She was an incredible figure. She was part of an underground cell in the Warsaw Ghetto of historians who were charged with writing the history of the ghetto as they realized what was going to happen to them. She's an incredibly important figure who also was massively disrespected by her colleagues at Yad Vashem after the war. And unfortunately, her memoirs are only just now being translated. Um, and I encourage you all to look at Dr. Kassav's work, Who Will Write Our History. It's a really fascinating look at a very specific type of underground work in the Warsaw Ghetto. Next question is going to be to your left, ladies. Hi. Okay, so first of all, um, it's just great having this female panel. I mean, I can't tell you how good that feels for me. Um, I just wanted to give... Um, a quote I heard not long ago about the Ukrainian struggle. Um, and it came of all things uh, from Zelensky. Uh, he was being interviewed uh, with his wife by Christiane Annenpour, and it was translated when he, they were asked about the thousands of women fighting in the Ukrainian army. And what he said was, bravery has no gender. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Thank you. Good. We're going to go to the center, to your left, ladies. This is a question for Liz, and I know it's a broad question. I apologize for that. But now, contemporary Poland, mm -hmm. how do they look at the Warsaw Uprising mm -hmm. and also the role of women in it? Okay. That's a very fraught question. Um, in the recent years, there has been Polish nationalist pushback against various ways historians understand that Poles treated Jews and handled Jews during the Holocaust, including um, Jews in the resistance. So when these women are discussed in Poland, which they are, lots of young Polish Jews are very interested in Polish Jewish history in Poland. When they're spoken about these days, it's within the context of pushing back against a Polish movement which very much wants to diminish conversation about roles, the roles of Poles in the Holocaust of Polish Jewry, 
and emphasize the victimization of Poles under Hitler's regime. So the conversation that does exist is extremely small and exists within this very specific contentious political context. I'll also say that in terms of memory work, I mainly look at how Poland remembers the Holocaust in general. In terms of these women, much of that literature would be in Polish journals, which I have not yet explored. Um, that's an excellent question, though. Thank you. Next question is to your left with Connie, please. Uh, Liz, could you talk a little bit about um, how women in the resistance are uh, commemorated or remembered in Israel today? Mm -hmm. Hannah Senesh is the you know, most famous woman resistor, and she's remembered as a poet, a very brave person, mm -hmm. maybe less so as a um, woman. And Israeli society has historically been very liberal in terms of women in government, in the army, mm -hmm. but also is a conservative society, religiously and culturally. So how do those themes all blend together mm -hmm. in Israel today? Sure. First of all, I'm so glad you mentioned Hannah Senesh. She's one of my heroes. I learned about her before I learned about Vladka. She's incredible. Now, this question inevitably ties into issues of Israeli state building and Zionism, and I truly don't want to make any political statements on that uh, situation. But in the immediate post-war years, there was real, real interest by David Ben-Gurion and some of the more centrist Zionist parties in creating a version of Jewish history during the Holocaust, which was very male, very militaristic, very masculine. Now, some women, such as Sivia Lubetkin and her husband Yitzhak Zuckerman, were elevated as heroes within this very militarized vision of a Jewish past. Um, but as time went on, especially within Yad Vashem, as I spoke about, the me Jewish men who had not been in Poland during the Holocaust, these were men who had been in the Jewish community of Palestine before the Israeli state was created in 1948, were very much invested in creating this male militaristic memory of the Holocaust. Um, if you look at actually the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Fighters in Warsaw today, it's all men. Um, this trend began to change in the 70s and 80s. However, Israeli society, uh, as it moves between the left and the right and navigates how it speaks about the Holocaust within its own politics and its own state building projects, the women will be invoked depending on how a politi uh, political shift in Israel wants to remember the Holocaust. That's the very short answer to that question, which, as I'm sure as you can see, to truly answer that, you'd need you know, a very long book to speak about <laughs> Israeli state building, Israeli nationalism, and various Israeli political parties. Thank you. We're going to go to the back to your right, ladies. Thank you, ladies, for an amazing panel. And I have a question specifically for Lynn, and that is, what were de Gaulle's criteria for these six women that he included on his list? And, and was Rose Volant, uh, the curator of the Jeux de Pomme, one of them? Uh, to answer your second question, question first, no, Rose Volant was not one of them. Uh, for those of you who don't know who she was, um, she was she was she was a spy. She was a spy uh, in, at the Jeux de Palme, part of the Louvre, uh, when the Germans uh, started uh, plundering art from Jewish collectors and uh, patron owners um, uh, of art. Uh, she was she was the the woman who was in the Jeux de Palme. Um, documenting what was being stolen and where it was going. She, she, she risked her life. She was doing this under the um, auspices of the Louvre, of, of the head of the Louvre, um, and she was risking her life every day um, to find out where um, all these masterpieces uh, were going. And, and she did, and then at the end of the war, she went to Germany and, and, and personally helped to, to get them back. Um, uh, so she is a great heroine, but she was not on this list. The, the six women who were on the list 
were basically associates of men who were on the list. Um, you know, they were assistants or whatever. There was one actual real uh, leader whose name has just escaped me. But the others were basically either wives or um, had been working with uh, a, a, a resistance leader who was on the list. Next question is to your left in the front row. Thank you. Uh, for, this is a great panel. So t uh, staying with de Gaulle, um, when they liberated Paris that evening, he had, uh, made a proclamation that Paris had been liberated by the French, right. which ignores the contribution of a few other people. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, just a few, just a few, yeah. So, and I, you wonder, it's purely political, trying to rehabilitate, you know, the role of the French military. And I just wonder, when he ignored women in uh, the underground, was he again ignoring uh, people to the favor of rehabilitating uh, the male role, or was he just a chauvinist? Well, you know, I mean, was, he, was it that simple, or was it more of a political uh, thought? And then finally, just how is the role of women in the resistance in France viewed today? Uh, good question, Sal, if I can remember all the, um, the first one about de Gaulle, whether it was a, a political ploy. Um, yeah, I think it was. I mean, de Gaulle did get up and, and that first day back in Paris, and then he continued this, that uh, to the people of France, uh, you were the ones who liberated uh, Paris, you were the ones who liberated France, that most of the French were resistors, which is absolutely not true. Um, but I think he was doing it basically because France was really, as you know, humiliated by the war. They were the only Western government that capitulated uh, to uh, the Germans. They had a, a, a collaborationist government in Vichy. Um, and I think it was to, ha his rationale was to help build up, rebuild national pride uh, in France at the expense of the truth. Um, and unfortunately, his statement, the, the French um, liberated France, um, had really weakened the arguments about how important the resistance was. The resistance was important. It was very important. But the resistance did not liberate France. The resistance helped those military, the, the Allied military who came in to liberate France. Um, but there, there, to this day, there are arguments about how important the, the resistance was. And I think a large part of it stemmed from de Gaulle's, uh, you know, statement that, in fact, it was the French who liberated France, was, which was not true. Um, your second part of your question was about women, and, and was he? In France. Um, the role of resistance, it, it's, it's better. Um, I mean, for example, Marie Madeleine Foucault is, uh, is known to some extent in France, uh, where she wasn't known at all here, um, but it's still, France, you know, I said was a patriarchal country. In many respects, it still is. Uh, it hasn't really changed all that much. So the male, the male uh, outlook is, is still paramount. If you go, if, if any of you have been to Les Invalides, you know, into, they, they have a, a, there's a museum of, of, um, of the order of liberation. I mean, this, this group that I talked about, the, uh, um, Companions of the Liberation. There's a big um, gallery, huge gallery in, in Les Invalides, um, and it's all about men, just all about men. And then finally, if you turn a corner in the way in the back, there is this tiny little exhibit to Marie Madeleine and her alliance network. It's, it's, it's about half the size of this table. Um, and that, that's still how, I think, how, how the French basically view the resistance is still uh, basically dominated by men. I think your second part of your question was whether he was a sexist, or I mean, whether it was, he was just misogynistic or whether there was a reason behind him ignoring women. I think it's, it's basically because he, he felt that um, he was just focused on the men 
who, who were in the military, the men who were leaders of the resistance, and he didn't think at all about the, you know, the role that women play. The next question is gonna to be to your right. Uh, this question is for Lynn. I've read five of your books, love them all. Can you tell us a little about Christiane after the war and her later life? And yeah. Legacy? I promise I'll buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christi I mean, the, the great thing about Christiane is that, you know, the, the first part of her life in the resistance was really interesting. The re rest of her life was, was by far her greatest uh, achievement. Uh, as I said, she was the one... Uh, in, in, in the 1950s, uh, Nasser, the Egyptian president, decided to build a Naswan Dam, a, a huge, huge dam that would flood uh, more than 20 of, of, ancient, of Egypt's most ancient temples, most priceless temples. And she started a campaign that n nobody thought was gonna, gonna work um, to save these temples. Uh, in the end, um, it did save the temples despite Cold War tensions, despite huge problems. So she helped save it. There was another woman who, there were two main characters in this fight, Christiane and another woman by the name of Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, Jackie Kennedy persuaded her husband to provide the funds uh, that ultimately saved the temples. Uh, so that's a great story. But her story doesn't end there. Because of what she did, Nasser uh, allowed uh, the Louvre to ha hold the first exhibition of King Tut's treasures uh, in 1967 under her curation, under her direction. And it was in thanks for what Christiane had done. That exhibition was a huge blockbuster. It was the first one, and it started the whole Tut craze. You know, this is 1967, then, then London did it, then New York did it, and in various other cities, some of you may have even seen um, the exhibition when it was in the 70s. So she was responsible for that. Uh, one of her last things she did, uh, she, she was active as an archaeologist until her 90s. Uh, and one of the last things she did at the Louvre was to um, get the, the mummy of Ramses II, who is the most famous pharaoh in Egyptian history. It was, it was, it was uh, being eaten, al eaten alive. It was being eaten by, uh, by uh, insects, etc. She persuaded uh, Sadat and uh, the, um, the president of Par uh, president of France to bring Ramsey's mummy to Paris and had it irradiated and, and saved it. So I mean, this woman. She didn't, she didn't stop, she didn't give up. She died at the age of 97, and she was still um, you know, working on projects the day she died. And you'll have to come back March 8th when <laughs> Lynn is coming back to give a book talk here. We have a question to your right, ladies. Hi, thank you for this really excellent panel. I was wondering, are there any examples of Asian women in the Asian theater doing any kind of uh, resistance? That is an excellent question. I don't know the, I, I, I know there were, but I don't. I, Our moderator staff is actually best poised to speak to yes. So I, and, <laughs> and I'm just going to say that there's someone in the audience, Desiree, who, I don't know if she's here or not, but she was introduced yesterday at the symposium and she is working on Filipino women oh, who were wow. part of the resistance yeah. in the Philippines. So I, again, I don't know if she's here or not, but she, mentioned before this panel that she was excited for because she is also working on women in the Pacific theater. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> if I may add to that, women in the uh, Asia Pacific theater were also dealing with a violent imperialist power which viewed them as less than human. So I'm gonna guess based on what we know of Europe that these East Asian women were not different. They had the same struggles. They saw the same attacks on their humanity, and they had similar responses. Um, that is a historical conjecture. I'm not speaking based on fact, but based on what we know of people in World War II, I'd say it's quite likely. And I'm sure that Dr. Bing or Dr. Jose or Desiree or Marie would love to have a 
continued conversation. Ladies, the last question is gonna to be to your left in the front row, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, to uh, say something briefly about Holland, the, the, the case of the Netherlands. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Hanni Schaft, mm -hmm. the, the woman with the red hair. I'm not sure how many people have heard of her. Um, but I, was, I find it quite interesting. We, and, and Frank, Anna Frank is, of course, iconic figure that everyone around the world knows. But at least in the Netherlands, uh, the girl with the red hair, Hanni Schaft, is also pretty well known. Um, and my question is about um, uh, actually, the, the political persuasion of women activists. Hani Schaft was also a communist, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering about in your two cases um, in France and in Poland uh, about this intersection between um, um, uh, women participating in the resistance and their and and left wing politics. Obviously, at least the claim is that, that there's also a liberation aspect there too. Although there was a lot of patriarchy in the, mm -hmm. on the left as well as the, the right. And I was wondering also about the, the after the war how that might have influenced narratives and how much attention women got. Because the interesting thing with Hani Skoft is on the one hand. Um, she, in some ways, got uh, she and others who were on, who were communist got got uh, it became kind of an amb more ambivalent in the Cold War uh, because of that communist association. And then on the other hand, um, sometimes they're depoliticized so that we they're remembered as women, but not as not for their politics. So I wanted to ask something about that. Thank you. Do you want to start? Um, I will start. Um, Jewish politics and in interwar Poland were. If Twitter existed back then, it just would have been on every listicle and followed by every Jewish blogger. It was dramatic, it was fractured, it was intense. Within the Zionist movements alone, you had at least six different left-wing socialist Zionist movements by the late 1920s, and at least five different middle-of-the-road general Zionist parties, and they all had their attached youth movements. None of those politics went away in the ghettos as we move into the Holocaust. In fact, um, the Jewish fighting organization couldn't really form before very late in the game because these various Jewish political factions could not see eye to eye. Um, the Bund, which was a very complex movement, but for our purposes, was a form of Polish and Jewish Yiddish-based socialist nationalism they did not want to go to come to the table with Zionists because they perceived Zionists as a very middle-class capitalist bourgeoisie movement. It was only in the face of genocide that they were like, okay, we'll sit down. Likewise, um, these political fact, um, divisions were very much mirrored in the couriers. I'd say the couriers were a bit more common sense oriented than some of the male leaders. And they were more like, this is really bad, you guys. We need to, we need to organize something. Um, we also had a group of very far right-wing Zionists who would identify, would have ident and did identify themselves as fascists, who formed their own break-off organiz organization because they did not want to work under the structure of the rest. A lot of these political divisions are sort of no longer part of the story because this intense world of Jewish intellectualism and politics was destroyed and died out with the few survivors. So that's a very short version of the answer to that question. I think in, in France, certainly, and you're right, in, in Holland, um, the resistance early on, uh, there was a heavy communist uh, contingent in, in most of the Western countries, and they did those those groups did tend to have more women than the others. There's no question, um, and and that, and that they were much more. Um, they weren't just, you know, in supportive roles. They were actually out there fighting. Um, um, it's interesting. Marie Madeleine Foucault actually was a, from the right. From the right, she was, uh, but she was unusual uh, in that regard. Well. Ladies, Steph, Liz, Lynn, thank you very much for a wonderful panel. We will escort the ladies to the book signing station. Please be back at half past, nope, in 30 minutes at 2 o'clock. Thank you. I want to tell you about the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. 
Like no other museum in the world, it brings to life the lessons and values of the war that changed the world. And not just with aircraft and boats and tanks, but with the powerful, personal stories of the men and women who served and sacrificed for our freedom. It's a remarkable place in an extraordinary city that every American should experience. The National World War II Museum in New Orleans. My name is James Matteo, and I had the great honor of portraying Frank Perconti in the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. Cool, man. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for this. This is very nice of you. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'd want my signature. <laughs> <laughs> the World War II Museum, uh, I believe, has done something, uh, you know, really cool because they've given me an opportunity to go out to Europe, trace the the steps of. Uh, of Easy Company, and at the same time, speak to the guest about how the production element works. No, I did not make a run of bail afterwards. No, it was not spaghetti. <laughs> and sort of talk about the locations and how we filmed that, how we shot that, our relationships with this character, some special effects. The jump training, when the directors needed you to jump out of an airplane or a mock airplane, they want to make sure that you represented these men the best po possible way. So when, uh, when there was a chance to jump on this tour with the World War II Museum, I. I just jumped on it, and then knowing that Mr. Brad Freeman, an original Easy Company veteran, was going to be going on the tour as well, I just, you know, it was an opportunity that, uh, that I just could not miss. Uh, and he's a, a World War II hero. You are the boss of today. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's a great honor to, to guess you inside Baston Barak to and it's a special moment every time. We must realize that for a veteran, the war will be never over. These tours are really important because these are the last guys left. You know, I've been on a few of these tours before, and um, when you travel with a veteran, it's a lot different than just traveling alone. Traveling with him has, has been truly one of the greatest experiences of my life, and I'm not exaggerating. So the great thing about these, uh, the World War II Museum tour is you, uh, you get to bond with these people that you're just meeting. And you're on a bus with them, and you're touring through Normandy and the beaches, and you're seeing these incredible landscapes. And then you go into Eindhoven, you're in Holland, and you're seeing the battlefields, and then you're having these wonderful dinners, and you're staying at these beautiful hotels. And, and, and you're really, really bonded. And then you sort of get to Bastogne, and then you have this opportunity to be in the woods with them. And then it all really comes full center. And then you head out to the Zellum Sea and, and, and up to the Eagle's Nest, and you have this beautiful lunch in the Eagle's Nest, <laughs> you know, just looking over the mountains. And then there's this wonderful, beautiful party afterwards where you kind of all come together and you chat about your experience. And, and you, it's a really beautiful bonded element. You almost become your, you know, your band of bus, your band of buses. It's, uh, it's pretty cool to just get to know everybody. Having an actor with us during this tour was an incredible experience because the Band of Brothers series, I've probably seen, I don't know how many times. It was very enlightening. Number one, it was wonderful to get to know James Matteo as a person. I mean, you don't look at him as an actor. You look at him as just part of the group. He is a fantastic person who he is, to me, like the Swiss Army knight for the tour. Well, let me ask you this. How, how do you like having one of the actors who played in the series come on one of these tours with you? In other words, you want to kick me off the bus or keep me on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> or both? <laughs> well, I, I, I enjoy being around you. Well, thank you, sir. For me, personally, they, they all have a, a huge impact on me. But I, I think I'd have to say uh, the Bojack Woods, just walking through those woods uh, with him is a real humbling experience. Uh, yeah, because that's the field 
employees that and, way. Uh, they, they were sitting beside one road, and the other road that we was down was good ways down. Well, I was really trying to find out exactly where I was. Yeah. Foxhole's over here. The line is going to be yeah. right there or right on this side. Now, we could be on that corner right young and look down out of way. It's, it's, I mean, that's so powerful just to be there with him at that moment. You can read all about these things in history books. You can see movies and everything else, but when you're talking to the people that were actually there, it means so much more. Did you know Eugene Jackson? Yeah. He took a five-gallon can of uh, that stuff you fire into a place and that burn you up. Mm -hmm. And he crawled, and these other boys shot over him. He, he waved at them back that way whenever he could shoot in that thing. They said you could hear them Germans hollering everywhere. Mm. <laughs> well, me personally, I think these tours are very important. It's important to go back to America and let my family and friends know how much uh, the French, the Dutch, and the Belgians uh, and the Germans really appreciate what we have done uh, liberating their countries. We have a symbolic gift for you oh and you. Me. It's a copy of the famous Christmas message. And this message has been written by the Colonel of Kino Art and the General McAuliffe during the siege of Bastogne. I thank you for this. It's nothing, sir. It's nothing. It's like that. I have two or three. <laughs> I was there when he gave it Christmas Day. Yeah, how does it, how, how does it feel, all that welcoming attention you're getting from um, all the places that you have fought and, and liberated? Well, it's one way and another. Sometimes it's, it's, it's nice to be that way, but you think of the others that can't be there. When the flag went up at Mount Suribachi, we had no idea what was going on. We were too busy in our own little realm to pay any attention to what anybody else was doing. But it changed the whole attitude of the whole thing. It absolutely did something to us. Over the years, uh, I think we considered Woody part of our family here at the museum. Uh, we, of course, uh, honored Woody and the other surviving World War II Medal of Honor recipients, gosh, uh, 12, 13 years ago now. But he spoke here a number of times. Uh, he was featured in our international conference. Herschel Woody Williams, a Marine who received the Medal of Honor for his historic record at Iwo Jima. He's been with us almost from the beginning. Right up here, you see all of the Medal of Honor recipients of World War II and interactive display on that mezzanine. So the Medal of Honor recipients are very important to us. And uh, he is one of the members of that group whose faces adorn that special exhibit. Seven pillboxes I got that afternoon in four hours. Don't ask me how I did it. I don't have any idea how I did it. And I never got touched. They never got me. You've got a job to do for which you're trained. You've got to do it for the people around you, for the other Marines. And two of them got killed protecting my life. This medal belongs to them. It really doesn't belong to me. We worked together on the Gold Star Families Memorial in Baton Rouge, and I'll always remember driving to Baton Rouge with them that day and visiting with, with Woody and his grandson, and he made a big impression on this museum. He, he gave a lot of his time, effort, and energy to us. He was a great supporter of the museum, um, and I think we felt a real uh, connection to him. I think we considered Woody part of our family here at the museum, and uh, he was on this mission to make sure that there was a Gold Star Families Memorial 
in every state in our country. When you get a call from Woody to ask you to do something, you, you want to say yes, sir, and get it done. So um, we felt that by having a Gold Star Families mural on the side of the original Louisiana Memorial Pavilion um, was a way for us to bring some recognition to the Gold Star families and, and their sacrifice. His passion and his idea has flourished into something that is greater than, than Woody, and I think that was what he wanted when he started that work. And I think if we can take a little bit of Woody and, and his beliefs and, and make that part of the work that we do here every day, uh, we'll be a better museum for it. At the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, there is a new experience as epic, as extraordinary as the conflict it honors, beyond all boundaries. It is an immersive 4D cinematic journey through the war that changed the world, shown exclusively in the museum's one-of-a-kind Victory Theater. I'm proud to have served as executive producer of Beyond All Boundaries, and you can see it exclusively every hour only at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Travel to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans to explore, remember, and reflect on World War II through exclusive access to the museum's campus. The National World War II Museum tells the story of the American experience in the war that changed the world, why it was fought, how it was won, and what it means today, so that all generations will understand the price of freedom and be inspired by what they learn. Be our guest for three nights at the Higgins Hotel and Conference Center on the museum's expansive four-acre campus. Attend a showing of Beyond All Boundaries, a 4D cinematic journey throughout World War II, narrated by Tom Hanks. Gain exclusive early access to the galleries with a private tour guide. Dive deeper during the Out of the Vault tour, a behind-the-scenes, up-close look at museum artifacts not currently on display. Out of the Vault is unique because you get to meet the National World War II Museum curators. We pick out some of the coolest things, and you get to see them up close. Engage with the experts during guided touring in the Road to Berlin and Road to Tokyo galleries in the Campaigns of Courage Pavilion. Go on the last patrol of the USS Tang in the immersive final mission submarine experience in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center. Beyond the galleries, enjoy free time to explore New Orleans on your own. This is definitely worth coming to see, just the museum itself, but having the personal touch of having someone explain things as you're walking through, and then you can go back and see things a little bit more detailed. I would encourage anyone to take any World War II uh, museum tour based on our own experience. First of all, they're extremely well managed. Everything happens on time. Uh, the accommodations, the uh, receptions, and the dinners together are great. Don't hesitate. Come and see this. This is, this is uh, especially as time passes by, uh, people need to, to, to take a look at this history and, and really understand it. And this is, this is their way. I can't think of a better way to do it than this way. Five years ago, this was a vast checkerboard of potato farms on New York's Long Island. Today, a community of 60,000 persons living in 15,000 homes, all built by one firm. This is Levittown, one of the most remarkable housing developments ever conceived. There is no job like it on the face of the earth. In the power which is concentrated here at this desk, and in the responsibility and difficulty of the decisions. made progress in spreading the blessings of American life to all our people. There has been a tremendous awakening of American conscience on the great issues of civil rights. A third world war might dig the grave not only of our communist opponents, 
but also of our own society, our world as well as theirs. Starting atomic war is totally unthinkable for a rational man. I suppose that history will remember my term in office as the years when the Cold War began to overshadow our lives. I have had hardly a day in office that has not been dominated by this all-embracing struggle, this conflict between those who love freedom and those who would lead the world back into slavery and darkness. And always in the background, there has been the atomic bomb. When Franklin Roosevelt died, I thought there must be a million men better qualified than I to take up the presidential task. But the work was mine to do, and I had to do it, and I tried to give it everything that is in me. I'm Rob Wallace, an educator from the National World War II Museum, and I want to tell you about STEM innovation seminars for teachers. These are week-long residencies at our museum in New Orleans and opportunities for you to develop a professional learning network with other science teachers from all across the country. You'll learn with your colleagues how to use sense-making approaches to teaching science. This program is completely free and you'll go home with teacher's guides, books, and techniques to teach science that students need to know while integrating literacy and social studies. I think, uh, you know, the fact that we're talking about um, World War II and we're talking about STEM, that's a wonderful thing. I'm really impressed to learn how history and science connects, how um, all of the activities that we've done so far can make me a better teacher. I really love how the activities that we're doing for science, we're using you know, World War II to bring them alive, and that's a great thing. It's really um, more common to combine science with literally anything else. Um, so it's been um, just incredibly novel to be able to take these, um, these history events and then tie them into projects. You're not just learning and getting all this um, materials and resources, but it allows you to think deeper into how am I going to adapt this to benefit my students. When you interconnect your, your, your curriculum, that's what, when it come, it, it come alive. So that's what I'm gonna take away from this experience. Don't be intimidated. Um, whatever your background is, there is something here for you. If your comfort's in science, that the history is really accessible, it's through that through that lens. If you're more comfortable with the history, um, same same working both ways. Uh, plus, you're gonna love the city. It's a win-win. You get to see a beautiful city, so there is no way you can lose. You know, if you come to a program like this, we have opportunities for educators of all grades who are eager to improve their practice and become part of a learning network of hundreds of teachers facilitated by the National World War II Museum. We'd love to host you and to work together to improve education across the country, one classroom at a time. For more information on how to apply, visit our website. What makes this program unique is the ability for students to study with and engage with two world-class institutions. What we bring to the table at ASU from our academic standpoint is, is just enhanced so much by our partnership with the museum. We have over 10,000 pieces of original testimony. That's just priceless. This is a entirely online platform. We have students from across the country with different connections to World War II. Whatever our students know coming into the program, I want to challenge. I want to make them have a more wholesale understanding of what it meant to not only experience the war on the front lines, but also on the home front. You're going to get history, but you're also going to have an opportunity to look at a lot of cool things like film, music, and oral histories. We're still uncovering all the different layers that are involved in World War II and what that, what that meant and still means. It, it impacts our lives so much today.
My name is Dr. Deborah Prince Zinni, and um, I am the Deputy Laboratory Director here at the DPAA Laboratory. DPAA was established in 2015. However, uh, we have a very long history of our predecessor organizations, such as JPAC, SILHI, and really going back to the laboratory itself has a long history going back to right after all of the wars. Um, a SIL, or Central Identification Laboratory, was established after each one to account for uh, the missing and to try to identify those individuals that sacrifice for our country. So the mission of the DPAA is to provide the fullest possible accounting of our service members from past wars to the family and the nation. We uh, are currently wrapping up as we come up on the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, an identification project that was um, dedicated to identifying remains from um, sailors and Marines from the USS Oklahoma. So this was a very um, long project in the making. Um, so this is um, something that we originally started in 2003 with the first casket associated with the USS Oklahoma um, that we exhumed and did some DNA testing and even just some anthropological methods. We knew um, right then that the remains were highly commingled, meaning that there was more than one person represented uh, but to the extent of commingling really wasn't um, realized until the DNA results came in. And there were over 90 um, individuals represented in that one casket. So if you think about it, there were 429 individuals on, the, on that ship. Um, several of them were, were identified right after the war, within the few years afterwards. So we knew that this project, we needed to have all of the remains here in the laboratory in order to do it properly. And that took a lot of extensive research as well as collaborations with a lot of different agencies. So we worked with the um, with the Navy, we worked with the service casualty offices, um, Veterans Affairs, um, the, the VA, um, the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific where all of the remains were, were in, interred. Um, and it took a long time to get all the permissions and also the, the dental records needed, the family reference samples was a really key piece. And that was working with the families in order for them to, to, to donate their DNA so that we can compare it to the service members that we were trying to identify. For the USS Oklahoma up to now, we've identified um, 353 sets of remains associated with the USS Oklahoma. Uh, we're also working on several other um, ships out of Pearl Harbor, the USS um, California and the West Virginia as well that uh, we've made um, a handful of IDs, so about 15 together with that pro those two projects, as well as um, there's also been the USS Curtis and the Pennsylvania and the Utah that we've made a couple of IDs from. Right now, with the, the number of missing from World War II, it, we're, it's approximately 72,000 that are still missing from World War II, um, which is a really large number. Um, with that, a, a lot of those individuals were lost at sea. So when we look at kind of, you know, that 72,000 number, uh, when we're looking about how many we really think we can recover, because we do have some underwater excavations that we do um, in shallow water. We are doing a few that are in some deep water, um, but a lot of these losses were in very deep water over the ocean. Um, so we're looking probably about half of that number that we think are most likely recoverable from World War II. One of the most rewarding aspects is, I think, just just being able to provide some answers. I know it's been a long time for these families, um, and to to finally get some. I don't think families actually ever get closure, but to get answers, I think, is really important. And to have their loved one home, um, to know where they are, and to have a um, a grave site that they can go to. Um, I think is really important for the families and that, that gives me a very humbling um, feeling and, and just a, a bit of pride that you can can provide that to, to a family. You know, they, they say the, the World War II generation is, is, is the greatest generation of all time. Seeing the sacrifice that these men made, you know, going, you know, to all of these foreign countries that we fought in during World War II. So across the globe. So we have remains from World War II that are all throughout Europe. We have them in, in Asia uh, and also across the, the South Pacific. I mean, they're, they really did go worldwide to, to help fight for the freedoms of not just our nation, but for others as well. And I think that's something that, that really needs to be honored. And, and we have that solemn obligation 
to those families to, to never forget. And I think coming up on this 80th anniversary, I think it's really important for, for people to remember that sacrifice that they made and that it is still very important. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way back into the Arcadia Ballroom, find your seats, find your cell phones, and silence them. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying these sessions. This next one is uh, one that, uh, well, in addition to all the other sessions I'm looking forward to, uh, my, my, my dad was a Marine uh, in the 1st Marine Division in the 1950s, and uh, all the, the heroes from the Second World War that I, I think probably uh, chewed him out as drill sergeants, you know, are larger than life. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that's uh, really shaped my consciousness as well. Now, this next conversation, uh, you know, blends two topics that I'm sure everybody's going to be excited to, to hear more about. You know, the Devil Dogs of uh, K Company, part of the storied 1st Marine Division, landed on Guadalcanal in August 1942. And, of course, Marine Eugene B. Sledge, who penned the, the classic memoir and his experience in the 1st Mardiv uh, in the battles of Peleliu and Okinawa uh, with the old breed. You know, to discuss these topics, we have uh, Saul David, award-winning author of uh, Devil Dogs, King Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, from Guadalcanal 
to the shores of Japan. And also with us is Henry Sledge, Eugene Sledge's son, who himself is an author and consultant. So Saul and Henry, you know, welcome aboard. They, uh, they'll offer some, some great views on the legacy of Eugene Sledge and on the Devil Dogs. Uh, but joining us, uh, I think this is like triple duty today, uh, is uh, Rich Frank uh, once again uh, to spearhead this effort. So with that, Rich, uh, Charlie Mike, thanks. Got it. Uh, question has come up is how is it that I and I alone do three panels? <laughs> I attribute this to my background as originally as a ship guy, and I was always intrigued with the Royal Navy. And my favorite Royal Navy command was, all hands lay aft to witness punishment. <laughs> and that has served me very well in many capacities, including here at the museum. Uh, one of the most solemn obligations of this museum is in our charter, which is to uh, tell the American story of World War II and how the museum has interpreted that based on the work of Steve Ambrose and Nick Mueller is that we tell not only a story from the top down, but from the bottom up and everything in between, as you've seen in our wonderful panels we've had today and yesterday. In this session, we're gonna look at the war of one company of the 1st Marine Division. Uh, this is company K, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. The Marines referred to this as K-3-5. A vital part of our entry portal into this, of course, is what Mike referred to, that classic, some would say the classic American memoir of World War II by Eugene Sledge, uh, the immortal with the old breed at uh, Guadalcanal. And as Mike said, our guides on this, uh, Saul David and, and Henry Sledge. And once again, you've already learned I'm not much into long introductions, but just let me reiterate that uh, Saul is a uh, award-winning, not only author, but he does a lot of production uh, of things. And I can testify from my contact, he's an all-around wonderful guy. Uh, I can say that uh, those of you who are familiar with Saul's work will be delighted that he's here. And those of you who are not familiar with his work will learn why you should be. Now, Henry Sledge is Eugene Sledge's son, which brings an extraordinary, extraordinarily special perspective on what we're doing here today. I would note also his son is in the audience, so we will talk about one generation and we'll have present two generations of the Sledge family today. Henry has brought along a artifact, which is down here in front of the dais, which is the actual pack Eugene Sledge carried in his campaigns in World War II. His name is uh, uh, printed on that, uh, that thing. It's, in my view, that's sort of like having a holy relic here. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the one thing I want to do here is rather than go into any elaborate comment, but I think I have a little very short slideshow. Uh, this is thanks to an exchange between uh, myself and my great friend of the museum, John Parshall, that many of you know. And uh, I talked, we were talking about how do you illustrate the dead. And John came up, okay, <laughs> there we go. John came up with this idea. The base map is Europe. The red outline is the maximum extent of the Battle of the Bulge, which was the greatest campaign, and certainly in terms of American casualties on the European theater. And superimposed over that, you will see the island of Okinawa, and at the southern end of that, the area where the principal fighting took, the overwhelming principal fighting took place, and that's where Eugene Sledge fought. Uh, within that, you will also notice there's a small little uh, notch, which is Iwo Jima, in a, sort of a pinkish color there. Uh, that's about eight square miles. Pelu was about five square miles. Uh, that gives you some reference points in terms of the intensity, or one way to look at the intensity of combat in the uh, Europe, Asia Pacific theater. And finally, uh, John put together some numbers and I elaborated on them. And this, in terms of elaborating on what this really means in terms of real life, you got Tarawa, where you find out the U.S. deaths per square mile uh, measured out to 1,710. Uh, Peleliu, about 307. Uh, Iwo Jima, 875. And Okinawa, about 121. And then you'll see at the far end of the corner how that measured up to the bulge. Uh, Tarawa was 180 times. Peleliu, 32 times. Iwo Jima, 92 times. And Okinawa, 13 times. 
And that's just one way we try to illustrate exactly what uh, happened in those Marine campaigns during World War II. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Saul. Thanks so much, Rich. I'm going to start with a quote, uh, and the quote is... We have it up? Let me get it up. There we go. Just trying to move that forward, sorry. Okay, and the quote is by this man, uh, Sergeant Thurman T.I. Miller. You can see him, of course, on the left as you look at that picture. Um, the quote begins like this. That day on the Matanaka, we beheld all the horrors of war, all the degrees of degradation to which the human race could descend. We were hardened by much training, and our reflexes were sudden. Our minds alert, but now our killing potential was amplified. A second ingredient, hatred, had been added. What kind of warfare was this? So what's the context for that quote? Well, uh, it comes from uh, the 12th of August, 1942, five days into the Guadalcanal campaign. And Miller and his fellows from uh, Company K had just happened upon uh, one of the most gruesome events of the Guadalcanal campaign, and that's the, the fate of the Gurkha patrol. I'm not going to go into the details of the Gurkha patrol. All you need to know is that when Company K found the remains of this patrol, the Japanese hadn't just killed the patrol, they'd butchered it and they'd carved it up and left the body parts on the beach, effectively as a warning to the Marines. Um, I'm going to give you a second quote now, and that's from this man, Jim McHenry. I should have just said, actually, going back to Miller for a second, he uh, was a West Virginian, quite, quite significant part of the story of, the part of, the story of uh, American servicemen, I suppose, in the Second World War and many wars, is that a lot of them came from the Appalachians. They tend to make good fighters there. But he came from a very uh, dirt poor background in Otsego in West Virginia. He was one of 16 siblings, but he turned into, as you will discover, a very effective devil dog. Jim McHenry, very different background. He came from New York. Uh, and Jim McHenry was also on the patrol that found uh, these remains. And he wrote, the first thing I saw was the severed head of a Marine. The head what? The first thing I saw was the severed head of a Marine. The head was moving back and forth in the water and looked like it was alive. Then I realized it was just bobbing in the small waves, lapping at the shore. For most of these guys in Company K, this was their first experience of war. And the last quote I'll give you is by a, a young 17-year-old. 17, 17 and he asked the question, which is pretty reasonable to ask in the circumstances, why would anyone do this? Wasn't killing them enough? As uh, Rich has already said, they're all members of K-35. They came from disparate backgrounds across the United States. It's interesting, in the UK, the Marines often have a sea experience. They tend to come from the coastal regions. That's not necessarily the case in the United States. These guys are from right across the continent. They come from very different backgrounds, as I've already explained. And in the case of uh, Eugene Sledge, he, he was a, really effectively from a college background, middle class. And what makes his, uh, his memoir so significant, I think, is that it was from the perspective of an enlisted man. He had this extraordinary sensitivity, and we'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure, um, from Henry later on. But just to uh, tell you a little bit about the, the name Devil Dogs, and uh, this will give you a clue. Tufel Hunden, US Marines. This was actually a recruitment poster, a First World War recruitment poster, and that's where the name came from. Its derivation is much discussed, actually, because the, the, so the story goes, the Germans were so impressed by the performance of the 5th Marines at Below Wood that they gave them this sort of honorific, you know, impressive guys, uh, devil dogs, Tufel Hunden. Um, there is no documentary support for this claim. <laughs> Uh, it was probably invented by an American journalist. But what, <laughs> what, what really matters is not its derivation, it's the fact that it's stuck. it stuck. It, it could have been awarded. Uh, the Fifth Marines themselves really liked the name, and therefore the name stuck, and it is still used to this day uh, for the Fifth Marines, and probably more generally for Marines, actually. But anyway, the Fifth Marines in particular. Um, as I say, they, come from, they came from all different backgrounds. I don't have time to go into the full detail of all the campaigns. So just give you some, some broad brushstrokes. Guadalcanal first. Well, Guadalcanal is the first ground offensive of the Second World War of all American troops. It's fought in effect to save Australia, but also in an attempt to 
roll back the recent advances by the Japanese in the Pacific. Uh, and it is a knife edge uh, campaign that I think Rich agrees is really the turning point in the Pacific, not so much midway. The Japanese are still moving forward after midway, but Guadalcanal is a real turning point. And the battle is chiefly fought by the 1st Marine Division with, of course, K Company, forming a crucial part of it. They land unopposed. I think I've got a nice, uh, well, a little bit of orientation for the Pacific. I, I can't really show you in detail where we're talking about, but if you look at the bottom middle of the map, you can see Guadalcanal, that's off to, uh, off to the east of Australia. And a little bit above that is New Britain, and then you move on to Peleliu, and then if you go all the way up close to the Japanese home islands, you can see Okinawa. So those are the four campaigns. Guadalcanal, as I've, uh, I think I've already mentioned, begins on the 7th of August, uh, 1942. And it's a real shock to the system for these guys. It's a hurriedly planned campaign. They, they probably don't have a mu as much equipment and certainly ammunition as they need to begin with. And they, uh, uh, and they have a double trouble very quickly because on the night of the 8th and 9th, of August, uh, a scene that's dramatically shown, I think, in the, in the miniseries Pacific, is that night naval battle at which uh, four cruisers of the US Navy, well, in fact, one is Australian, but nevertheless, four cruisers are sunk by a Japanese night attack. And the consequence of this attack not that the warships uh, were withdrawn, they were going to be withdrawn anyway, the carrier support, but that the supply ships get pulled out quickly too. And so the Devil Dogs get left with this incredibly tricky situation of having to fight uh, a, a pretty ruthless enemy, as I've already explained. They're in uh, jungle, tropical, tropical conditions that are, is going to cause a lot of problems to the physique and the, the general welfare of the men. A lot of them get malaria, a lot of them get dysentery, jungle sores, but they also don't have enough to eat. And they are constantly in combat. What's extraordinary about Guadalcanal is that there is no respite. And although they land with the intention of capturing the, this is the landing. The landing, by the way, was the best bit of the campaign because it was unopposed. <laughs> but but it, turns, it turns pretty nasty thereafter. And what you get, quite interestingly, is uh, a campaign that has begun with an attempt, as they often were in these islands, to capture the airfield. The Japanese were constructing an airfield. That takes place pretty quickly the following day. But the problem is, do, can, how can you hold the air, airfield? And so what begins as an assault on the island actually ends up as a defensive action, at least for the first month and arguably for the first couple of months. And it's a real knife edge situation. Are they going to hold out long enough before the Japanese can bring in reinforcements? The Japanese have really got mm, chiefly control of the air and also of the sea for a big chunk of this campaign. Just to move once. So that's the, uh, that, that's the defensive perimeter. Most of the fighting, I don't have time to talk about uh, the individual actions, but most of the fighting uh, takes place trying to defend the airfield in the center of that defensive perimeter on Guadalcanal. Now, when we get to the end of Guadalcanal, at least for the devil dogs, we're, we're now moving on to December 1942. The conditions of the soldiers when they come off the island will tell you everything about, about the experience they Marines. have. Marines, Marines. Sorry, did I say soldiers? Yes. <laughs> Marines. Uh, I, I, troops, I warned you about Troops that. or Marines, but not we soldiers. We coached you on that. <laughs> it, it clearly is in one ear and out the other. But their, their conditions was really severe. Uh, what do we mean by this? Well, uh, Miller had lost a third of his body weight. And you can, you can bet your bottom dollar, given the background he came from, he wouldn't have had much body fat to begin with. So they were walking scarecrows when they come off the island. But what, are the, what, are, what is the effect of this campaign? As I say, it was a big turning point in the Pacific. And I'll just read you out a couple of quotes, one by a Japanese general and one uh, by uh, Marshall, who, of course, was US Army chief of staff. I think I can call him a soldier. Um, <laughs> You're safe there. Yeah, sorry, I moved on too far. Um, OK. Uh, the Japanese general uh, Kawaguchi described it as the graveyard of the Japanese army, and for Marshall, it was the turning point in the Pacific. Thanks to the resolute defense of these Marines and the desperate gallantry of our naval task forces, uh, they had made the difference. What were the casualties? 30,000 uh, Japanese soldiers, airmen, and uh, naval personnel were killed in the campaign. Uh, and for the Americans, both uh, uh, Marines initially and also uh, soldiers, we're talking about 7,000 total casualties, 1,700 Marines uh, in those casualty figures. So pretty horrific casualties, but of course the Japanese were eroded much worse. 
As I mentioned, the Devil Dogs go on to New Britain um, as their next campaign. Not until December 1943, uh, the Devil Dogs come into play because they'd been in the vanguard at uh, Guadalcanal. They're now in reserve, for the, at least for the landings on New Britain. There are some amazing actions fought by K Company that I don't have time to talk about, but if you uh, are good enough to buy and read the book, have a look at Walt's Ridge, because I think it's one of the sort of, you know, unrecognized heroic episodes uh, in the Second World War. But moving on, from, uh, uh, moving on from New Britain, the next campaign is the one where uh, Eugene Sledge, Henry's father, comes into play, and that, of course, is Peleliu. So let's have a little uh, look at Peleliu. That's Guadalcanal, Marines crossing the river, and that's them leaving. Uh, there's New Britain. New Britain, interestingly enough, just before I leave it and go on to Peleliu, 370 miles across. So this is a sizable terrain. And actually, you can see some of the track of K Company uh, and the 1st Marine Division fighting on that enormous island. But Peleliu was a totally different kettle of fish. As Rich says, five square miles. It's minuscule. Uh, it was defended by 11,000 a Japanese strongly dug into the center of the island. Again, you know, there's some fascinating story about the change in tactics that they were using, but I'm just going to follow the, the devil dog's experience for this story. And I'm just going to tell you a couple of the moments that will give you a sense of, of what they went through. So this is uh, Eugene Sledge's first campaign. Very early on in the campaign, uh, one of the guys attached to K Company, he's not actually a Marine in K Company, cracks up, loses his, uh, his sort of sensibilities and start screaming. Now, they try and calm him down. First of all, they try and soothe him. Then they uh, ad administer um, some morphine to try and sedate him. That doesn't work. Then they try and knock him out by punching him, and that doesn't work either. So eventually, they hit him with a shovel so hard it kills him. Uh, and this is uh, Eugene's response to that. He wrote of the agony and distress etched on the strong faces of the men who had done what any of us would do in those circumstances. So what are the other stories? Well, uh, wary of uh, the Japanese unwillingness to be taken prisoner, a lot of guys were killed trying to take Japanese prisoner. They basically didn't take many of them prisoner. They went further than that, some of them. They, they, they were uh, very keen on taking gold teeth out of the mouths of corpses. Um, there's a situation where even uh, Henry's dad considers it. He manages to pull back from doing that. Uh, but even grimmer moments when another Marine shows uh, Eugene the desiccated hand that he's hacked off a corpse and dried in the sun. He's quite proud of this, and he's going to take it back to the United States. So what is Eugene's response to all of this, and how does he make sense of it? He writes, the war had gotten to my friend. He had lost briefly, I hoped, all his sensitivity. He was a 20th century savage now, mild-mannered though he was. I shuddered to think that I might do the same thing if the war went on and on. And yet, at other times, the Marines could have, of course, show great sensitivity. There's a, a, a section in the book where one is literally cradling the head of his dying comrade. And there's also a lo another lovely quote by uh, Eugene Sledge. He makes a... Uh, 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 a bracelet of shells which he's found on the beach of Peleliu for his mum, and he sends it home with a letter. And he writes, I hope, because these dainty little shells come from such a dreadful place, that you won't, you won't fail to see their beauty and know that they show you were in my mind constantly. So that's the Marines going in. It was an opposed landing. Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Iwo Jima, of course, is well known as uh, you know, horrific fighting on the beaches. Peleliu was pretty bad, too. You had a double whammy on Peleliu. They fought on the beaches, and they also were firmly ensconced in land. Uh, and this is the result of K Company's fighting on Peleliu. These are the survivors. They started out 235 strong, and they end up with just 85. And uh, here are some of the key characters. This is Jim McHenry, I mentioned at the beginning. That's R.V. Bergen, another sort of the key uh, players in the story. And thirdly, that's Eugene Sledge in this picture of 85. And so to the final campaign on Okinawa. Again, I don't have time to talk about the detail. It was a meat grinder of a battle that uh, spanned 82 days. The casualties for everyone concerned were horrific. 50,000 casualties for the American uh, Marines and soldiers fighting on that island. The Japanese defenders, 100 
100 to 110,000 strong, were killed almost to a man, as they were on Peleliu. Even worse than that were the number of civilians who died on that island, which made it such a warning for the, uh, the fight that was going to come uh, if the Japanese home islands had been invaded. 125, or up to 125,000 civilians were killed on Okinawa, and these were deaths, of course, that uh, Eugene Sledge and many others had to witness. And the final picture, uh, this is the mortar section in June. So these are the survivors. Now, there's an interesting statistic which Eugene Sledge has got in his book. There were, I think, let me just get the, the numbers right, there were 60, 65 veterans, Peleliu veterans, who also fought on Okinawa, including Eugene Sledge. By the end of the Okinawan campaign, there were just 26 still standing, and these are some of them. Uh, Eugene is, is in the center, kneeling down with the helmet on and the pipe in his mouth. And I, I hope Henry will say a word or two about this, uh, this picture, because it's really quite remarkable. So just to sum up, uh, K Company fighting through the Pacific, 90 members of the company were killed, hundreds suffered wounds, and arguably just as, uh, uh, as affecting with the psychological trauma that many of them had to deal with in the, in the years to come, as we are, I think, are going to hear from Henry. Um, so the question is, was it all worth it, which they're bound to ask themselves. And I think uh, Eugene Sledge gives a wonderfully pithy answer to this. There is no such thing as the glory of war, he writes. There is only the horror of war to the men who fight. Unfortunately, until heaven prevails, Somebody has got to be ready to defend our country or we'll lose it. It is a sentiment, I think you'll all agree, that uh, people in Ukraine today feel just as strongly about. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Saul, for inviting me to be a part of this experience. It's been an honor for my family and me to be here with all of you. As I have become more active in the World War II community, people often say to me that my father's book, With the Old Breed, has been an inspiration to them in so many ways. To dive deeper into World War II history in some cases, and in other cases, to even serve their country. Many have said to me that with the old breed has helped them understand that war is not just a game of airplanes, tanks, and artillery, but a visceral human experience, and it takes a toll on the people who live through it. But what does that book mean to me as the son of Eugene Sledge? It is literally part of my DNA. It is part of who I am. I grew up watching that book being written and seeing it come to life. Some of my earliest childhood memories are of seeing my father sitting up late at night by the fireplace, writing on a yellow legal pad. I would come through the room clutching my blanket and I would ask, what are you doing, Dad? <clears throat> he would answer, nothing, just working on something, get back to bed. <laughs> he, he was a little nicer than that, but. <laughs> my father had no desire to be a writer. All he really wanted to be was a scientist. He was also, in my opinion, an all-American dad. He began writing his book as a cathartic process. As the number of those yellow legal pads filled with his penciled handwriting grew into a stack, my mother agreed to begin typing it. There was a little room off the kitchen in our house where I grew up. My mother called it the butler's pantry. I don't know why, because we didn't have a butler. <laughs> they put a small desk in there with a typewriter, and she began typing what he was writing. He would write by night, and she would type by day, stacking the pages on the corner of that desk. As she read and typed what he was writing, she saw the power and the humanity in the story he was telling. She suggested to him to try to get it published. I still remember my father saying, direct quote, who in the hell would want to read it? This is for you and the boys. <coughs> the stack of typed pages on the corner of that little desk grew rapidly, and my brother and I would frequently stop and read them as we passed through the room. The lexicon of my father's war experience became a part of my own growing up experience. Names like Snafu, Hillbilly, 
Ak Ak, Stumpy, places like Bloody Nose Ridge, Half Moon Hill, alphanumeric terms like K35 and Orange Beach 2. These things were commonplace to me. By the late 1970s, that stack of pages had turned into a massive manuscript. My mother eventually prevailed and inspired him to try to get this thing into print. They began reaching out to publishers. I well remember one fine afternoon walking to the mailbox with my father. Inside was a huge manila envelope. It was a copy of the manuscript being sent back from a publisher. As we walked back down to the house, I recall him saying, well, I know what this is, as he started reading the letter that was enclosed with it. I asked him, what does it say, Dad? He said, it's somebody sending the manuscript back to me. They're not interested in it. And he was very philosophical. It was the second publisher that they had sent it to. Another fine, sunny afternoon, a few months after that, I had just gotten home from school. I was 15 or so. My parents announced to me that they had just heard from the third publisher. My mother said, Dad's book is going to be published. And that was around 1980. In a letter to two fellow K Company men, Stumpy Stanley and Bill Layden, sometime in 1981, right before With the Old Breed was to be published, my father told them how the book was finally done and he was ready to lay down his pen and put all those horrible things out of his mind and move on with his life. He'd had enough of war. When the book actually came out that year, it wasn't long before he started hearing from readers, letters and phone calls. The irony quickly became obvious. He couldn't just put all those horrible things out of his mind and move on with his life. He had to deal with the consequences of his success. The Sledgehammer was a non-egocentric individual. His deeper purpose of writing with the old breed was not to aggrandize himself, it was to fulfill a mission. He felt driven to tell the story of what he and his fellow devil dogs in K-3-5 endured and the price they paid. A very <clears throat> meaningful quote from the book, I think encapsulates so much, quote, something in me died at Peleliu. Perhaps it was the childish innocence that accepted his faith, the claim that man is basically good. Possibly I lost faith that politicians in high places who do not have to endure war's savagery will ever stop blundering and sending others to endure it." End quote. Growing up as Sledgehammer's son, I saw glimpses of the cost of that savagery. One night in 1971, when I was about six, we were watching the movie Patton, starring George C. Scott. My father hated war movies and wanted nothing to do with them. Somehow, we talked him into it. I'm actually gonna blame that on my older brother because I was only six and he was 12, so. <laughs> During the battle scene where they were in North Africa, it was a relentless cacophony of shell explosions. He became emotional during that scene and went into the kitchen and began pounding the refrigerator. My mother got him to sit down. He was crying. We found out later that when they were under heavy shell fire at Peleliu in Okinawa, they would pound the ground in front of their foxholes in desperation and frustration. I just thought it was because he hated George C. Scott, but. <laughs> Hitting the refrigerator that night in 1971 was his Pavlovian response to what he saw and heard on the television set. Now, after relating that story, I wanna quickly assure you that Sledgehammer was a master of his emotions. He had a great capacity to, to compartmentalize what he thought and what he did. He was not a tortured or maladjusted individual. He had a boisterous sense of humor and a zest for life. He was a typical example of an ordinary young man in 1941 who wanted nothing more than to live his life and fulfill his dreams. He went willingly into the abyss of war and had to find his way out. Through the years, I've heard people refer to him almost analytically, dispassionately, such as Sledge wrote this, or Sledge said that, or Sledgehammer, he was the guy in the Pacific. All of this shows how his legacy has grown and endured, and I welcome that as a passionate student of World War II history. But there is a part of me that also thinks, Sledgehammer is the guy who taught me to ride a bike in the front yard when I was five. 
the same guy who taught me to shoot a 45 automatic pistol out in the woods on a cold winter day when I was 16, the same pistol he carried through Okinawa. It was one of my prized possessions. How do I, as his son, serve his legacy? My love of World War II history, especially his story, is coded into me. It is part of who I am. My father encouraged me to read from an early age, and I spent many hours on the floor in his study looking through the life pictorial history of World War II or some other similar book while he was at his desk working on his own book. We had many conversations in that room about his war experience. Even then, I was impressed by his ability to recall even the most minute details. In 1999, I got the chance to go to Peleliu. I was talking to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife of 22 years, and I was telling her how worried I was about the expense of the trip. She said, you have to go to Peleliu. It's part of who you are. And she really did say that. She's sitting right there. You can ask her if you don't believe. <laughs> I stood on Orange Beach 2, where K-35 landed in 1944. I went to the airfield and walked the area where they went, went across on D plus one amid a nightmare of snapping bullets and screeching shells. It was plenty hot that day for me, but not nearly as hot as it was for Sledgehammer and his buddies when they went across. I loved the way he told me the story of the airfield attack. He, he said when they got across to the other side and flopped down to catch their breath, their ears were ringing from the deafening explosions. And one of his buddies, a Cape Gloucester veteran who'd already seen plenty, looked over at him and said, that was rough duty, Sledgehammer. I'd hate like hell to have to do that every day. <laughs> All I could hear in that humid, still air in 1999 was the haunting whistle of the bush warblers out in the jungle. And it was a haunting, mournful sound. Through the years, I've seen the influence of With the Old Breed and China Marine, his second book. I've seen the interest people seem to have in Sledgehammer, both as a Marine and as a person. I want to add context and perspective to that with my insight on him, my memories of him that no one else has. The long-term legacy of what he accomplished with his writing was to show the emotional cost to a human being of the savagery of warfare. In so doing, he created an unintended legacy. The book itself in the place it is carved out as, in the words of John Keegan, an arresting document of wartime literature. I'd like to close with a few words on how he saw himself. These lines are from a letter I came across in the archives at Auburn University. It was to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Smith, USMC retired, who edited with the old breed. This letter is from 1982, shortly after the book's release and it's typical sledgehammer, straightforward, honest, and self-deprecating. Dear Bob, I'm delighted you were pleased with the way Presidio Press designed with the old breed. I too think they did a fine job. You certainly caught every detail of the photo on the back, even to the jungle rod on my hand and lower arm. Everyone thinks that photo is very appropriate. However, you can understand why I prefer not to even look at it. Even the faintest recollection of how I felt at the time it was taken is a sensation I prefer to avoid forever. As for my feelings about the book, well, my primary sensation is one of intense relief over its completion and of fulfilling a commitment I made long ago to tell our story like it was on Peleliu and Okinawa. I never thought over those years it would ever get into print one day. Almost every day for the last two weeks, I've received a letter or a phone call from some Marine or Navy man, most of whom I never knew or heard of. Most of them say that they realize it must have been a gut-wrenching ordeal to put such an account on paper, far different from sitting around batting the breeze over a beer and telling sea stories. And they're grateful I did it. They actually thank me. With no exaggeration, it is an eerie sensation. I feel as though I've unleashed a genie. I think you know me well enough, Bob, to know that it's not false pride when I say to you, I honestly don't know what is so impressive about with the old breed. All I did was keep my eyes open and notice details during the war so I could tell it like it was to my descendants. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
wow. You know, um, Jeremy, you want to conduct your usual maneuvers? Thank you, panelists, for a wonderful discussion. We're going to open Q&A, guys. Um, if you want to just raise your hands, and either I or Andrew will come around to you. Panelists, your first question will be to your right towards the back with Andrew. Um, I've read the book three times, and uh, each time felt really good about what I was learning. It w wasn't in any history book anywhere. But the question I'd like you to maybe uh, elaborate on was, Every time they finished a, a battle, the 1st Marine Division was no longer operational. They'd have such massive casualties. And that was after Guadalcanal. And then they rebuilt it. And they had to go somewhere for R&R &R to uh, absorb the replacements and train them up. And the same thing then happened every other time they did this. Would you please elaborate, if you, if you can for me, that wonderful resort that they sent them to for the R&R. &R. <laughs> I would really appreciate that, and I think the audience would too. Are, are you asking me or Saul? Let, let's all lead it off, and then you can okay. add personal well, I, You must be talking about Pavuvu. And um, so to set that in the context, they come out of New Britain, uh, initially land at Cape Gloucester, and then end up halfway along the island, as I think I showed in the map. And they're brought out in early May uh, 1944, and they hope they're going back to Australia, where a lot of them have girlfriends, having been there after Guadalcanal, where they're being build up, built up to land in New Britain in the first place. Um, but they don't go there. Uh, some are even thinking they might go all the, way, all the way back to the United States. Well, they're definitely not going there. But they are going to Pavuvu, which was an island that had only recently been captured for the Japanese, and it had no infrastructure. Whose idea it was to send them there, we don't know for sure. I mean, we think it's part of the staff of the, uh, of the Marine Corps that was in overall charge of the 1st Marine Division at that time. Uh, and we're also pretty sure that the only view they had of the island was from the air. No one had actually looked at it on the ground. When K Company got there, they found uh, the remnants of uh, a coconut plantation, rotting coconuts all over the ground, land crabs as big as plates, and that was it. Now, they do go back after Peleliu to Pavuvu, by which time it's a totally different kettle of fish. The, the CBs have been there, and they've turned it into something half reasonable. There even, there's a lovely moment when uh, uh, Eugene Sledge is talking about coming off Peleliu, and he lands on the beach there, and obviously they're all completely disorientated about what they've just been through. And they see these young women who are handing out glasses of orange juice. I mean, it's like they can't believe what they're seeing. But I can assure you, those young women were not there uh, in May 1940, well, May towards the end of June, uh, early June, sorry. 1944 when they first get there it was a, it was a hor horrific place and no place frankly to properly uh, recover from what they've been through on New Britain the issue for the US military at that time was the tempo of operations they are now increasing they're gonna need the first marine division for Peleliu and that takes place uh, in September so there really isn't time to send them anywhere else they've got to be in the location they could have in theory uh, sent them to Guadalcanal which at that point was in better Nick than Pavuvu, but they choose not to. But the most significant thing of Pavuvu, in my mind, certainly in the book, is this is where uh, Eugene Sledge joins K Company. And it's quite interesting. I don't know if um, uh, uh, Henry wants to elaborate on this, but Henry didn't, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Eugene did not want to join K Company. He didn't want to join the three Fifth Marines. He wanted to join his buddy in the First Marines. Is that, is that correct? Right. His good friend Sid Phillips was an H21, H Company, 2nd Battalion, First Marines. Uh, and he hoped that he would be uh, put into the first Marines, but it, it actually, he, he actually said, I, I can't remember if he said this with the old breed or I may have come across it in his unpublished writing, which I'm researching, but <clears throat> when he was selected to be 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, he knew the storied history of the 5th Marines, going back to Belleau Wood, uh, knew that they had a very proud history, uh, not that any Marine regiment didn't, but he was especially proud to be in the 5th Marines mm. and 1st Marine Division. So he, uh, and again, I can't remember if this was in the unpublished writing or if he said it with the Obrey. He, he felt that he had, 
hit the lottery and won, and that was probably the only time the Pacific War he felt like he won the lottery. But, <laughs> uh, but, but his first um, impression of Pavuvu was to coming up, coming across on the President Polk and, and landing at the Steel Pier in McKitty Bay, I believe it was, and seeing some 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 guys down at the pier as they're shouldering all their gear. And, and coming down the gangplank, and this he's literally getting into the theater of war that he had tried to get into to, to when, he, when he enlisted in the Marines. And, and he sees these guys, and they're suntanned, and they all looked really underweight. And, but they were friendly to them. And, and they were just smoking cigarettes and relaxing. And, and his impression of them was these guys just had an air of confidence about them that, that I couldn't imagine until later. Let me just insert... Uh... I had the great privilege of getting to know Bill Layden and also Sid Phillips. Uh, had uh, significant contact with both, particularly Sid and his uh, sister Catherine, who were featured in uh, Ken Burns' The War. And uh, Sid was not only a wonderful guy, a doctor. Uh, you'll notice that both uh, Eugene and Sid go on to be very high-level professionals, a doctor and a professor of biology post-war. And Sid, uh, when I went to visit him at his home, uh, he took me upstairs, and uh, after Eugene had died and the house had been sold, he had sitting in a bedroom upstairs in Sid's home, uh, Eugene Sledge's boyhood bed. Uh, he also had a great collection of artifacts the two of them as young kids had collected around Mobile. Uh, Sid was a real inspiration. And when uh, we were doing the Road to Tokyo exhibit, uh, I had so hoped that Sid was going to make it to the opening in December 2015. But it became clear in the spring that that was not to be. So after we did one of our final reviews of the content uh, of the entire Road to Tokyo exhibit, I gathered that all that together in the videos, and I drove over to Mobile and showed that to Sid. So he got to see what was going to be even though he was not going to be there. And if you go to the Guadalcanal exhibit, you'll hear the very first voice you hear is Sid Phillips. Uh, I had my oar in the water on that, and uh, it's no accident that Sid Phillips is the first voice you hear at the Guadalcanal exhibit. Sid was, he was never Dr. Phillips. Sid was Uncle Sid to me growing up. That, that's the only thing I ever called him. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to your right, all the way towards the back, gentlemen. Uh, this is to Henry. I enjoyed and was um, greatly in awe of the books. I read the one in, um, on China Marine, and one of the more compelling stories was your father's talking about the people he met and became friends with, including Chinese families and a priest. Um, and I. In the book, he indicates he never knew what became of, uh, of those uh, families he became friends with um, due to the Civil War in China. I was wondering if you ever learned what happened to those people he wrote um, so affectionately about. I do not, sadly. I, I can't give you any more information on that. I, I know looking through my father's papers in the archives at Auburn University, I've, I've seen some letters, but but nothing post-dated from the war out, far enough out, that would give me any indication of what happened to them. But, but those, that was cherished time for him in, in China. Next question is going to be to your left in the front, please. Uh, my question is for Saul and also for Rich. Uh, in Eric Bergerud's book, Touch With Fire, he talks about the Gurkhi Patrol. And his argument is, contrast to John Dower, who calls the war in the Pacific this racist war, Bergerud says the key event is the Gurkhi Patrol. He says before that, it's, it's not, that particular event changes the whole nature of the Pacific War towards the brutality that it ends up with. It, 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 from your observations, is that true? Did it have that kind of effect on the, especially on the American side? I think the first thing you could say is uh, it definitely had that effect on everyone in 1st Marine Division. Um, but you've already had the death march at Bataan at this point. That I think the Americans generally were under no illusion at the sort of, you know, the, the 
uh, obdurate and pretty uh, ruthless opponent they're up against. Having said that, to actually experience it on the ground and to see it. And what's interesting about the K Company veterans writing about finding the Gurkha patrol is the news of what they'd seen spread right through the division. And uh, as you can see from the quote I gave, there are other quotes from other members of K Company who basically say from that point onwards, it was all bets off in terms of how we were going to behave towards them. So it was a, it, psychologically, it was a real swing moment. And, but remember, it's right at the beginning of their very first campaign, so it doesn't take them long to realize, which of course the British had already had a pretty good experience, the British and Commonwealth troops uh, fighting the Japanese earlier in Malaya, you know, the, the consequences of getting yourself into the hands of the Japanese. I mean, they did take prisoners, of course, in Malaya, but in these island battles, very few prisoners were taken by either side, and it's, you know, it's one of the tragedies, really, of the campaign. This, uh, this gets to a really profound issue with respect to the whole Asia-Pacific War. And uh, John Dower's book, War Without Mercy, particularly stressed the racial angle to this. Uh, in terms of what happened in 1942, you have to remember that uh, up to the moment the Marines landed on Guadalcanal, there was no American who had witnessed testimony of what it was like to fight the Japanese on the ground. Everyone who had in the Philippines was either dead or a prisoner. So what, this was a de novo encounter with Japanese armed forces by the 1st Marine Division. And there were really two events that happened very closely together. The first was this patrol. The message from this patrol was the Japanese were not taking prisoners. Then shortly after that, you had the Battle of the Teneru. And in the aftermath of that were this, Marine, uh, this Japanese uh, reinforced battalions, mini regiments is virtually wiped out along the Teneru River. In, in the immediate aftermath, the Marines and corpsmen are sweeping over the, the, this god-awful uh, slaughter uh, in front of them. And instead of uh, being able to find uh, surviving Japanese and provide uh, uh, treatment for them and take them prisoner, instead they encounter repeated episodes where the Japanese, who were still conscious and still able to do so, attempt to take a last Marine or a, a corpsman with them. They use grenades. Uh, they, they almost kill the operations officer of the 1st Marine Division, who is looking down when a Japanese soldier discharges a pistol in his face. Mm. And basically, in my view, this is what happened. You had in these two episodes two messages. The Japanese are not taking prisoners. The Japanese will not surrender. And oh, by the way, if you think you're going to take a Japanese prisoner, you are basically gambling your life and the life of your buddies that your judgment about what this guy's intentions are are correct. The next thing that happens, like Saul said, is this is uh, Gerhard Weinberg, our great colleague. Or, you know, he, he talks about the word, which is basically not necessarily what's written down, but the way stories are told within units and the way stories are disseminated with it. The story of what had happened to the First Marine Division at the, that patrol and the Tenero spread like wildfire to the American Armed Forces that if you're fighting the Japanese on the ground, or at sea for that matter, there were episodes like that, this is the terms on which the Japanese are fighting. And for most Americans, the judgment was not simply that the Japanese were of a different race. They were like aliens from another planetary system. Nobody fought this way. The Japanese armed forces are the only armed forces in modern time that literally, literally, repeatedly fought to the last man or virtually last man. Nobody else fought under those terms. Christopher Bailey and Jim Harper in their book about uh, forgotten armies and forgotten wars or whatever here, they expanded their uh, discussion of this into, well, if you look at it, uh, certainly racism was present, but you'll notice that, oh, by the way, in Burma, where the uh, J Japanese are, are fighting uh, primarily uh, troops from India, the British Indian Army. And they're also, in the last campaigns, they're, they're fighting Africans from East and West Africa. And as uh, Bailey and Harper write, the terms on which the Indians and the blacks from Africa were fighting the Japanese were the same as what the Americans were in the Pacific. There's a poem by one of the Indian uh, soldiers, an officer, about one of the big battles, Kohima, we mentioned this morning or whatever. Uh, and in that poem, he has this line, no prisoners we took, no mercy we gave, the crimes against our comrades we never forgave. 
And that was basically everybody who fought the Japanese, and this extends to the Chinese also, basically had the same attitude about this. There was race certainly present, but by God, it was the terms on which the Japanese were fighting that drove everybody to this savagery. And the final point I would make is, if the whole thing was based on white-hot racism to the end, when we got into Japan, why weren't we slaughtering every Japanese male and raping every Japanese woman? It's like you threw a switch. The Japanese were no longer doing what had driven us to such incredible savagery in the Pacific. They now were defeated from it. Next question is going to be in the front to your left, please. I'll direct this to Henry. I had an uncle, my mother's brother, who was uh, in a heavy artillery outfit in France. And years later, myself as an adult, I heard something out of him that uh, you mentioned that uh, really rang a bell for me. And that is, he had an incredible recollection of the war in minute detail and vast amounts of material. But he said something else that uh, I'll tell you, and I'd like to hear your father's reaction. Uh, again, later in life, I asked him how he felt the war affected him. And he said it was really kind of simple. I came home so happy to be alive. Nothing really bothered me of any significance. What was your father's position along those lines? Oh, to a large degree, exactly what you said. I know that he spoke that my grandfather, who had treated shell shock victims, as they were called, from World War I, was a tremendous help to him. Uh, my father told me he did a lot of just sitting around staring at the wall when he first got home. And, and I will say that the scene in the Pacific in Part 10 where he's sitting under the tree drinking iced tea and my grandmother comes out there and, Eugene, what are you doing? What's to become of you? You, you know, and, and my gr grandfather came out there and said, leave him alone, Mary Frank. You have no idea what that boy's been through. That, my father told me that story himself before HBO ever heard it. When we, when my brother or I or anybody would complain about things, my father would say, hell, I'm just glad I got dry socks. <laughs> you know, if I complained about what my mother prepared for dinner, you know, he would just look at me and say, you don't know what a bad day is. <laughs> and, and he was a little nicer than that, but I mean... <laughs> Trust me, as his youngest son, I pushed him to his limits, probably worse than the Japanese ever did. But, but it, it, it informed his thinking for the rest of his life. He appreciated so many things. Next, we're going to go to your right, all the way in the back, please. As far as I know, I'm the senior Marine president, so I feel a compulsion <laughs> to say something about Guadalcanal, which, in fact, I've written about in three different books. One thing I caution the audience is that you, you see war at different levels, and it's not that the authentic authenticity of Eugene Sledge's experience and those of his comrades is, is should be questioned. It's just simply that one has to deal with various levels of responsibility and and uh, the action occurs at different levels. I happen to be the biographer of Gerald C. Thomas who was the operations officer for the 1st Marine Division and then as chief of staff on Guadalcanal and I certainly got inside the Thomas family and I had a working relationship with Merrill Twining, also a Marine general who became Thomas's successor as the division uh, uh, G3. They thought the Getchy Patrol was about as big a screw up as you could imagine. Um, General Vandegrift, frankly, did not have as good a grasp on the situation as his staff thought he should. And the only person that could convince him to do anything differently was Merritt Edson who was the head of the Raider Battalion and then commander of the 5th Marines. 
If it hadn't been for Edson, the first division would have been in uh, serious trouble on a number of occasions. When the Getchy Patrol went out and did not come back, the division lost practically all of its expertise in the Japanese language and, and order of battle of the Japanese army. It was replaced by a businessman who spoke Japanese named Moran, who was a reserve lieutenant colonel, and Martin Clemens, who was a coast watcher. In fact, I, I helped Mr. Clemens do his biography, autobiography, published by the Naval Institute Press. And what one sees, frankly, is a Marine division that was almost clueless as to how to fight anybody at that particular point of the war. I ran across a situation where Clifton Cates, commander of the 1st Regiment, and Jerry Thomas were sitting together under a Japanese bombardment saying, well, I guess we're going to have to learn the sound of different guns. These don't sound like the Germans. Both of them were veterans of World War I. We often overlook the fact that at the field grade and company commander level, the 1st Division was blessed with a large number of World War I veterans who had, uh, certainly knew a great deal more about war than it sometimes appears. It was unfortunate that Vandergriff was not one of those people, and they, his staff and senior officers spent a great deal of time uh, trying to work around him and to make sure that, in fact, things that he was intended to do or wanted to do did not happen. Um, that the, uh, the real challenge was to make sure the division was still there when it got reinforcements and aviation came in. Cactus Air Force was created, and the, the operation went as uh, they hoped it would. It doesn't take anything away from the experiences of the junior troops. It's just sometimes one has to also elevate to um, another level of analysis and appreciation. I, I guess one of the worst things somebody ever said to me one time was, you write like a goddamn colonel. Well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Still am. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to your left with Connie. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I read the old breed and it, it stunned me. As the, the landings on Okinawa initially were unopposed by the Japanese uh, strategy. When the uh, casualties got to be so great, uh, going for the southern part of Okinawa, was was there any thought of just sealing that off and moving all Amer all American uh, forces to the north, which apparently it was taken quite readily, and they could have just moved all move the uh, move the operation north out of uh, out of the range of the uh, Japanese in the south, just seal them off, or is that just uh, once the operation began they couldn't change tactics? I'd be interested to hear um, Richard's uh, feeling about this. Uh, I didn't see any indication that they were seriously considering that in, yeah. in the discussion that was going on at, at army level and corps level. It, it seemed to have a, a kind of life of itself. One thing you could say that was never tried and probably should have been is a landing below the main Japanese defensive system, which, as Rich showed in the initial uh, slide, was in the southern third of the island, but there was or there was space below that for them to land. Now, this was suggested by a number of key people, key subordinates uh, of the army commander, uh, but it was turned down each, each time. That's Buckner, of course. And he used, you know, the argument that there would be a danger they'd be trapped on the beaches, but they had some pretty good capability. The 77th uh, Army Division had amphibious capability, and it was recommended by Bruce, the divisional commander, that they do that. And given that the consequences of battering their heads against effectively a brick wall in the center of the island were so costly, it strikes me that that was something that probably should have been tried. And the last point I'll make about this, that is that the Japanese themselves, and we know this from Yahara, Yahara was the operations officer and left behind an amazing testimony, very unusual for a senior Japanese commander to survive a battle of this type, but he was dispatched back to Japan to give the bad news effectively. Uh, and he wrote a 
incredibly revealing account of the battle in which he insists that it was their big fear that an amphibious landing would take place and that they'd actually held up troops to guard the southern beaches for a certain point until casualties were so serious in the center of the island that they had to move them forward. And that was the point, and I think Rich has made this point himself when we discussed it, that that was the point at which they probably should have given the, uh, the second landing a go. But to answer your question, I haven't seen any indication that they were seriously considering shutting off one part of the island. Last, last thing I'll say on that, really last thing is, that's pretty much what they did in New Britain. Uh, so it's not a totally mad idea, but New Britain was a huge island. And I, one of the capabilities the Japanese had on Okinawa was a lot of artillery, and they could still have done uh, a fair amount of damage with it. So I think they felt they needed to go on and take the whole island. Yeah, I, I, I essentially agree with uh, virtually all of that. I think the other thing you have to understand when we talk about these levels of war, you've got to understand that at this point, in early 1945, you're looking at the total order of battle of Marine and Army divisions in the Pacific. You're planning the next step after Okinawa is going to be the invasion of Japan, and that's going to be in two phases. And all those divisions that are then in the Pacific are going to be needed in their earmark for those operations. So in other words, there's no spare divisions to leave behind to hold this cordon to uh, seal off the Japanese on Okinawa. And I, I can't point to you to specific evidence that uh, I've ever seen that this was sort of a conscious thing by uh, Buckner. But I think Buckner clearly understood that his part of his mission was to clean the entire island, finish the campaign with those divisions so those divisions were available for future operations. And I think that probably played a part. And I think the point, Saul and I had talked about this, uh, Buckner actually, there were two major points where Buckner was urged to conduct a landing to the south. But the first one, I, I think Buckner had some reasonable arguments, uh, especially the fact the Japanese, as Saul said and Yohara said, the Japanese had kept units in reserve exactly for that possibility. When those units were committed to the front line, that was the moment when a revisited the issue of landing to the south uh, should have been seriously considered. Uh, besides crushing the 32nd Army, the other thing about had that landing taken place that probably would have been very important was for the Okinawans, because the stupendous yeah. number of Okinawan civilian deaths on Okinawa occurred in that compressed area down there in the south of the island, uh, where the Okinawans, I believe, say that there are like 150,000 dead Okinawans as a result of that campaign. They have a memorial that uh, itemizes all of that. Uh, but that's essentially how I would sum it up. Next question is in the center aisle towards the back, please, with Connie. Dr. Frank, thank you for expertly articulating the savagery of the Japanese warrior. Mr. Sledge, uh, in the museum where I volunteer, every day I listen to your father. We have a video. I don't know of another person who expertly uh, describes the inhumanity of war. And finally, Dr. So uh, David, would you kindly speak about the climate in which the Marines were fighting and the diseases and the bugs and crabs? Uh, it, it's uh, pretty significant. And rain and mud. Yeah, I, I, actually, I'll go to New Britain. I, I mentioned a little bit of that uh, when I was talking about Guadalcanal, but New Britain actually was worse, if anything. They, they were describing uh, the guys in Company K, 200 feet high uh, trees. This is jungle. As soon as they landed, the jungle came pretty much up to the shore. Uh, I also mentioned that Company K arrived a few days after the, the main body of, uh, of the 1st Marine Division, but it was immediately pitched into uh, an unbelievably brutal campaign. So you've got the wet weather, almost constant rain, and churning up the mud. So they're moving through a jungle where they can't see anything ahead of them, and the jungle is being completely... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quagmire. So the chances of bringing up supporting heavy weapons, artillery, of course, was vanishingly small. There's one... I, 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 just to move on from that, I mentioned Waltz Ridge, uh, this extraordinary battle. What's significant about that battle is that despite all the difficulties, despite the fact that even in a very short time, the, uh, the 
ability of company K to fight a battle of this type was already eroded. This is just 10 days into the campaign. And despite all of that, Walt, who was the battalion commander, who had, I think, been uh, 2IC, second in command, EXO of the, of the uh, regiment, but then had to come in because the battalion commander was wounded. Walt personally organizes the, uh, the dragging of a, uh, a field piece probably 37 uh, millimeter field piece, up this slope to the, uh, just below the ridge line, which is where Company K had got, so that they could hold on to that position during the night. And it's the Japanese attempt to take that gun effectively and sweep Company K off the top of the hill, which is what makes it such an epic encounter. And Walt is rewarded with a Navy Cross, but in my view, he deserved a Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did that day. I mean, he led by example in a way that you, the only thing I can think of that compares to it in the British Army is, is uh, H. Jones in, in winning a Victoria Cross in the Falkland Islands, for which he was heavily criticized uh, and has been ever since. But if you speak to the men of two para who fought with him that day, they have no criticism of him. And of course, uh, the men of Company K Sorry, two power. And the men of Company K were, were unbelievably grateful at Walt's leadership. And the other person who did fantastically in that battle, of course, is Haldane, who I didn't have time to talk about. Um, but just read Eugene Sledge's uh, account of, well, I won't give the game away if you don't know what happens to Haldane and you haven't seen the Pacific. But he is an example of the right type of officer, an officer who has firmness in his leadership but also has sensitivity to his men and always never expects them to do anything he won't do. And uh, he is awarded the Silver Star. And again, that was probably <laughs> a grade or two too low for what he deserved for that battle. Uh, Cape Gloucester, uh, I want to talk about a little bit because it reinforces one of the earlier points I made. The Japanese put up a ferocious resistance in the area that the Marines initially land in under these, you know, the rain is continuous. Uh, the Pacific series has captures that very well, just utter, utter misery. And the Japanese are decimated, uh, starving. Uh, they sustain their resistance long past their logistical sell-by date. And finally, they begin to retreat uh, across, along that uh, incredibly long New Britain up to their main base up at uh, Rabaul. And what happens during that retreat is, in, at least as far as I understand, is one of the rare moments in the whole Pacific War where a Japanese unit loses cohesion so badly that they begin abandoning people, uh, leaving them behind. They were too sick, too exhausted to carry on. Now, the 1st Marine Division has a very well-earned reputation for being really tough. And as they pursue the Japanese and they begin to encounter all these individuals who've been left behind, after a very short time, they realize these people are so debilitated, uh, they are not a threat like regular. And the Marine, First Marine Division takes an incredible number of prisoners of war during that pursuit phase when they're encountering, encountering Japanese uh, soldiers who they understand do not present the normal threat that you don't know what you're really getting when you think you're looking at a surrender. Uh, they take almost 10% of the total Japanese ga garrison a prisoner of war on New Britain. The usual figure is no more than 3% or something like that. But once again, this gets back to racism was certainly present, but the terms on which the Japanese insisted the war be fought, that was the single thing that drove everybody who fought them nuts. I think we have time for one last question. We're gonna go to your right, towards the middle. This question is for Mr. Sledge. Um, I think it's fair to say your dad was a pretty serious guy. So I just want to know, how did he deal with lackadaisical college students? <laughs> well, I, I could answer the question how he dealt with a lackadaisical high school student, <laughs> but he did not deal with it very well. Um, <laughs> he, he was a pretty outspoken guy. Uh, he, would, he would haul him in and... and uh, and tell them what they needed to do. And I, I don't think he could teach in this day and age. I don't think he would last very long. <laughs> um, but he really, he didn't have a lot of tolerance for 
just not doing your damn job, if I can just say it like that. I mean, there's, oops. That's the best way to say it. Uh, let me add that uh, we had an earlier session uh, in one of the museum programs, some people who had been students of Eugene Sledge at uh, Montevallo uh, College over here were talking, and one of the, the point they made was he was a really tough instructor, but they had no idea whatsoever of what his war experience had been until was the old breed came out. You know, this was just total shock that they had never realized what the background of Eugene Sledge was. So I know Henry referenced it earlier, but uh, talking about uh, students, talking about legacy, I'd like to ask that Andrea Sledge and Jack Sledge, please stand. Jack is the grandson of Eugene Sledge. They, they've been dear friends of the museum and mine personally for some time, and it's always great to see them. So thank you for sharing Henry and the story with us. If, if I could quickly mention, those of you who have heard of Joseph Alexander, the, the Marine Corps historian, my son is named after him. His full name is Joseph Alexander Sledge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Richard Frank, Saul David, and Henry Sledge. They will all be out at the book signing table now, and we will be back in 30 minutes, 3.45, for our final session of the day. Thank you. I think I've always been a helper. I can remember during high school, I would work at the charity hospital on, in Summers, and uh, the head oral surgeon there, because I worked in the dental clinic, uh, said to me, you know, you have such a knack for helping people. I think I was wired that way. Growing up in New Orleans, I have to tell you, was very special. Uh, I mean, the customs there, uh, the Mardi Gras, uh, all the things that we did. We used to walk in the French Quarter and stop at all the jazz places, because I love jazz. And it was just so wonderful. We, we had all the things we needed. We had a warm house, we had good food on the table because my mother cooked three meals a day. I mean, she was a, a typical mother with six children. I think my values uh, were established by my parents. My whole family have always been very pro-military. Uh, I can remember as a kid, we would be riding along the road I would be with my dad, and he'd see a soldier on the side of the road, and he'd stop and say, son, where are you going? Come on, get in the car, I'll take you there. I mean, uh, these pictures uh, linger in my psyche because it left such a strong impression. I really consider ourselves a, a military family because my grandfather was killed in World War I. Uh, my, my two brothers served in the armed forces, and uh, my son-in-laws. I mean, throughout the family, you can find military people. So I have always revered the military. Uh, I realize the sacrifices they make. We interrupt this program to bring you a flash from the NBC Newsroom. The president has just announced from the White House that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. When the war started, I was nine years old. When we were attacked by the Japanese, I was at home. If my memory serves me right, I think it was a Sunday. And I was at home with my parents. But I will never forget President Roosevelt coming on the radio, because there was no TV then. Um, coming on the radio saying, this is a day that will live in infamy. And it seems like you know, a, a thousand years ago, but that memory lingers. I've heard stories since I was a child of what it was like for her um, going through the war as a child 
and how her mother had a victory garden and her love of our country and her patriotism in addition to her desire to always give back to others um, has really been an inspiration to me. I think World War II uh, taught me sacrifice. It taught me fear. I had never had fear before. And we had to close our blinds at night. We couldn't, couldn't turn on the lights. We used candles uh, and sometimes kerosene lamps. Uh, but everything had to be like a blackout. And in school, we had drills. Uh, we'd have to duck under our desk. And so I had never known that kind of fear before. My dad was 13 when the war started. When the war ended, he enlisted because then he was of the age that he could enlist. And so he was um, in the 82nd Airborne Division in the Army. And so truly, I've just grown up hearing stories and experiences. And I've been fortunate that my uncles and my father-in-law have been willing to share those stories. And I found them to be unbelievably inspiring. And I really feel in awe of their courage and their sacrifice for our country. And really, it's one of the reasons I I am so, such a proponent of the World War II Museum. I believe we need to educate young people. Young people today, they don't know what war is. They've never been through a war. And they need to learn the consequences. And that's why it's so important to me to be contributing to something that will educate young people of the, the, the consequences of war. As the product of a family that gave her an understanding of the value of hard work and tenacity, and with a deep concern for others, Jenny Craig became a successful businesswoman and entrepreneur. Her accomplishments reflected her character and values. People ask me, why did you choose the weight loss industry? The truth is, it chose me because uh, I had a weight problem, and at that time, there wasn't very much. In fact, people didn't even talk about weight. I mean, they didn't look at food as a way of, uh, of changing your body shape or anything like that. Uh, you know, calorie, that was a foreign word to me. I didn't know what that was. What set us apart from our competitors, uh, number one, there was a woman at the head of the company. I could do uh, my own commercials. So it gave people the impression they were dealing with a real person rather than a corporation. But probably the thing that made it uh, work the best was the fact that it had all the components that are necessary to losing weight and keeping it off. Taking a holistic approach, Jenny was a trailblazer and innovator in the health and fitness, nutrition, weight loss, and weight management industry. Under her dedication and visionary leadership, Jenny Craig Incorporated grew to become an internationally recognized and highly respected brand. People are always saying things to me like, you're so lucky. And my answer to that is, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So really, I, there was a lot of hard work involved when I started the company. I can remember 18, 20-hour days, really. So I had a full plate. But, you know, anything that's worth having or doing it's worth the time you put into it. Jenny Craig's business success has allowed her to generously support educational programs and institutions. Her passion and philanthropy has extended to advancing women, supporting service members and their families, and providing resources that educate Americans about their country. I believe in all education, uh, and my husband and I have given generously to 
uh, universities here in California. Uh, but I am especially uh, happy that I was able to support the World War II Museum. I think having an opportunity to contribute to the education that the museum provides, not only to teachers, but to students as well, is an honor. It's a privilege, and I'm really grateful to have that opportunity because I think it's a very meaningful way to make a difference in the world that we live in. The interest in, um, in being involved in the Institute is that I think there's a, a definite need for um, you know, knowledge and understanding of what happened in World War II. It was like the worst war. We lost 50 million, over 50 million people and six million Jews. And um, we can't forget that. I mean, I think that's just very important. Um, and because the veterans that were in that war, they are um, coming to the end of their life. You know, they're in their 90s now. There's no one else to tell the story. We fight in this country for our freedoms. And the sad thing is, once we have them, we're not nourishing them and taking care of them and making sure that they remain with us. And that's a, a part of what the World War II Museum does. It reminds us this is what it was like. My husband and I simply made a decision that we wanted to do something to honor my mother in her hometown and simultaneously make a, a contribution to the World War II Museum because we really believe in what it's doing for, for not only our local community, but for the world to see. I feel very proud that um, Jenny Craig, my mother, is, is so involved and so vested in uh, creating a legacy of um, permanent knowledge, really, um, about World War II and the importance of it and the impact that it had. I just can't say enough about what the World War II Museum means to me and what message and messages it delivers. I've been inspired my whole life by the way my mother has lived her life. She's lived a life of integrity and courage, faith in God, faith in country. For me and my husband, this is the most wonderful way that we could honor her because she's given so much to others. It's our way to give back to her and her legacy forever. I have my name on several things. However, there is none that I am more proud of than the World War II Museum. It really touches my heart. We got about a little over 1,700 uh, veterans going in today, and uh, we're excited about it. It'll probably take a day and a half, two days to get it, uh, get it right, get them all lined up. We have anywhere from about 800 uh, to about 1,500 bricks per, per install. This one's a little bit larger than, uh, than our normal install, which is nice. The commemorative brick program started here at the museum um, before the museum actually officially opened. It started as a volunteer run, run program, and it's kind of grown alongside uh, the museum as well. Today we have, as I mentioned, a little over 45,000 bricks uh, on campus, and all of our bricks are around the perimeter of the museum campus, so both Andrew Higgins Drive, Magazine Street, and then we have some interior bricks as well. I don't think you can make an investment, a cheaper investment anywhere that'll have a more lasting impact in memorializing their efforts. The fact that they're names will forever be here and people can walk by and you know look and see where they they were stationed and what they did our bricks here they're lasting tributes and you know this is a uh, 
our brick program here, I mean, it's seen by millions of visitors every day. It's really moving and very special. May 8, 1945, Victory in Europe Day, better known as VE Day. It was a day that the world had waited for for five and a half long and bloody years. Finally, the nations of Europe were at peace and free from a dictatorial government bent on world domination and genocide. The war in Europe claimed more human lives than any war before or since. Europe's great nations suffered as never before, with some countries, such as Poland, losing an estimated 17% of their population. Altogether, an estimated 40 million human beings lost their lives. Initially, the European war was decisively going in Nazi Germany's favor. Country after country fell to the seemingly unstoppable advance of the military forces of National Socialism. With no European countries to conquer on the mainland, the German war machine focused on Great Britain. The Germans bore down on the British Isles in 1940 with an aerial assault the likes of which the world had never seen. Young British pilots in the RAF took to the air in their Spitfires and Hurricanes to defend their homeland from the aerial onslaught. And through it all, the perseverance of the British people kept them upright and proved them unbreakable. Aside from the obvious territorial expansion of its borders, at the dark heart of the Nazi war plan was a plan to cleanse all of Europe of a single race of people. The genocide against the Jews of Europe was an unprecedented pre-planned operation to erase an entire people from existence. The Nazi plan spared no one, from the elderly to the infants in their mother's arms. All were viciously murdered in the greatest crime in human history. Yet through this Holocaust, never before seen or suffered, the Jewish people, like the Allies fighting to free Europe, persevered and prevailed through the terror. At the center of the European war was the land campaign. Territory conquered by Nazi Germany ultimately had to be liberated by foot soldiers from nearly all of the Allied nations in a grueling, bloody campaign. Starting in 1943, the peoples of Europe began to realize the freedom that had been stolen from them during the Nazi advances. American, British, and the soldiers of allied nations across the globe shed blood from the sands of North Africa to the beaches of Normandy and beyond, all on a quest not to conquer, but to liberate. Finally, after five and a half horrific years, the perseverance of the allies paid off in Reims, France, when the government of Nazi Germany, having been thoroughly defeated in every way possible by the free peoples of the world, surrendered unconditionally to the allied forces. VE Day meant an end to the war that had cost the lives of millions, had destroyed homes, families, and cities, and had brought huge suffering and deprivations to the populations of entire countries. Millions of people rejoiced in the news that Germany had surrendered, relieved that the intense strain of total war was finally over. In towns and cities across the world, people marked the victory with street parties, dancing, and singing. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill appeared on the balcony of the Ministry of Health building in central London and gave an impromptu speech. Huge cheering crowds gathered below and he declared, this is your victory. For the first time since 1939, the lights went on again all over Europe. We had to create another tour in, in Germany and Poland because there's just simply so much history. You know, this is really where uh, the Second World War, when it comes to Hitler and the battle with the East, really takes place. And so with uh, the Megastructures tour, we were focusing on a slightly different angle from the rise and fall of Hitler's Germany, which is to look at the consequences for the people who actually were enslaved under this regime. We look at things like uh, the creation, these massive bunkers, uh, um, Hitler's prora, this, this massive, huge concrete um, sort of hotel that he built for, for his workers. But he also, um, we also look at Pinamunda and the importance of the V1 and V2 rocket program and the whole history of Werner von Braun, who of course later comes to head NASA in the United States, throwing up all sorts of moral questions about what did you do with the Third Reich after it had fallen apart. But of course Werner von Braun knew about the massive slave laborers that were um, used in places like Nordhausen to build these rockets. And so it's a very complex, interesting tour which looks at a different aspect of Hitler's Germany.
We return to Warsaw, so for those people who've been on the Rise and Fall tour already, we do have a different program for Warsaw. We're going to places like Paviak Prison, which was the notorious Gestapo and SS prison in the center of Warsaw. We're also going to go to Treblinka, which in my view was really the most deadly of all the extermination camps where over 850,000 human beings lost their lives. And it's an incredibly sobering and tragic place, but it's also a very important place to visit. And again, we end up with a dinner uh, at my manor house just outside of Warsaw to celebrate uh, what we, this journey that we've all been on together. Hello, I'm Tyler Bamford, Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum. And today I'm here with Seth Peredin, historian also at the National World War II Museum. And we're going to talk about the liberation of Kaufering by the 101st Airborne Division on April 27th. So Seth, can you tell me a little bit about the 101st Airborne Division's experiences leading up to the liberation of Kaufering? Absolutely, sure can. So the 101, uh, of course, jumped into Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944, 5th of June, depending on what time. But, <laughs> but they were a green division. You know, uh, the other American Airborne Division that jumped into Normandy, of course, was the 82nd. Mm -hmm. And the 82nd had seen a lot of combat, whereas the 101 had not seen any. Um, the 101st jumped into Normandy. They fought in Normandy for, you know, a, a, more than a month. I forget exactly how many days, but it was well over a month. Uh, they went back to England, and, of course, they jumped in uh, into Holland in September 1944 during Operation Market Garden. Uh, they saw, actually, frankly, uh, heavier action in Holland for a longer sustained period of time than they actually did in Normandy. Most people don't know that. Um, after Market Garden, they were pulled back into uh, different parts of France to rest and refit and recuperate. And then, of course, they were thrown in the bulge uh, in December 1944. And, of course, a famous story about the 101st is, you know, encir being encircled in Bastogne and holding the area of Bastogne. Um, but their war didn't end there, of course. You know, they were put down, uh, elements were put down uh, towards Hagenau near the French and German border. And they were part of the uh, Seventh Army's thrust into southern Germany in 1945, and um, and that's what brings us to... So Kaufman. this was a very experienced division. They'd seen a lot of combat yeah. and a lot of turnover in personnel? Absolutely. You know, you got to remember, too, um, by 1945, April 1945, we're talking about here, there were guys that had made that jump into Normandy, quite a few, actually, mm -hmm. but, you know, by and large, a lot of the older veterans had been wounded or killed, frankly, or were recuperating in hospitals or been rotated out or whatever. So there was an influx of new people, especially after the Battle of the Bulge. You know, they suffered a lot of wounded, a lot of casualties in the Bulge. A lot, a lot of people got hurt from frostbite, you know, not yeah. necessarily even enemy fire. So there were a lot of new people in the unit mm -hmm. uh, in that time. So I heard that, uh, that the, the ca casualty rate for this division was over 100 percent just because of how much turnover there was. You know, even right. the replacements were highly likely to get injured. So when all these men, so the division's about, what, 18,000 men? Ish. When they come across across Kalfering, you know what what kind of scene greets them? Well, you know when they're they're pushing through Germany in the late portions of the war like this, you know a lot of the veterans that were there, and some are even even the new guys who hadn't made those combat jumps. You know you got airborne paratroopers who hadn't made a combat jump in the 101st in 1945. Um, you know the war is winding down, uh, and and it's they're kind of they're being a little I don't want to say disillusioned, but they're kind of wondering you know. When is it going to end? What is this all about? Why are we even here? We've liberated France, Belgium, Holland, da 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 da, -da and now we're in Germany. You know what? What is going on? What's next? And then they come across this camp, and this, of course, Kaufring was a subcamp of Dachau. Dachau is outside of Munich. Is outside of Munich, and um, Dachau was huge, and it wasn't just the main camp. Of course, there was eleven subcamps, of which Kaufring was one. And I found out in my research that Kaufring itself had eleven subcamps, which is kind of kind of odd, really, for a camp like this. It's important to mention that there's thousands of these camps all throughout Germany, oh, yeah. some in, in the suburbs of major cities like Berlin, others in very rural and isolated areas. And this was one of those. Okay. And, and it, well, I mean, Munich, of course, is a big city, but uh, Kaufering was uh, near the town of um, Landsberg am Lech in Bavaria, which is kind of kind in the middle of nowhere, really. So this is going to fall within the American occupation zone, too? Absolutely. So what was the scene? How, how many people were in Kaufering when the 101st got there? Uh, from reports that I saw, there were about 500-ish, give or take. Um, there were a lot of, as one may expect when liberating a, a concentration camp, there were a lot of dead. Um, La uh, not Landsberg, but Kaufering uh, 
it was different and that, you know, concentration camps by nature are, you know, filthy, filthy places, mm -hmm. but Kaufering was among the worst in terms of cleanliness or lack thereof. Um, the inmates actually lived in holes in the ground and the holes in the ground were covered with like thatched hut roofs. So the disease and the vermin that were, it, it was rampant in there. So the people were absolutely filthy. They were, you know, deathly ill. And the Germans, when they pulled out of the camp, um, those who could not make the forced march, uh, some of them, about like we said, you know, the, the number were left there in the camp. Some of them who were too sick to even move were herded in several of the huts, and the huts were lit on fire, and these people were burned alive. Um, and that's the scene that greeted these troopers when they when they uh, reached the camp's gates. And that had to be, you know, traumatizing for these these men. You know, they had seen so much war, right. and they'd been. You know, accustomed to seeing you know, bodies mutilated and mangled, but this was a whole different experience. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you talk to any liberator, any American liberator of any concentration camp, they all, all of them say that. I mean, to a man, they all say that. You know, I'd seen, you know, friends die, and, but I'd never seen anything like this. Right. And, and, you know, uh, just stacks of charred corpses of, you know, literally skeletons, like human skeletons, you know, that are staggering around in a dazed state. It was something out of, you know, of a nightmare. Was the 101st one of the only divisions in this part of Germany at the time? No. As I said, they were part of the 7th Army, so there was, you know, a lot of divisions there. But, you know, as I said, Kaufring had 11 subcamps of itself, in, in itself. And uh, the 101st didn't liberate all 11 subcamps. Uh, the 103rd Infantry Division the 36th Infantry Division, the T-Patchers, uh, the 63rd Infantry Division, and the 12th Armored were all are all recognized as liberating units uh, as from elements of Kaufering. So it wasn't just 101st. They do get the lion's share of the credit, and I think part of that may be the... Uh, the, the Band of Brothers <laughs> mythology. Exactly, sure. exactly. But there were other units there, to be sure. Yeah. By VE Day, May 8, 1945, there's 1 1.6 million American soldiers in Germany, and over a million of them had witnessed or liberated these camps. And as we come across upon the anniversary of uh, the, the victory in Europe, it's important to remember what this victory meant for so many and the experiences of both the liberators and the liberated. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please make your way back to the Arcadia Ballroom and find your seats and find your cell phones. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and silence your cell phones. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Bell, who will be interviewing our World War II resistance veteran. Dr. Bell, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeremy. And uh, welcome back. Uh, so we've had a, you know, an amazing first day of the conference, some great panels, and we're going to cap it off with a, uh, an opportunity to hear an authentic voice uh, from a veteran, uh, Dr. Z. Anthony uh, Krasuski, Tony. Uh, we also had hoped, uh, I'll mention though, to have another veteran with us today, uh, Jim Deal. That's why we called it We Were There. Uh, unfortunately, it's, I was there now, but uh, Jim's uh, back home celebrating his 100th birthday and unfortunately wasn't able to travel, uh, but uh, a veteran of the, of the Ardennes campaign and uh, uh, interesting contrast. But um, nonetheless, we've got an incredible uh, uh, comrade here. Uh, you know, uh, Tony's got a great story. Let me give a quick kind of rundown of his bio because I think it'll help some of you kind of understand the context but also then you'll go, oh, I want to ask him questions about that. So what we'll do is we'll have a conversation here and then we'll open it up for the audience uh, Q&A. Now, Tony's, uh, uh, you know, somebody may want to ask him, you know, on, on September 3rd, 1939, he was literally outside the British Embassy, uh, you know, waiting in, in Warsaw, waiting for the, the British and the Poles to not only declare war, but also to intervene in the war in a substantial way. Um, you know, a bit of a cause of disappointment, but but then as a as a teenager, um, is in a, a scouting organization. Now I've, I've been a, a scout leader before, uh, uh, but this is not the kind of a Boy Scout organization you would expect. Uh, and instead, uh, by the time of the of the Warsaw Uprising, is actually a leader of a hundred uh, hundred scouts. Uh, so, you know, the, your, your average 15-year-old company commander. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our, our high school students aren't here today because I really wanted to, to kind of give them a sense of, you know, think of the enormity of that and, you know, was, was part of the, 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 the Warsaw Uprising uh, for 63 days. Uh, it's got some, some harrowing uh, stories there, uh, you know, with the home army and, and miraculously, uh, you know, becomes a prisoner of war. Uh, and then, you know, that in itself is, a, is an exploit and then uh, liberation and, and then will we'll become part of the Polish army in the West with the second Polish Corps in Italy uh, and will serve several years there. And then uh, in 1952, will come to the United States. I mean, not sure what he wants to do. It's better than the sewers of Warsaw, I guess. The right? best decision of my life. <laughs> <laughs> best decision of his life. And uh, ends up at the University of Chicago, where he completes his uh, PhD. Uh, and uh, will then uh, go on to be a uh, political science professor for the next 50 years uh, until he retired in 2015. And, is now an emeritus professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, and he's become a, a leading expert on borderland studies, uh, leading Polish-American intellectual, uh, you know, uh, and former vice president of the Polish-American Congress. But uh, you know, he's here today, though, as just a, an incredible, authentic voice of that piece. So first, uh, join me in welcoming Tony uh, today for this conversation. So, so, Tony, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, I, someone may want to ask about uh, September 3rd and this, maybe the sense of betrayal, you know, with the, with the Allies. But I want to jump ahead and what was life like under the occupation uh, after uh, not just the German invasion, but then the Soviet invasion? Yeah. Uh, and you're, you know, you're what, 13, 14 years old in, in Warsaw, and, and then... Um, how, what was that experience um, and, and the, those initial memories? Well, let me, let me share with you the idea that any, anybody fighting on the Western Front is a totally different experience because the Eastern Front 
in Central Europe, specifically in Poland, was a slaughterhouse. Out there, we were fighting not only for independence, democracy, and freedom, but obviously they were killing, trying to el eliminate, exterminate us. And the upshot of that was that in 35 million Polish nation state existing in 1939 lost 6 million citizens. 90% uh, of the Jews, 3 million, you hear about Holocaust, tragedy of Holocaust, and 3 million Christians, including my own mother. Uh, so uh, every fifth citizen of Poland died during World War II. And uh, just before uh, September 3rd, 1939, Poland entered into an agreement with France and, in and England that on the 15th day, two weeks from the beginning of the war invasion of Poland by the Nazis, there will be help coming from the, on the Western Front. Let me say also that on the Western Front, now we know that the Germans had smaller army than the French were. If they really attacked, probably loss of the French campaign would, be, would not happen next year because they will be, Germany will be fighting on two forces. Most of the forces they directed to Poland. And of course, on the, uh, as you will know, on the 29th of August, 1939, secretly Stalin and Hitler signed an agreement deciding to partition Poland for the first time in history. Poland was partitioned and uh, half and half, 46% to Germany and uh, the rest, 46% 40, to Soviet Union and 54% to, to uh, Ger Germany. Um, this was secret and never revealed. It was the, the decision to attack by the Soviet Union for, in the back when the Polish army was fighting the Nazis was supposed to happen on the 15th day of the war. Uh, the Soviet intelligence through the agents in France discovered the date uh, but they still believed that the French, French and British might attack. And that's why they delayed two days and attacked us on the 17th of September 1939 from behind. So Poland was fighting two, on two fronts. We, we res on the Eastern Front, we resisted the Soviets. Initially, they were lying through propaganda media that, uh, that they are coming to help, actually, the Pol Polish army. And, but, but they were fighting, obviously, uh, Germany for 32 days longer than France fought in World War II. Uh, then obviously came the terrible problem of re occupation of Nazi. It was brutality to the extreme. This was a really what I said, a slaughterhouse. Uh, suffices to say that uh, for every German we killed, we in, in the in the secret service, in the resistance movement, anybody who was killed by us, they k executed hundred the poles taken at random from the buses or streetcars. And they were methodically counting 97, 98, 99, 100. In one of the buses, I was 104. So I survived. And I can de 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 tell my story. Uh, my future wife was walking one day uh, on the street of Warsaw, led by hand by her American mother. and. Uh, and said, Mama, Mama, there is some paint on, on, the, on the pavement, and it was blood. It was execution because they were ex executing exactly 100 people on the streets, on the bus stop. So this was the beginning. In the October 1943 alone, uh, they killed 10,000 in public executions. First, in, initially, uh, when the war started, I remember as a kid, I was 11 years old when the war started. Uh, I came to, the, to see the Germans, and I remember they started to be terribly brutality against Jewish citizens of Poland, beating them up, tor torturing them, and humiliating them. But also at the same time, they decided to immediately act against Polish intelligentsia, Polish leadership, Polish elite. And uh, in, in the Fall of 1939, they executed some thousands of people outside Warsaw. Leaders taken at random, people who were not politicians even, just simply important people in the, in the country of Poland. Suffices to say again that 
One of those executed there was Janusz Kuzociński, who won a golden medal in Los Angeles in 1932 Olympics for running 10 kilometers. He was an idol for the young people, so that's why they wanted to destroy that idol. So in a sense, in our resistance started immediately on the 27th of September 1939, when Warsaw capitulated because we lost 20% 20 per, 20 of the city buildings and several thousand people, and the mayor of the city of Warsaw, Stajinsky, decided to cap capitulate. And on that very day, Polish resistance movement started secretly by the officers of the Polish army, which later on became Armia Krajowa Home Army. Connect, led from London by the Polish government in exile, which first the Polish government evacuated under the constitutional Polish state to Rum through Romania and France, and then a new government was formed in London, and then the government was recognized by every ally country in the world, and existed in London until 1945, when the, that was uh, the governments for Poland were was not recognized from that moment, and, and the United States and, e and England recognized communist government of so, Poland. So you're, ra you're racing ahead. Let's go back to 1943. In 1943. As, as, as you become active in this yeah. resistance organization, and you're selected to be uh, one of the heads of this uh, scouting organization. Yeah, yeah. So can you describe sure. some of that and why they chose you and what yeah. some of your experiences have been? Well, first of all, uh, the leadership of ev every organization and every organization was very young. 17% of the resistance movement was composed of women and people under 18. Uh, the Polish scouting organization, Szare uh, Szeregi, secret uh, ranks, gray ranks, ex existed with the, with the no, no more of the, it was a code name for the Polish uh, scouting units, and they recruited me at the age of 15. Uh, why they were so young? Because they, through execution, the leadership was younger and younger throughout the five years of nightmare of the, of the German occupation. And they also believed that the young people will better lead people in better conditions with the young people. The, the scouting units uh, were divided into three, three groups. The youngest one were supposed to help out and become liaisons and spies for, in a minute I will exp explain the spying. And then there were another group over, over age of 18, they were, uh, they had office, uh, they had training, military training, and of, up, from 18 up, the, those units were normal storm units of the Polish Home Army, Army Krajowa. They were the bravest of the bravest. Polish scouting units in the Warsaw Uprising, one of them, Radosław Battalion, out of 800 boys and, and, and girls, lost 600 men. Only 200 remained. I wanted to join them, but unfortunately, I didn't get there. But fortunately, because of that, I can tell you the story because I survived the Warsaw Uprising. So, so the youngest group was used later on, they wanted to save them, so they were used in field of field post office. You know, since so many young people disappeared from homes, uh, all, the, all the families were terrified. What happened to them? Where are they? So on the sixth day of the uprising, uprising incidentally was supposed to last only a week to 10 days and lasted 63 days, the uh, parents, were terrified where these children are. And that's why the, on the sixth day of the uprising, uh, scouting units organized field office, post office, uh, and uh, we delivered 150,000 letters notifying where the kids are. And uh, many of, of our post office young, youngsters died also from bullets of the Nazis also. So, so, so let me ask you, on the first day of the uprising, so um, you make a decision yeah. on the on Poniatowski Bridge. Uh, what can you describe the decision that you had to make uh, while you're, you're on your duties? Yeah, 10 days before the uprising. I didn't know that the uprising would occur. They because didn't tell you? They didn't tell you no, the uprising? They didn't tell me why, yeah. because they, I was commander of the boys, and they didn't want to mobilize the youngest 
kids under 16 in my, in my groups, but they gave me a, actually a spying order. They asked me to use all the hundreds uh, who, boys uh, on the Jerusalem Avenue, which is east, major east to west, th thoroughway street through Warsaw, and the Germans were withdrawing, and the new units were coming. At every bus stop, every street corner, I had somebody watching Germans and, order, and remembering, trying to re report later on whether more Germans are coming and those who are withdrawing, when what moral, are they marching, are they from what units? The boys, amazing enough, knew what units they were from because we were teaching them actually those things. And uh, all along for about four miles across Warsaw, I had those hundred boys set up at every bus stop. And they were standing, supposing he's waiting for the next bus or street car. I had to change them every hour. At 2 p.m., Warsaw Uprising now it was started at 5 p.m. during the rush hour. And this was at 2 o'clock, I got a telephone call that one of the boys cannot come to the uh, Washington roundabout on the east part of Warsaw. And I ran actually about two miles or three miles there and stood there for four to five. And this was beyond the Prince Poniatowski Bridge on the east side of Warsaw. And I didn't know the Warsaw Uprising could start in an hour. Uh, the next kid came at, at five. He came about 15 to five, and he, he stood for, for me, and I started walking through the bridge. A uh, friend of mine, an, an American general, said that this was the decision at the bridge in my life, and indeed it was. Had I turned west, I would join the uprising and stay in, in Poland, fighting uprising and then remaining in Poland, uh, probably visiting the United States as a guest. If I, turn, uh, if, if I turn to the other way, I will probably end up in the communist army, which was still charging Berlin and, and fighting in Berlin. Well, I turned in the direction of the West, where the Warsaw Uprising was, because my units were there, and uh, joined the, uh, actually uh, came to the, to the uh, two streets which are coming in that fashion, and there was a machine gun shooting on both streets, and I couldn't cross the street for about two hours. When I crossed the street, I joined the uh, Kribar Battalion, named after Commander, uh, Commander Stub, girls, Christina and Barbara, Christina and Barbara. And Kribar Battalion captured Polish power station, Warsaw power station. And when I joined them, I expected to get some weapons. Unfortunately, I got two Molotov cocktails. Those were the only all the weapons I had, because they had, since they wanted to, uh, they started uprising also in the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius, and also fighting in Lviv, which is now the Ukrainian city attacked by Russia. Uh, and liberate those cities from the Germans. So mo a lot of weapons were sent there just before the uprising. And it was obviously only 10% of the people who joined the uprising had weapons. So I got those two, two bottles of Molotov cocktail and never, you know, the three days we didn't sleep. I was in the ruins of the high schools of, for art and uh, of art on the, on the border of Vistula River. And the third day, third night, we destroyed two tanks because the Germans were stupid enough to use tanks against uprising. They didn't realize that a little kid can come out of the cellar or uh, we were, in, I remember I was on the first floor in the ruins and they and throwing those bottles of Molotov cocktails. So this was the beginning of my, uh, my activity, <laughs> third day uprising. But on the next day, they sent me for more gas to bring from the third building. And I took another guy and a case like Coca-Cola for Coca-Cola bottles. And I was told to bring 24 bottles of uh, gasoline. And when I came back, everybody was dead except myself because the Germans changed from tanks to artillery. And it was artillery they were winning and, and killed the whole platoon. And at that point I decided to uh, jo rejoin the scouting units and ask for my commander to send me to the Radosov battalion, which was the bravest, uh, one of the bravest battalion in the Warsaw Uprising. 
but they were already cut off in the, on the Nisr Givola, and I would have probably never reached them or, or get killed there. So I joined for 10 days the post office. I became deputy commander of the post office, and we delivered those letters. But then the uprising started to be prolonged for two weeks, 10 days, two weeks, and all 10. So, so let me jump in really fast. Yeah. So, so for folks that, in terms of timing, as you recall, Alex yesterday was talking and Rob about uh, the, the Soviet, the Red Army's operation, Bagration, that it had, had really come near the outskirts of, of Warsaw. Yeah. And then whether because it culminated or because of policy or all of those reasons, you know, Stalin was happy to let the, the Nazi forces destroy the uprising that, uh, it, you know, that, that force. Uh, uh, the, the tragedy was that we didn't know the high command of the Armia Krajowa Home Army didn't know and Polish government didn't know that in November 19, uh, 19, uh, 43. Uh, 43 in Tehran, uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin agreed that Poland is in the Soviet sphere of operation. And that's why the Soviets decided whether Americans can land, whether the Polish parachute brigade was trained to help us when the Americans came to throw us supplies, supplies in September. Uh, we thought it was a Polish parachute brigade which was directed to go to Holland and f f only one bridge too far in, in Holland, fighting for liberate Holland, and we thought they were jumping to help us. Uh, so we, it was hopeless from the very beginning because nobody could hold, help us, and uh, the Soviet Union broke relations with the Polish government in exile after killing 20,000 Polish officers in Katyn forest uh, who were prisoners of war from 1939. This was a vengeance of Stalin for uh, defeat of uh, Bolsheviks by Poles by Marshal Piłsudski in 1920 in Warsaw, and independence of Poland. So, uh, so, so let me ask you. So, yeah. uh, so you're the deputy of the post office. You, you've got that for you know uh, almost two weeks, and then then what what duties did you pick up? Well, th this is uh, he's, he's like a Swiss uh, Army knife. You notice he's yeah, got all these different yeah. functions through the. It was the, 15 days the, of the uprising, and you see, after 15 days of uprising, people were initially euphoric, happy to have contact with their children, but after 15 days they were starving, they were being killed, all the buildings were collapsing, they were bombing us every 15 minutes by Stuka bombers from the Warsaw Airport picking up bombs and bombing us. So it was a nightmare. And at that point, very many people started complaining and uh, telling, you, you caused the uprising, and I didn't want to hear about it. So I went to the high command of the Armia Krajowa, and I said, literally what I said, I said, give me the most dangerous thing, but something I can contribute to. And they said, yeah, we'll find something like that. And General Bur Komorowski, commander of Armia Krajowa, sent an order uh, to be sent by messengers to leave Warsaw and ask all the partisan units of the Armia Krajowa, which was 350,000 strong, to march towards Warsaw and attack Germans from behind. Uh, they were supposed to send this, those orders through the, uh, through the radio, because we were led by, from London, strangely enough, by a radio when they were singing various songs, Polish, Polish songs on the BBC, those were orders for, the, for Armia Krajowa for the resistance movement. But since they were bombing us every 15 minutes and radio was not functioning very well, General Burkomorowski decided to find volunteers who will go outside of Warsaw, cross the German lines, and reach the partisan units. And I, I volunteered for that. At that time, Warsaw was divided into three districts. So we couldn't cross normally on the streets. I had to go to the sewers of Warsaw because three major thoroughfares were blocked, east-west thoroughfares were blo blocked for the German tanks to cross Warsaw during the uprising. So for about five miles, I had to go down, down to the sewers and I was led by a, by a girl. They were young girls, usually 17, because they were slim and not very tall. We could, the, uh, sewers were one meter was, I had to bend, I remember. I have a photograph of myself from those days and, and I had to bend. 
and for about five miles, I crossed those uh, three, three times sewers and went to the, to the German territory. At that point, uh, I knew that I cannot walk normally because they were, so I decided to change the tactic and I started pretending to cry and I said, I'm looking for my mother. But the Germans said, no, you are not looking for your mother. You are a courier for Armia Krajowa, for, for <laughs> underground. I smelled, and I didn't realize I smelled from the sewers. <laughs> so, so I reached the partisan yeah. units, and then they wanted me to stay in the partisan units. But I saw burning war, so I decided to come back, because I had to write a report. And those was a command, a report, of course, for a scout. It was an obligation. So I went back again to the sewers, back to the Warsaw, and I was assigned to another battalion which tried to capture Polish parliament. So, so let, let me, let me uh, question for you real quick. So, so first, when the, the Germans stop you, yeah. and, and you obviously smelled, the, uh, wh why weren't you shot? What, no, what, what no, happened? He, he, why, wh he, he took me under the guard and led me to a building outside the Royal Palace of Vilanov on the outskirts of Warsaw. And they, were, they put me right now in this uh, fa fashionable restaurant, uh, Vilanov. And there was a room, and in that room they had 30 uh, members of Armia Krajowa who attacked palace in Vilanov, and I wanted to capture the palace from the Germans the day before. And there was a German which, uh, in, the, in the window with an old, very old rifle, an old man of 70 or 75, and he was guarding us. And I spoke at that German because in the Polish schools were abolished immediately. Germans introduced uh, con conquered Poland. You, not only universities, but all the high schools, only grade schools uh, existed, fourth to fourth, fifth grade. But we had secrets, as uh, uh, Professor Ritchie said brilliantly yesterday, we had a secret state uh, with education, justice, everything, economy, etc. And I was studying secret high school, and I learned German from a German cooperating with us, not with Germans, with the Nazis, but with us. So I spoke German fluently. So I was talking to the German, and he said, I'm an Austrian, I am not a Nazi, I cannot help you because they will kill me. But you have to escape, because if you don't escape, you will, they will shoot you in three days, maximum three days. And I managed, miraculously enough, miraculously enough to escape the third day, jumping into the cellar. They, led, they were leading us in a very narrow alley behind the palace, and it was dark, it was about 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and I just jumped into the cellar and, w and went back to, to, to Warsaw. First, they notified delivering the messages to the partisans, and the partisans couldn't help Warsaw because they didn't have machine guns, didn't have any weapons. Only 10% of the Warsaw uprising had weapons. So, so after 63 days, the the, there's an agreement that the, the, the Polish Home Army, Army in Warsaw is, is capitulated. Is, capitulate, uh, and and you're you're uh, uh, surprisingly, I think as we think about it, they weren't just uh, either executed or, mm -hmm. or shipped to death camps, but were actually treated as as prisoners of war. Yes. I know you went then to Stalag 10B. Can you? Can you describe that, yes, yes. that phenomenon as a prisoner? We're not, not only that, that we capitulated with the rights of the soldiers, because the uh, US government and British government on the 30th of August 1944 issued a memorandum through Switzerland to, to Germany that uh, there will be a reprisal against the uh, American and British uh, against Germans held in American and British camps, POW camps. And it worked, apparently. And they recognized us as the regular units of the Polish army and agreed to the capitulation. And they allowed us to walk out with weapons, even. We were depositing weapons at the, at the line, German lines. And even they were saluting. Yeah, see, that's, I, I find that pretty incredible, you know, that, that, uh, that, that you know, in, in the, the kind of character of the war in the East, that, that you're going to allow these, these to happen. Yeah. So, so then, can you describe uh, Stalag 10B and your experience there? It was a horrible Stalag. There were 30,000 POWs of 60 nationalities. Uh, they stopped feeding the Russians, so there is a cemetery at which there are 30,000, 23,000 Soviets, 7,000 Yugoslavs, and the rest are Poles. The cemetery in, 
Stalag, because this, this stops feeding actually Russian totally about two weeks before the liberation by the Canadian army. Uh, it so, was, so can it you was, talk, talk about your liberation? Yeah, it was built on the marshes and we were doing, digging ditches of some kind and really creating some hydroelectric system. Um, and uh, food was terrible, rotten food. Uh, people were, had there was TV and disease sh spreading, and we were liberated on the 29th of April 1945, nine days after the birthday of Hitler. And of course, by that time, the Germans escaped from the camp and left us alone, and the Canadians came in. So what, what, was, what was your immediate feeling then? Well, the euphoria, came? obviously. Uh, some people just before day before liberation went on the on the roof and, and, and they were shot, killed, because they were so happy of being liberated. And I saw a German escaping from the Canadian tanks and he was younger than I was probably. So I took pity on him actually. I remember he was running towards, trying to hide among us. But you know, the Canadians were so scared that there would be diseases spread because this was a major problem. They said, no, you have to stay about six weeks, seven weeks under quarantine and they, they replaced the Germans on the towers. And I said, no, under, definitely I'm not going to do that. So I escaped from liberated camp, Canadian from camp. From the Canadian camp. <laughs> I, what I did, I recruited three guys, four guys, and we went, we went to, on the highway. And how to get to Holland? I wanted to get to sc scouting uh, uh, authorities, authorities in Holland. It was, we were on the Dutch border. And, uh, what to do? Well, we have to take bicycles from the Germans, and there were Germans escaping on the bicycles. So we pretended we had weapons and put traditionally in Armia Krajowa home army style, we put our hands into pockets and pretended we had weapons. They had weapons, we didn't. <laughs> lucky, lucky, luckily, a Canadian, Canadian patrol came out and arrested the SS people who would be sh shooting us in a minute, it, well, we would kill us. So it was a lucky strike again. All my life it was a lucky strike, and that's why I'm able to talk to you. <laughs> at, so, least, at least five times I was ready, <laughs> almost dead. So, so um, it, it, and then briefly, I guess for about a month, you're part of this millions of displaced yeah. people that are, are wandering about uh, Germany. Yeah. And then, um, what happens next uh, with uh, the Second Corps? Well, first of all, Poland, apart from losing six million people, had two and a half million compulsory lab labor, which was captured and transferred to Germany, two and a half million. So there were two and a half million Poles alone, but altogether Germans captured eight million forced labor, mostly Russians and all, all sorts of nationalities to fill the factories of Germany to fight us, to fight Americans, to fight British. So uh, this was an un unholy uh, situation in Germany, like a, you know, ant's nest, you know, everybody just t total chaos in Germany for about three we weeks, four weeks after liberation of the camps. And at that point, they, the first Polish armed, armed division captured Wilhelmshaven, a, a G German naval base, on the west of Germany on the border of Holland, and they wanted me to join them. But I said no, because my, my mother programmed me that I have to be a political scientist or a diplomat, and I'm supposed to study. <laughs> so, so I said, and I delivered that to Mama through University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, that's why I decided to escape. And then uh, I met a British art arist aristocrat who was a Polish lieutenant in the first uh, first uh, division, first Panzer division, Polish Panzer division, which occupied Wilhelmshaven, and he took me to Paris. And I went, there was still Polish legal government, France still didn't recognize communist government, so there was a legal Polish embassy open of the government in exile in London, and um, Amb Ambassador Morawski told me, you have to join the Polish army because you'll be still one of the two million refugees, and completely helpless and hopeless. Uh, well, I... And, 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 and to jump in, if you didn't, it, there was a, the, the threat that you would then be sent to 
uh, to the Soviet lines. Yeah, they wanted to send me, incidentally, in a minute I will tell you the, the, the story. So he said, I, I challenged him, I said, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency, but then I will be under command of the army, they will send me wherever they want to send me. And they did, I, finally I joined because I, his argument was stronger, obviously, and I wanted desperately <laughs> to do something productive. So uh, I joined the Polish army in, in, under uh, French command initially, and they sent me to the camp in southern France. And in the southern France, a communist government was recognized by France early, and probably they wanted to please to create good relations with the communist government of Stalin or Russia, and they demanded that, they, that we should be handed over. Incidentally, that story nobody knows in, in Poland because historians didn't came on the story. My biographer introduced that story in my bio biography, which was published in English uh, last year. And the French uh, were asked by the communist embassy or consulate, consulate in Nice, that we should be handed over to the communists as for burning Warsaw. And the Polish counterintelligence in contact with the British counterintelligence handed us over to the second Polish corps by simply coming in a jeep every, for five days with a jeep. We ca they came under the, te under the uh, uh, tent and they covered us up, and 10 people every day, 50 of us were evacuated to Second Polish Corps under British command in the British Eighth Army. So I became a British veteran, Polish veteran, British veteran. And now I'm a triple veteran. I'm also an American veteran. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from there, you ended up in the, in the Second Polish Corps in Italy and served in Italy for several years. Yeah. Uh, can, can you briefly describe that? that uh, occupation or post-war? Well, they, they, they were uh, de depleted after capturing Monte Cassino, and my regiment, actually, the 12th Podolski Ulan uh, regiment captured Monte Cassino. I joined them after they captured Monte Cassino, and of course, they, they had terrible losses also. So the British High Command, Ma Marshal Alexander, commander of the 8th Army, British 8th Army, suggested to Polish commander General Anders that the corps should be reduced to the division. He said, no, I will get sub supplies. Where from, he asked. Fr across the line from the Poles who were drafted forcibly by the Germans into, into Wehrmacht, into German army. And you see, when they captured half of Poland, they simply said, you have to serve in the Wehrmacht or you, you will go to the concentration camp. So they preferred, very often they decided that it's a bad choice, and they had to join under compulsion G German army. So the second Polish Corps was actually recruiting across the line. They were escaping from the G Wehrmacht on the German army, and they were extremely well trained and still participated in, in various battles against the Nazis in the last days of war. And they were very devoted, uh, obviously, because they, they had to serve in the German army for sometimes for a year or two years. So, so then, in, um, l before we open, one last one for you. So you came to the United States in 1952. Can you briefly tell us how did that happen? Well, uh, initially, initially we were, British didn't realize that the, they cannot demobilize our army. Polish army was the fourth largest army in the LI bloc. There were 250,000 soldiers fighting all the fronts of the Western fr Front. But, uh, uh, British realized that under the international law, we are soldiers of an independent country, Poland. So they decided to devise an act through which they, they simply said, you will join the British army and then we can demobilize you as a Britisher. That's why I'm a British veteran also. <laughs> so I was demobilized. I got one coat and two pairs of pants and uh, five, uh, five pounds. And this was my demobilization from the British army. And I stayed in England for about six years. I started going to the evening classes, trying to test my English. And then on the sixth year, for about five, six years, I decided several universities in, in the United States offered scholarships. And one, my organization, to which I belong to the Polish combatants organization, servicemen organization, was recruiting, we wrote letters to various universities, and I decided to go to the United States So, uh, We're happy he did. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in a round of applause for Tony Kuczynski.
Thank you very much. So, so now it's the the uh, almost the speed bait, speed, speed speed dating portion. You know, where you get to ask him questions, and and uh, I'll probably have to to help him with this uh, with the uh, the translation as we try to try to hear what you said. But uh... yeah. So uh, before we get to the first question, two points. One is we had the pleasure of hosting Tony here with his biographer in September. And when we were having lunch, he uh, was made aware of our conference. He said, oh, I think I'll come and speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he invited himself. That doesn't work for many people, but it worked for Tony, so thank you. The other point is uh, for hearing purposes, if you could try to keep your questions short, that would be helpful for the panelists, for Tony. Uh, we may repeat the questions so that they can hear more clearly. Thank you. We'll start with Connie in the back to your left, Tony. Anthony, that was one of the most gripping talks I have ever heard. And I wanted to ask you, what triggered the Warsaw Uprising? I'm assuming there was an event or a series of events, and also who made the decisions to trigger the Polish uprising? Well, the Warsaw Uprising was planned actually from the very beginning. And amazingly enough, to some extent, Germans were co caused the whole thing because they started terrible terror from the very beginning. So on the 27th day of September, Polish Home Army in 1939 was organized. And then, of course, uh, first they started beating up, torturing Jew Jewish people in the streets. Then they were shooting people, as I said, in the streets. All those executions. So every fifth Polish citizen died. Three million Jews, 90% of the Jewish population of Poland, three and a half million. And then, and three million Christians. My mother died in a German concentration camp, a Polish teacher. And, but personally, how much the citizens suffered, it was such a brutality. I lost my grandmother who was burned alive by the Rona, by the Wehrmacht units of the Russian uh, part of Wehrmacht. They boarded up the uh, old people's home and they burned all people alive. The second grandmother died, died also during the Warsaw Uprising and my mother in concentration camp. And two of my best friends died also, one Jewish friend. And we, my, my mother was a heroine uh, giving shelter to a, a Jew for four years, from 1939, 1943. Uh, Adam Tepper uh, lived with us and she was a heroine because every time we're biting nails with a Gestapo will come and kill. Poland was the only country in Europe which there was instant death for helping a Jew. Even a piece of bread was, was caused. And of course, helping, helping them to find housing. But my mother was on, uh, heroine enough to give him housing for four years. And on top of it, he, we thought that he was just simply trading, trying to leave. He didn't want to go to the ghetto. But amazingly enough, he signed up in the Polish Army, Krajowa Home Army Officer School, and was a commander of the barricade in the Warsaw Uprising. When I, and I met him by sheer chance when I was going to the sewers. He was commander of the, of the barricade at Mokotowska 14 in, in Warsaw. And he died at that, at that uh, barricade three days later. I went into the sewers and outside to, to the partisan units, and he died because the German tanks attacked and destroyed that barricade. So that kind of constant brutality for five and a half of nightmare caused that in, in, there was uh, uprising was caused and everybody was preparing for an uprising. And especially that Armia Krajowa was extremely young. So we, we, wanted even, we wanted to get even with Ger Germans and for every German they were executed 100 people. So this is the story why the uprising. And we wanted also to liberate Warsaw and and welcome the Soviet Union, which was be, uh, just beyond the Vistula River, as rightful owners of the capital of Poland. Of course, that was 
uh, to some extent, of course, we didn't know. Of course, that was sort of a bit too many, many people in Poland right now, uh, they feel like a betrayal that Roosevelt, Church, Churchill and Stalin assigned Poland, the first country which stood up to, the, to Nazi Germany, uh, assigned us to the Soviet zone, and that's why they, they simply didn't allow any help for Warsaw Uprising when we started fighting, but we expected initially that within two weeks they will help us because we will allow them cro cross the Vistula River, which is very wide at that point. It will be, the capital of Warsaw will be captured in, already in August, but it was captured empty, completely empty city, co totally destroyed, 80% destroyed. Uh, in January, only they liberated the ruins of Warsaw in September 17, 1945. And we will go to the center, halfway back. Sir, when you were speaking earlier about your youth in uh, Warsaw, if I heard you correctly, I thought I heard you say, the girl that became your wife. I Did I hear that correctly? A girl that became your wife? Earlier you were talking about the girl that became your wife. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that, that is correct. You, well, you, my you, wife. Huh? About my yeah, how did right. you, how, how'd you meet your wife? How did, that, how did that happen? I met my wife in Chicago, typically. Polish city, the largest Polish city in, uh -huh. in America. But, but, you, but, but did, you, did you meet her in the uprising? No. No, but there was another girl that helped you in the uprising. No, no. During the uprising, another girl saved my life because she, I was about to give give up and die in the, in the sewers, and she said, "You cannot die because you have to rebuild ha ha Polish scouting after the war." Well, that's, so, such brave women were Polish girls. They were braver than men. Um, I w met my wife uh, in Chicago. Uh, how? I was I signed up for the University of Chicago, and I was obviously penniless and hungry. So I went to see my friend who op opened the store in Chicago after we arrived in Chicago, and he employed my my future wife uh, there to do accounting. And she was this was I went there to eat something because I said, well, he obviously will be eating lunch, but he I, he wasn't in the shop. She was there, and she was eating pizza. And instead of talking to her, I ate her pizza. <laughs> and, she, and she immediately said, well, a crazy friend of you came and ate my pizza and even do, didn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> we married him one year later on. <laughs> she died unfortunately five years ago. It was a God-given gift by God to me, really. She's a fantastic woman. Since we didn't have children, we decided to give all the money we have, all the money I saved for scholarships in, in the American colleges. I gave 16 scholarships at the University of Texas, uh, three prof endowed professorships at the University of Texas, and also University of Warsaw. The, to the total was 600,000, which I got as, as an executor from a friend of mine, and another five, 500,000 from our savings. That's great. Tony, uh, the next question is with Connie to your left. Tony, uh, thank you for your service. Um, I wanted to ask you, as all of us are following the news and what's going on in Ukraine, what parallels do you see from your experience, or what lessons can we on Ukraine, yeah. gather from your experience? Well, uh, obviously, Ukrainians are fighting exactly for what we were fighting in World War II. Freedom, democracy, nation-state, existence. Even more so than Poles, because Poles were lost the country, were divided in 1795, and for 123 years, uh, Poles didn't have a nation state. Poland was not on the map of, of the world. And my generation, my, my mother's generation, my father's generation recovered Poland in World War I, thanks to America, Woodrow Wilson, obviously, who was instrumental in pr promising Poland in the 13th point, which was put by his advisor, Colonel 
house, house of Texas, of Austin, Texas, where I live now, right now. <laughs> so um, that's the story of, of, of uh, um, Ukrainians are fighting. Obviously, the, the, it's extremely difficult, especially since this Soviet army, uh, those of us, not only political scientists, but former soldiers like myself, we expected that, that Ukraine will be conquered in a couple of days by the supposedly big army, well-trained army of the Russian Federation. And we see that almost a year after, Ukrainians are fighting f for their country. Why? Because they want to recover their independence, their own country, Ukraine. And this is true especially since Ukrainians were fighting three times, first against the Tartars in 13th century, then against the Poland, in, in, when Poland occupied Ukraine in the Khmelnytsky uprising in the 17th century, and then Petlura government uh, in World War I, and three times in, in World War I also didn't get, they got independent Ukraine for three years, and then they were conquered by Bolsheviks, by Russia. So obviously they deserve a country, and nobody has any right to take away nation state and the, the, their own country. So they are fighting, and that's why the Ukrainian army is stronger in defending, U fighting for Ukraine after almost a year right now. So I, I hope it will, like, obviously they have to be held by us with weapons and, uh, we sh and, sh and shield the refugees also. Uh, Poland did its share. There were four million Ukrainians housed in Poland as refugees. Right now, I talked to the chief statistical office in Warsaw, and two million of the refugees went back to Ukraine because they left their mothers, their grandparents, and, and they are worried about housing in, in those cities which are mercilessly bombed by the Soviets, by the Russians. But I do believe that eventually they will win, but we have to help them. We cannot stop because we have to introduce eventually democracy in Russia. Russia deserves democracy. Russia deserves, after 800 years, a democratic government. And of course, what they are doing is criminal, invading another country. Thank you, Tony. If I may, um, you mentioned helping. Uh, we are always helped by our friends here, and one of those dearest friends actually introduced us to you, Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, is how we uh, made your acquaintance on one of the tours that she leads through Germany and Poland. Uh, Alex, who is here with her daughter, Max, to her left, uh, they have actually taken in uh, a few Ukrainian refugees as they're getting into Poland. Um, Alex teaches a lot of Ukrainian students and has worked with them to get their families out. So it takes a lot of people, and Alex is helping uh, a lot of people. So thank you to Alex for that. It, it, If, if, I could, if, Jeremy, if I could mention yes, real quick, too, uh, you know, apparently there's, a, there's about 6,000 people that are watching this online. Uh, my math may be a little off, but, uh, but to include uh, Tony's friends uh, back in Warsaw. And so they're, they're monitoring this as well. So, so the, the, the message doesn't just stay here. It actually uh, resonates uh, around the world. So go ahead. Thank you. And the next question will be in the front in the center aisle, please. Very good. When you lived in Great Britain, I know 150 Polish pilots fought in the Battle of Britain. I wonder if you ever met any of the Polish pilots that fought in the Battle of Britain when you were in England. Yes, I met. It's not generally known that the Kosciuszko Squadron 303 was the squadron which, in the Battle of Britain, shut down 12% of all the Nazi planes. And I indeed, I, I met, so Churchill at that time thanked Poland for saving London. And, 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 and uh, Edward Newman wrote a book, They Saved London. But unfortunately, in 1945, United States and the United Kingdom recognized communist government for Poland because Poland was assigned to the Soviet sphere of 
Central Europe, and, uh, and the Polish army, quarter of a million, the fourth larger army after Canadians. Uh, they were not marching in the parade in 1945. So you feel that we were really crying. I was crying when I was, for the first time when I was an exchange professor from Texas to study, to, to teach in, in London in 1990, they repeated the parade and at that time I started crying because at that time, for the first time, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they allowed uh, Poles to march by that time 40 years older people who were supposed. Fiji was marking, marching, all the colonies of Great Britain. The only country which wasn't marching on the parade of victory in London was Poles, after losing six million citizens and three million Christians. And there's a great book on that unit um, by Lynn Olson, who was here. It's called The Question of Honor. The next question is going to be to your left with Connie, please. Thank you, Tony Jankoye. I have a million questions to, to ask to you, but I'd like you to comment or on the symbol you have in your color, please, uh, how they made it and how important it is. Your, your little symbol about the... Right. The symbol on your lapel. Yeah, the, pin, oh, yeah. the pin on your collar, please. Uh, this sign on my lapel is PW, uh, which means uh, Polska Walcząca, Fighting Poland. And that was designed by this competition in the underground. And the student of the School of Art invested. This is an anchor. And PW means Polska Walcząca. Uh, but at the same time, it's a symbol of hope. And this is a symbol for the Polish Home Army, and I've been wearing that for last 80 years on the lapel in, to honor my friends who died in the Warsaw Uprising. Because when I go back to Warsaw from America, from El Paso, Texas, where I live, I always see, here lies Mary, there lies Johnny, all my friends who died during the Warsaw Uprising. My commander died the first day of the uprising, and I had to dig his grave the first day of the uprising. And we were burying him in the sidewalk, lifting the cement and burying him down there. So uh, Warsaw became a ghost town, ruins, city of ruins. There's a fantastic movie made by the Museum, Museum of Polish Uprising in of Warsaw Uprising in Warsaw, uh, showing the photographs of ruined Warsaw. By, it's a photograph taken by the American plane right after the war in 1945. It's a complete ruin. 80% of buildings. And now it's a city of skyscrapers. Half of Warsaw was rebuilt in medieval style, style from photographs of the, which they found in paintings in Dresden. Uh, German king from Saxony was a Polish king in, in the 18th century. And they, they were paintings of Warsaw and they repainted from this, those paintings that they rebuilt completely city, so part of city looks exactly like those paintings of the 17th century. And the rest looks like Chicago. There was, <laughs> <laughs> there, there was, there was one skyscraper named by Stalin, and now there are about 60 skyscrapers. <laughs> because they want to cover up the Soviets, to be taller than the Soviet skyscraper. <laughs> That's the spirit of Poland. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for Tony Krzyzewski. What a remarkable man and story. Thank you very much. Now, before everybody leaves, I've got some instructions. Uh, this concludes what I think has been another remarkable day. Um, a round of applause for all of our speakers, please. And thanks to you all for your questions. Please raise your hands high. We try to get to as many as we can. Um, tonight, we have our open house at the museum. The reception will be in the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion. Please cross the streets carefully. 
Uh, we will have our Campaigns of Courage pavilion open so you can tour the road to Berlin and the road to Tokyo. But we also uh, want to bring to your attention, we have a, a really unique ex special exhibition right now on the political cartoonist Arthur Schick. It's on the second floor of the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion, so please check that out. The open house is from 5 until 7. Uh, tomorrow we will start again at 8.30 a.m. Uh, please take anything with you so that the hotel staff uh, can bust the room. Anything that you don't want them to bust, please take. And uh, knowing that it's been a remarkable day, I want to remind you to pick up one of these flyers on your way out to sign up for next year's. Get first dibs on uh, getting a seat and getting a hotel room. And have a great and safe night. Thank you.